Preface of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley Jane. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Preface author's preface a generation born since abraham lincoln died has already reached manhood and womanhood yet there are millions still living who sympathized with him in his noble aspirations who labored with him in his toilsome life and whose hearts were saddened by his tragic death it is the almost unbroken testimony of his contemporaries that by virtue of certain high traits of character, in certain momentous lines of purpose and achievement, he was incomparably the greatest man of his time. The deliberate judgment of those who knew him hardened into tradition. For although but twenty-five years have passed since he fell by the bullet of the assassin, the tradition is already complete. The voice of hostile faction is silent or unheeded. Even criticism is gentle and timid. If history had said its last word, if no more were to be known of him than is already written, his fame, however lacking in definite outline, however distorted by fable, would survive undiminished to the latest generations. The blessings of an enfranchised race would forever hail him as their liberator. The nation would acknowledge him as the mighty counsellor whose patient courage and wisdom saved the life of the Republic in its darkest hour, and illuminating his proud eminence as orator, statesman and ruler, there would forever shine around his memory the halo of that tender humanity and Christian charity in which he walked among his fellow countrymen as their familiar companion and friend. It is not, therefore, with any thought of adding materially to his already accomplished renown that we have written the work which we now offer to our fellow citizens. But each age owes to its successors the truth in regard to its own annals. The young men who have been born since Sumter was fired on have a right to all their elders know of the important events they came too late to share in. The life and fame of Lincoln will not have their legitimate effect of instruction and example unless the circumstances among which he lived and found his opportunities are placed in their true light before the men who never saw him. To write the life of this great American in such a way as to show his relations to the times in which he moved, the stupendous issues he controlled, the remarkable men by whom he was surrounded, has been the purpose which the authors have diligently pursued for many years. We can say nothing of the result of our labour. Only those who have been similarly employed can appreciate the sense of inadequate performance with which we regard what we have accomplished. We claim for our work that we have devoted to it twenty years of almost unremitting assiduity, that we have neglected no means in our power to ascertain the truth, that we have rejected no authentic facts essential to a candid story, that we have no theory to establish, no personal grudge to gratify, no unavowed objects to subserve. We have aimed to write a sufficiently full and absolutely honest history of a great man and a great time, and although we take it for granted that we have made mistakes, that we have fallen into such errors and inaccuracies as are unavoidable in so large a work, we claim there is not a line in all these volumes dictated by malice or unfairness. Our desire to have this work placed under the eyes of the greatest possible number of readers induced us to accept the generous offer of the Century magazine to print it first in that periodical. In this way it received, as we expected, the intelligent criticism of a very large number of readers, thoroughly informed in regard to the events narrated, and we have derived the greatest advantage from the suggestions and corrections which have been elicited during the serial publication, which began in November 1886 and closed early in 1890. 
We beg here to make our sincere acknowledgments to the hundreds of friendly critics who have furnished us with valuable information. As the century had already given during several years a considerable portion of its pages to the elucidation and discussion of battles and campaigns of the Civil War, it was the opinion of its editor, in which we coincided, that it was not advisable to print in the magazine the full narrative sketch of the war which we had prepared. We omitted also a large number of chapters which, although essential to a history of the time, and directly connected with the life of Mr. Lincoln, were still episodical in their nature and were perhaps not indispensable to a comprehension of the principal events of his administration. These are all included in the present volumes. They comprise additional chapters almost equal in extent and fully equal in interest to those which have already been printed in the century. Interspersed throughout the work in their proper connection and sequence, and containing some of the most important of Mr. Lincoln's letters, they lend breadth and unity to the historical drama. We trust it will not be regarded as presumptuous if we say a word in relation to the facilities we have enjoyed and the methods we have used in the preparation of this work. We knew Mr. Lincoln intimately before his election to the presidency. We came from Illinois to Washington with him and remained at his side and in his service, separately or together, until the day of his death. We were the daily and nightly witnesses of the incidents, the anxieties, the fears, and the hopes which pervaded the executive mansion and the national capital. The President's correspondence, both official and private, passed through our hands. He gave us his full confidence. We had personal acquaintance and daily official intercourse with cabinet officers, members of Congress, governors, and military and naval officers of all grades whose affairs brought them to the White House. It was during these years of the war that we formed the design of writing this history and began to prepare for it. President Lincoln gave it his sanction and promised his cordial cooperation. After several years' residence in Europe, we returned to this country and began the execution of our long-cherished plan. Mr. Robert T. Lincoln gave into our keeping all the official and private papers and manuscripts in his possession to which we have added all the material we could acquire by industry or by purchase. It is with the advantage, therefore, of a wide personal acquaintance with all the leading participants of the war and of perfect familiarity with the manuscript material and also with the assistance of the vast bulk of printed records and treatises which have accumulated since 1865, that we have prosecuted this work to its close. If we gain nothing else by our long association with Mr. Lincoln, we hope at least that we acquired from him the habit of judging men and events with candor and impartiality. The material placed in our hands was unexampled in value and fullness. We have felt the obligation of using it with perfect fairness. We have striven to be equally just to friends and to adversaries. Where the facts favour our enemies, we have recorded them ungrudgingly. Where they bear severely upon statesmen and generals, whom we have loved and honoured, we have not scrupled to set them forth, at the risk of being accused of coldness and ingratitude to those with whom we have lived on terms of intimate friendship. The recollection of these friendships will always be to us a source of pride and joy. But in this book we have known no allegiance but to the truth. We have in no case relied upon our own memory of the events narrated, though they may have passed under our own eyes. We have seen too often the danger of such a reliance in the reminiscences of others. We have trusted only our diaries and memoranda of the moment and in the documents and reports we have cited, we have used incessant care to secure authenticity. So far as possible, every story has been traced to its source, and every document read in the official record or the original manuscript. We are aware of the prejudice which exists against a book written by two persons, but we feel that in our case the disadvantages of collaboration are reduced to the minimum, 
Our experiences, our observations, our material have been for twenty years not merely homogeneous. They have been identical. Our plans were made with thorough concert. Our studies of the subject were carried on together. We were able to work simultaneously without danger of repetition or conflict. The apportionment of our separate tasks has been dictated purely by convenience. The division of topics between us has been sometimes for long periods, sometimes almost for alternate chapters. Each has written an equal portion of the work. While consultation and joint revision have been continuous, the text of each remains substantially unaltered. It is in the fullest sense and in every part a joint work. We each assume responsibility not only for the whole but for all the details and whatever credit or blame the public may award our labours is equally due to both. We commend the result of so many years of research and diligence to all our countrymen, north and south, in the hope that it may do something to secure a truthful history of the great struggle which displayed on both sides the highest qualities of American manhood and may contribute in some measure to the growth and maintenance throughout all our borders of that spirit of freedom and nationality for which Abraham Lincoln lived and died. John G. Nicolay, John Hay, Signatures End of section 1 Section 1 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley Jane. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 1. Lineage. In the year 1780, Abraham Lincoln, a member of a respectable and well-to-do family in Rockingham County, Virginia, started westward to establish himself in the newly explored country of Kentucky. He entered several large tracts of fertile land, and returning to Virginia, disposed of his property there, and with his wife and five children, went back to Kentucky and settled in Jefferson County. Little is known of this pioneer Lincoln or of his father, most of the records belonging to that branch of the family were destroyed in the Civil War. Their early orphanage, the wild and illiterate life they led on the frontier, severed their connection with their kindred in the East. This often happened. There are hundreds of families in the West bearing historic names and probably descended from well-known houses in the older states or in England, which by passing through one or two generations of ancestors who could not read or write have lost their continuity with the past as effectually as if a deluge had intervened between the last century and this. Even the patronymic has been frequently distorted beyond recognition by slovenly pronunciation during the years when letters were a lost art and by the phonetic spelling of the first boy in the family who learned the use of the pen. There are Lincolns in Kentucky and Tennessee belonging to the same stock with the president whose names are spelt Lincorn and Lincoln. All that was known of the emigrant Abraham Lincoln by his immediate descendants was that his progenitors, who were Quakers, came from Berks County, Pennsylvania, into Virginia, and there throve and prospered. Footnote. We desire to express our obligations to Edwin Salter, Samuel L. Smedley, Samuel Shackford, Samuel W. Pennypacker, Howard M. Jenkins and John T. Harris, Jr., for information and suggestions which have been of use in this chapter. End footnote. But we now know with sufficient clearness, through the widespread and searching luster which surrounds the name, the history of the migrations of the family since its arrival on the continent and the circumstances under which the Virginia pioneer started for Kentucky. The first ancestor of the line of whom we have knowledge was Samuel Lincoln of Norwich, England, who came to Hingham, Massachusetts, in 1638 and died there. He left a son, Mordecai, whose son of the same name, and it is a name which persists in every branch of the family, 
removed to Monmouth, New Jersey, and thence to Amity Township, now a part of Berks County, Pennsylvania, where he died in 1735, fifty years old. Footnote. The Lincolns, in naming their children, followed so strict a tradition that great confusion has arisen in the attempt to trace their genealogy. For instance, Abraham Lincoln of Chester County, son of one Mordecai and brother of another, the President's ancestors, left a fair estate by will to his children, whose names were John, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Mordecai, Rebecca, and Sarah, precisely the same names we find in three collateral families. End footnote. From a copy of his will recorded in the office of the register, in inventory of his effects, made after his death, he is styled by the appraisers Mordecai Lincoln, gentleman. His son John received by his father's will a certain piece of land lying in the Jerseys containing three hundred acres, the other sons and daughters having been liberally provided for from the Pennsylvania property. This John Lincoln left New Jersey some years later and about 1750 established himself in Rockingham County, Virginia. He had five sons to whom he gave the names which were traditional in the family abraham the pioneer first mentioned isaac jacob thomas and john jacob and john remained in virginia the former was a soldier in the war of the revolution and took part as lieutenant in a virginia regiment at the siege of yorktown isaac went to a place on the holston river in tennessee thomas followed his brother to kentucky lived and died there and his children then emigrated to tennessee footnote it is an interesting coincidence for the knowledge of which we are indebted to Colonel John B. Brownlow that a minister named Mordecai Lincoln, a relative of the President, performed on the 17th of May, 1837, the marriage ceremony of Andrew Johnson, Mr. Lincoln's successor in the presidency. End footnote. With the one memorable exception, the family seemed to have been modest, thrifty, unambitious people. Even the great fame and the conspicuousness of the president did not tempt them out of their retirement. Robert Lincoln of Hancock County, Illinois, a cousin, German, became a captain and commissionary of volunteers. None of the others, so far as we know, ever made their existence known to their powerful kinsmen during the years of his glory. It was many years after the death of the president that his son learned the probable circumstances under which the pioneer Lincoln removed to the West and the intimate relations which subsisted between his family and the most celebrated man in early Western annals. There is little doubt that it was on account of his association with the famous Daniel Boone that Abraham Lincoln went to Kentucky. The families had for a century been closely allied. There were frequent intermarriages among them, both being of Quaker lineage. Footnote, a letter from David J. Lincoln of Birdsboro, Berks County, Pennsylvania, to the writers, says, My grandfather, Abraham Lincoln, was married to Anna Boone, a first cousin of Daniel Boone, July 10th, 1760. He was half-brother of John Lincoln, and afterwards became a man of some prominence in Pennsylvania, serving in the Constitutional Convention in 1789-1790. to End footnote. By the will of Mordecai Lincoln, to which reference has been made, his loving friend and neighbour, George Boone, was made a trustee to assist his widow in the care of the property. Squire Boone, the father of Daniel, was one of the appraisers who made the inventory of Mordecai Lincoln's estate. The intercourse between the families was kept up after the Boones had removed to North Carolina and John Lincoln had gone to Virginia. Abraham Lincoln, son of John and grandfather of the President, was married to Miss Mary Shipley in North Carolina. The inducement which led him to leave Virginia where his standing and his fortune were assured, was in all probability his intimate family relations with the great explorer, the hero of the new country of Kentucky, the land of fabulous richness and unlimited adventure. 
at a time when the eastern states were ringing with the fame of the mighty hunter who was then in the prime of his manhood and in the midst of those achievements which will forever render him one of the most picturesque heroes in all our annals it is not to be wondered at that his own circle of friends should have caught the general enthusiasm and felt the desire to emulate his career Boone's exploration of Kentucky had begun some ten years before Lincoln set out to follow his trail. In 1769, he made his memorable journey to that virgin wilderness, of whose beauty he always loved to speak even to his latest breath. During all that year he hunted, finding everywhere abundance of game. The buffalo, Boone says, were more frequent than I have seen cattle in the settlements, browsing on the leaves of the cane or cropping the herbage on these extensive plains. Fearless because ignorant of the violence of man, sometimes we saw hundreds in a drove and the numbers about the salt springs were amazing. In the course of the winter, however, he was captured by the Indians while hunting with a comrade, and when they had contrived to escape, they never found again any trace of the rest of their party. But a few days later, they saw two men approaching and hailed them with the hunter's caution. Hello, strangers. Who are you? They replied, white men and friends. They proved to be Squire Boone and another adventurer from North Carolina. The younger Boone had made that long pilgrimage through the trackless woods, led by an instinct of dog-like affection to find his elder brother and share his sylvan pleasures and dangers. Their two companions were soon waylaid and killed, and the Boone spent their long winter in that mighty solitude undisturbed. In the spring their ammunition, which was to them the only necessary of life, ran low, and one of them must return to the settlements to replenish the stock. It need not be said which assumed this duty. The cadet went uncomplaining on his way, and Daniel spent three months in absolute loneliness, as he himself expressed it, by myself, without bread, salt, or sugar, without company of my fellow creatures, or even a horse or dog. He was not insensible to the dangers of his situation. He never approached his camps without the utmost precaution and always slept in the cane breaks if the signs were unfavourable. But he makes in his memoirs this curious reflection which would seem like affectation in one less perfectly and simply heroic. How unhappy such a situation for a man tormented with fear which is vain if no danger comes and if it does only augments the pain was my happiness to be destitute of this afflicting passion with which i had the greatest reason to be afflicted after his brother's return for a year longer they hunted in those lovely wilds and then returned to the yadkin to bring their families to the new domain they made the long journey back five hundred miles in peace and safety for some time after this boone took no conspicuous part in the settlement of kentucky the expedition with which he left the Yadkin in 1773 met with a terrible disaster near Cumberland Gap, in which his eldest son and five more young men were killed by Indians, and the whole party, discouraged by the blow, retired to the safer region of Clinch River. In the meantime, the dauntless speculator, Richard Henderson, had begun his occupation with all the pomp of viceroyalty. Harrodsburg had been founded and corn planted and a flourishing colony established at the fort of the Ohio. In 1774, Boone was called upon by the governor of Virginia to escort a party of surveyors through Kentucky and on his return was given the command of three garrisons. And for several years thereafter, the history of the state is the record of his feats and arms. No one ever equalled him in this knowledge of Indian character, and his influence with the savages was a mystery to him and to themselves. Three times he fell into their hands and they did not harm him. Twice they adopted him into their tribes while they were still on the war path. Once they took him to Detroit to show the long knife chieftains of King George that they also could exhibit trophies of memorable prowess, but they refused to give him up even to their British allies. 
Footnote, Silas Farmer, historiographer of Detroit, informs us that Daniel Boone was brought there on the 10th of March, 1778, and that he remained there a month. End footnote. In no quality of wise woodcraft was he wanting. He could outrun a dog or a deer. He could thread the woods without food day and night. He could find his way as easily as the panther could. Although a great athlete and a tireless warrior, he hated fighting and only fought for peace. In council and in war he was equally valuable. His advice was never rejected without disaster, nor followed but with advantage. And when the fighting once began, there was not a rival in Kentucky which could rival his. At the nine days' siege at Boonesboro, he took deliberate aim and killed a Negro renegade who was harassing the garrison from a tree 525 feet away and whose head was only visible from the fort. The mildest and the quietest of men, he had killed dozens of enemies with his own hands and all this without malice and strangest of all without incurring the hatred of his adversaries. He had self-respect enough but not a spark of vanity. After the fatal battle of the Blue Licks, where the only point of light in the day's terrible work was the wisdom and valour with which he had partly retrieved a disaster he foresaw but was powerless to prevent, when it became his duty as senior surviving officer of the forces to report the affair to the Governor Harrison, his dry and naked narrative gives not a single hint of what he had done himself, nor mentions the gallant son lying dead on the field, nor the wounded brother whose gallantry might justly have claimed some notice he was thinking solely of the public good saying i have encouraged the people in this country all that i could but i can no longer justify them or myself to risk our lives here under such extraordinary hazards he therefore begged his excellency to take immediate measures for relief during the short existence of henderson's legislature he was a member of it and not the least useful one among his measures was one of the protection of game. Everything we know of the emigrant Abraham Lincoln goes to show that it was under the auspices of this most famous of our pioneers that he set out from Rockingham County to make a home for himself and his young family in that wild region which Boone was wrestling from its savage holders. He was not without means of his own. He took with him funds enough to enter an amount of land which would have made his family rich if they had retained it. The county records show him to have been the possessor of a domain of some 1,700 acres. There is still in existence the original warrant, dated March 4, 1780, for 400 acres of land for which the pioneer had paid into the public treasury £160 current money and a copy of the surveyor's certificate giving the meets and bounds of the property of Floyd's Fork, which remained for many years in the hands of Mordecai Lincoln, the pioneer's eldest son and heir. The name was misspelled Linkhorn by a blunder of the clerk in the land office, and the error was perpetuated in the subsequent record. Kentucky had been for many years the country of romance and fable for Virginians. Twenty years before, Governor Spotswood had crossed the Allen Garnies and returned to establish in a Willemsburg tavern that fantastic order of nobility which he called the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe, and with a worldly wisdom which was scarcely consistent with these medieval affectations, to press upon the attention of the British government the building of a line of frontier forts to guard the Ohio River from the French. Many years after him, the greatest of all Virginians crossed the mountains again and became heavily interested in those schemes of emigration which filled the minds of many of the leading men in America until they were driven out by graver cares and more imperative duties. Washington had acquired claims and patents to the amount of thirty or forty thousand acres of land in the West. Benjamin Franklin and the Lees were also large owners of these speculative titles. They formed, it is true, rather an airy and unsubstantial sort of possession, the same ground being often claimed by a dozen different persons or companies under various grants from the Crown or from legislatures, or through purchase by adventures from Indian councils. 
but about the time of which we are speaking the spirit of emigration had reached the lower strata of colonial society and a steady stream of pioneers began pouring over the passes of the mountains into the green and fertile valleys of kentucky and tennessee they selected their homes in the most eligible spots to which chance or the report of earlier explorers directed them with little knowledge or care as to the rightful ownership of the land and too often cleared their corner of the wilderness for the benefit of others. Even Boone, to whose courage, forest law and singular intuitions of savage character the state of Kentucky owed more than to any other man, was deprived in his old age of his hard-earned homestead through his ignorance of legal forms and removed to Missouri to repeat in that new territory his labours and his misfortunes. The period at which Lincoln came west was one of note in the history of Kentucky. The labours of Henderson and the Transylvania Company had begun to bear fruit in extensive plantations and a connected system of forts. The land laws of Kentucky had reduced to something like order the chaos of conflicting claims arising from the various grants and the different preemption customs under which settlers occupied their property. The victory of Boone at Boonesboro against the Shawnees and the capture of Kaskaskia and Vincennes at the brilliant audacity of George Rogers Clark had brought the region prominently to the attention of the Atlantic states and had turned in that direction the restless and roving spirits which are always found in communities at periods when great emigrations are in need of civilization. Up to this time few persons had crossed the mountains except hunters, trappers and explorers, men who came merely to kill game, and possibly Indians, or to spy out the fertility of the land for the purpose of speculation. But in 1780 and 1781 a large number of families took up their line of march, and in the latter year a considerable contingent of women joined the little army of pioneers, impelled by an instinct which they themselves probably but half comprehended. The country was to be peopled, and there was no other way of peopling it but by the sacrifice of many lives and fortunes, and the history of every country shows that these are never lacking when they are wanted. The number of those who came at about the same time with the pioneer Lincoln was sufficient to lay the basis of a sort of social order. Early in the year 1780, three hundred large family boats arrived at the falls of the Ohio, where the land had been surveyed by Captain Bullitt seven years before, and in May the legislature of Virginia passed a law for the incorporation of the town of Louisville, then containing some six hundred inhabitants. At the same session a law was passed confiscating the property of certain British subjects for the endowment of an institution of learning in Kentucky, it being the interest of this commonwealth, to quote the language of the philosophic legislature, always to encourage and promote every design which may lead to the improvement of the mind and the diffusion of useful knowledge even among its remote citizens, whose situation in a barbarous neighbourhood and a savage intercourse might otherwise render them unfriendly to science. This was the origin of the Transylvania University of Lexington, which rose and flourished for many years on the utmost verge of civilization. The barbarous neighbourhood and the savage intercourse undoubtedly had their effect upon the manners and morals of the settlers, but we should fall into error if we took it for granted that the pioneers were all of one piece. The ruling motive which led most of them to the wilds was that Anglo-Saxon lust of land which seemed inseparable from the race. The prospect of possessing a four hundred acre farm by merely occupying it, and the privilege of exchanging a basket full of almost worthless continental currency for an unlimited estate at the nominal value of forty cents per acre, were irresistible to thousands of land loving Virginians and Carolinians whose ambition of proprietorship was larger than their means. 
Accompanying this flood of emigrants of good faith was the usual froth and scum of shiftless idlers and adventurers who were either drifting with the current they were too worthless to withstand or in pursuit of dishonest gains in fresher and simpler regions. The vices and virtues of the pioneers were such as proceeded from their environment. They were careless of human life because life was worth comparatively little in that hard struggle for existence, but they had a remarkably clear idea of the value of property and visited theft not only with condign punishment but also with the severest social proscription. Stealing a horse was punished more swiftly and with more feeling than homicide. A man might be replaced more easily than the other animal. Sloth was the worst of weaknesses. An habitual drunkard was more welcome at raisings and log rollings than a known feinant. The man who did not do a man's share where work was to be done was christened Lazy Lawrence, and that was the end of him socially. Cowardice was punished by inexorable disgrace. The point of honour was as strictly observed as it ever has been in the idlest and most artificial society. If a man accused another of falsehood, the ordeal by fisticuffs was instantly resorted to. Weapons were rarely employed in these chivalrous encounters, being kept for more serious use with Indians and wild beasts. Nevertheless, fists, teeth and the gorging thumb were often employed with fatal effect. Yet among this rude and uncouth people there was a genuine and remarkable respect for law. They seem to recognize it as an absolute necessity of their existence. In the territory of Kentucky and afterwards in that of Illinois, it occurred at several periods in the transition from counties to territories and states that the country was without any organized authority. But the people were a law unto themselves. Their improvised courts and councils administered law and equality. Contracts were enforced, debts were collected, and a sort of order was maintained. It may be said generally that the character of this people was far more above their circumstances, and all the accessories of life by which we are accustomed to rate communities and races in the scale of civilization they were little removed from primitive barbarism. They dressed in the skins of wild beasts killed by themselves and in linen stuffs woven by themselves. They hardly knew the use of iron except in their firearms and knives. Their food consisted almost exclusively of game, fish, and roughly ground cornmeal. Their exchanges were made by barter. Many a child grew up without ever seeing a piece of money. Their habitations were hardly superior to those of the savages with whom they waged constant war. Large families lived in log huts put together without iron, and far more open to the inclemencies of the skies than the pigsties of the careful farmer of today. An early schoolmaster says that the first place where he went to board was the house of one Lucas, consisting of a single room, sixteen feet square, and tenanted by Mr. and Mrs. Lucas, ten children, three dogs, two cats, and himself. There were many who lived in hovels so cold that they had to sleep on their shoes to keep them from freezing too stiff to be put on. The children grew inured to misery like this and played barefoot in the snow. It is an error to suppose that all this could be undergone with impunity. They suffered terribly from malarial and rheumatic complaints and the instances of vigorous and painless age were rare among them. The lack of moral and mental sustenance was still more marked. They were inclined to be a religious people, but a sermon was an unusual luxury, one to be enjoyed at long intervals and by great expense of time. There were few books or none, and there was little opportunity for the exchange of opinion. Any variation in the dreary course of events was welcome. A murder was not without its advantages as a stimulus to conversation. A criminal trial was a kind of holiday to a county. It was this poverty of life, this famine of social gratification, from which sprang their fondness for the grosser forms of excitement and their tendency to rough and brutal practical joking. In a life like theirs, a laugh seemed worth having at any expense. But near as they were to barbarism, in all the circumstances of their daily existence, they were far from it politically. 
They were the children of a race which had been trained in government for centuries in the best school the world had ever seen, and wherever they went they formed the town, the county, the court, and the legislative power with the ease and certainty of nature evolving its results, and this they accomplished in the face of a savage foe surrounding their feeble settlements, always alert and hostile, invisible and dreadful, as the visionary powers of the air. Until the Treaty of Greenville in 1795 closed the long and sanguinary history of the old Indian wars, there was no day in which the pioneer could leave his cabin with the certainty of not finding it in ashes when he returned, and his little flock murdered on his threshold, or carried into a captivity worse than death. Whenever nightfall came with the man of the house away from home, the anxiety and care of the women and children were none the less bitter because so common. The life of the pioneer Abraham Lincoln soon came to a disastrous close. He had settled in Jefferson County on the land he had bought from the government and cleared a small farm in the forest. Footnote Lyman C. Draper of the Wisconsin Historical Society has kindly furnished us with the M.S. account of a Kentucky tradition according to which the pioneer Abraham Lincoln was captured by the Indians near Crow Station in August 1782, carried into captivity and forced to run the gauntlet. The story rests on the statement of a single person, Mrs. Sarah Graham. End footnote. One morning in the year 1784, he started with his three sons, Mordecai, Josiah, and Thomas, to the edge of the clearing, and began the day's work. A shot from the bush killed the father. Mordecai, the eldest son, ran instinctively to the house, Josiah to the neighbouring fort for assistance, and Thomas, the youngest, a child of six, was left with the corpse of his father. Mordecai, reaching the cabin, seized the rifle and saw through the loophole an Indian in his war paint stooping to raise the child from the ground. He took deliberate aim at a white ornament on the breast of the savage and brought him down. The little boy, thus released, ran to the cabin, and Mordecai, from the loft, renewed his fire upon the savages, who began to show themselves from the thicket until Josiah returned with assistance from the stockade and the assailants fled. This tragedy made an indelible impression on the mind of Mordecai, either a spirit of revenge for his murdered father or a sportsmanlike pleasure in his successful shot made him a determined Indian stalker and he rarely stopped to inquire whether the red man who came within the range of his rifle was friendly or hostile. Footnote. Late in life, Mordecai Lincoln removed to Hancock County, Illinois, where his descendants still live. End footnote. The head of the family being gone, the widow Lincoln soon removed to a more thickly settled neighborhood in Washington County. There her children grew up. Mordecai and Josiah became reputable citizens. The two daughters married two men named Croom and Brumfield. Thomas, to whom were reserved the honours of an illustrious paternity, learned the trade of a carpenter. He was an easy-going man entirely without ambition, but not without self-respect. Though the friendliest and most jovial of gossips, he was not insensible to affronts, and when his slow anger was roused, he was formidable adversary. Several border bullies at different times crowded him indiscreetly and were promptly and thoroughly whipped. He was strong, well-knit and sinewy, but little over the medium height, though in other respects he seems to have resembled his son in appearance. On the 12th of June, 1806, while learning his trade in the carpenter shop of Joseph Hanks in Elizabethtown, he married Nancy Hanks, a niece of his employer, near Beachland in Washington County. Footnote. All previous accounts give the date of this marriage as September 23rd. This error arose from a clerical blunder in the county record of marriages. The minister, the Reverend Jesse Head, in making his report, wrote the date before the names. The clerk, copying it, lost the proper sequence of the entries and gave to the Lincolns the date belonging to the next couple on the list. End footnote. 
She was one of a large family who had emigrated from Virginia with the Lincolns and with another family called Sparrow. They had endured together the trials of pioneer life. Their close relations continued for many years after and were cemented by frequent intermarriage. Mrs. Lincoln's mother was named Lucy Hanks. Her sisters were Betty, Polly, and Nancy, who married Thomas Sparrow, Jesse Friend, and Levy Hall. The childhood of Nancy was passed with the Sparrows, and she was oftener called by their name than by her own. The whole family connection was composed of people so little given to letters that it is hard to determine the proper names and relationships of the younger members amid the tangle of traditional cousinships. Footnote. The Hanks family seem to have gone from Pennsylvania and thence to Kentucky, about the same time with the Lincolns. They also belong to the communion of friends. Historical Collections of Gwynedd by H. M. Jenkins End footnote. Those who went to Indiana with Thomas Lincoln and grew up with his children are the ones that need demand our attention. There was no hint of future glory in the wedding or the bringing home of Nancy Lincoln. All accounts represent her as a handsome young woman of twenty-three, of appearance and intellect superior to her lowly fortunes. She could read and write, a remarkable accomplishment in her circle, and even taught her husband to form the letters of his name. He had no such valuable wedding gift to bestow upon her. He brought her down to a little house in Elizabethtown, where he and she and Want dwelt together in fourteen feet square. The next year a daughter was born to them, and the next the young carpenter, not finding his work remunerative enough for his growing needs, removed to a little farm which he had brought on the easy terms then prevalent in Kentucky. It was on the big south fork of Nolan Creek, in what was then Hardin and is now La Rue country, three miles from Hodgenville. The ground had nothing attractive about it but cheapness. It was hardly more grateful than the rocky hill slopes of New England. It required full as earnest and intelligent industry to persuade a living out of those barren hillocks and weedy hollows, covered with stunted and scrubby underbrush, as it would amid the rocks and sands of the northern coast. Thomas Lincoln settled down in this dismal solitude to a deeper poverty than any of his name had ever known. And there, in the midst of the most unpromising circumstances that ever witnessed the advent of a hero into this world, Abraham Lincoln was born on the 12th day of February, 1809. Four years later, Thomas Lincoln purchased a fine farm of 238 acres on Knob Creek, near where it flows into the Rolling Fork, and succeeded in getting a portion of it into cultivation. The title, however, remained in him only a little while, and after his property had passed out of his control, he looked about for another place to establish himself. Of all these years of Abraham Lincoln's early childhood, we know almost nothing. He lived a solitary life in the woods, returning from his lonesome little games to his cheerless home. He never talked of these days to his most intimate friends. Once, when asked what he remembered about the war with Great Britain, he replied, Nothing but this. I had been fishing one day and caught a little fish which I was taking home. I met a soldier in the road, and having been always told at home that we must be good to the soldiers, I gave him my fish. This is only a faint glimpse, but what it shows is rather pleasant, the generous child and the patriotic household. But there is no question that these first years of his life had their lasting effect upon the temperament of this great mirthful and melancholy man. He had little schooling. He accompanied his sister Sarah to the only school that existed in their neighbourhood, one kept by Zachariah Riney, another by Caleb Hazel, where he learned his alphabet and a little more. Footnote. The daughter of Thomas Lincoln is sometimes called Nancy and sometimes Sarah. She seems to have been born the former name during her mother's lifetime, and to have taken her stepmother's name after Mr. Lincoln's second marriage. End footnote. But of all those advantages for the cultivation of a young mind and spirit which every home now offers to its children, 
the books, toys, ingenious games, and daily devotion of parental love, he knew absolutely nothing. Relocated footnote. Soon after Mr. Lincoln arrived in Washington in 1861, he received the following letter from one of his Virginia kinsmen, the last communication which ever came from them. It was written on paper, adorned with a portrait of Jefferson Davis, and was enclosed in an envelope emblazoned with the Confederate flag. To Abraham Lincoln, Esquire, President of the Northern Confederacy, Sir, having just returned from a trip through Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee, permit me to inform you that you will get whipped out of your boots. Today I met a gentleman from Anna, Illinois, and although he voted for you, he says that the moment your troops leave Cairo, they will get the spots knocked out of them. My dear sir, these are facts which time will prove to be correct. I am, sir, with every consideration, yours respectfully, Minor Lincoln, of the Staunton Stocks of Lincolns. There was a young Abraham Lincoln on the Confederate site, in the Shenandoah, distinguished for his courage and ferocity. He lay in wait and shot a drunkard preacher, whom he suspected of furnishing information to the Union Army. Letter from Samuel W. Pennypacker. End footnote. Relocated footnote. In giving to the wife of the pioneer Lincoln the name of Mary Shipley, we follow the tradition in his family. The Honourable J. L. Knoll of Misery, grandson of Nancy Brumfield, Abraham Lincoln's youngest child, has given us so clearly a statement of the case that we cannot hesitate to accept it, although it conflicts with equally positive statements from other sources. The late Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy, who gave much intelligent effort to genealogical researches, was convinced that the Abraham Lincoln who married Miss Hannah Winters, a daughter of Anne Boone, sister of the famous Daniel, was the President's grandfather. Waddell's Annals of Augusta County says he married Elizabeth Winter, a cousin of Daniel Boone. The Boone and Lincoln families were large, and there were frequent intermarriages among them, and the patriarchal name of Abraham was a favourite one. There was still another Lincoln, Hananiah by name, who was also intimately associated with the Boones. His signature appears on the surveyor's certificate for Abraham Lincoln's land in Jefferson County, and he joined Daniel Boone in 1798 in the purchase of the tract of land on the Misery River, where Boone died. Letter from Richard V. B. Lincoln, printed in the Williamsport Banner, February 25th, 1881. End footnote. Relocated footnote. In the possession of Colonel Reuben T. Durrett of Louisville, a gentleman who has made the early history of his state a subject of careful study, and to whom we are greatly indebted for information in regard to the settlement of the Lincolns in Kentucky, he gives the following list of lands in the state owned by Abraham Lincoln. 1. 400 acres on Long Run, a branch of Floyd's Fork in Jefferson County, entered May 29, 1780, and surveyed May 7, 1785. We have in our possession the original patent issued by Governor Garrard of Kentucky to Abraham Lincoln for this property. It was founded by Colonel A. C. Matthews of the 99th Illinois in 1863 at an abandoned residence near Indianola, Texas. 2. 800 acres on Green River near Green River Lick entered June 7, 1780 and surveyed October 12, 1784. 3. 500 acres in Campbell County, date of entry not known, but surveyed September 27, 1798 and patented June 30, 1799. The survey and patent evidently following his entry after his death. It is possible that this was the 500-acre tract found in Boone's field book in the possession of Lyman C. Draper, Esquire, Secretary of the Wisconsin Historical Society, and erroneously supposed by some to have been in Mercer County. Boone was a deputy of Colonel Thomas Marshall, surveyor of Fayette County. End footnote. Relocated footnote. The following is a copy of the marriage bond. Know all men by these presents. 
that we, Thomas Lincoln and Richard Berry, are held and firmly bound unto His Excellency, the Governor of Kentucky, in that just and full sum of fifty pounds current money to the payment of which, well and truly to be made to the said Governor and his successors, we bind ourselves, our heirs, etc., jointly and severally, firmly by these presents, sealed with our seals and dated this tenth day of June, 1806. The conditions of the above obligation is such that whereas there is a marriage shortly intended between the above-bound Thomas Lincoln and Nancy Hanks, for which a license has issued, now if there be no lawful cause to obstruct the said marriage, then this obligation to be void, else to remain in full force and virtue in the law. Thomas Lincoln, seal. Richard Berry, seal. Witness, John H. Parrott guardian richard berry was a connection of lincoln his wife was a shipley End footnote relocated footnote there is still living eighteen eighty six near knob creek in kentucky at the age of eighty a man who claims to have known abraham lincoln in his childhood austin Gollaher. he says he used to play with abe lincoln in the shavings of his father's carpenter shop he tells us a story which, if accurate, entitles him to the civic crown which the Romans used to give to one who saved the life of a citizen. When Gollaher was eleven and Lincoln eight, the two boys were in the woods in pursuit of partridges. In trying to coon across Knob Creek on a log, Lincoln fell in and Gollaher fished him out with a sycamore branch, a service to the Republic, the value of which it would be difficult to compute. End footnote. End of section one. Section two of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen L. Moss. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 2. Indiana. By the time the boy Abraham had attained his seventh year, the social condition of Kentucky had changed considerably from the early pioneer days. Life had assumed a more settled and orderly course. The old, barbarous equality of the earlier time was gone. A difference of classes began to be seen. Those who held slaves assumed a distinct social superiority over those who did not. Thomas Lincoln, concluding that Kentucky was no country for a poor man, determined to seek his fortune in Indiana. He had heard of rich and unoccupied lands in Perry County in that state, and thither he determined to go. He built a rude raft, loaded it with his kit of tools and four hundred gallons of whiskey, and trusted his fortunes to the winding watercourses. He met with only one accident on his way. His raft capsized in the Ohio River, but he fished up his kit of tools and most of the ardent spirits, and arrived safely at the place of a settler named Posey, with whom he left his odd invoice of household goods for the wilderness, while he started on foot to look for a home in the dense forest. He selected a spot which pleased him in his first day's journey. He then walked back to Knob Creek and brought his family on to their new home. No humbler cavalcade ever invaded the Indiana timber. Besides his wife and two children, his earthly possessions were of the slightest, for the backs of two borrowed horses sufficed for the load. Insufficient bedding and clothing, a few pans and kettles, were their sole movable wealth. They relied on Lincoln's kit of tools for their furniture, and on his rifle for their food. At Posey's they hired a wagon and literally hewed a path through the wilderness to their new habitation near Little Pigeon Creek, a mile and a half east of Gentryville, in a rich and fertile forest country. Thomas Lincoln, with the assistance of his wife and children, 
built a temporary shelter of the sort called in the frontier language a half-faced camp, merely a shed of poles, which defended the inmates on three sides from foul weather, but left them open to its inclemency in front. For a whole year his family lived in this wretched fold, while he was clearing a little patch of ground for planting corn, and building a rough cabin for a permanent residence. They moved into the latter before it was half completed, for by this time the sparrows had followed the Lincolns from Kentucky, and the half-faced camp was given up to them. But the rude cabin seemed so spacious and comfortable after the squalor of the camp, that Thomas Lincoln did no further work on it for a long time. He left it for a year or two without doors or windows or floor. The battle for existence allowed him no time for such superfluities. He raised enough corn to support life. The dense forest around him abounded in every form of feathered game. A little way from his cabin an open glade was full of deer licks, and an hour or two of idle waiting was generally rewarded by a shot at a fine deer, which would furnish meat for a week and material for breeches and shoes. His cabin was like that of other pioneers, a few three-legged stools, a bedstead made of poles stuck between the logs in the angle of the cabin, the outside corner supported by a crotched stick driven into the ground, the table, a huge hewed log standing on four legs, a pot, kettle, and skillet, and a few tin and pewter dishes were all the furniture. The boy Abraham climbed at night to his bed of leaves in the loft, by a ladder of wooden pins driven into the logs. This life has been vaunted by poets and romancers as a happy and healthful one. Even Dennis Hanks, speaking of his youthful days when his only home was the half-faced camp, says, I tell you, Billy, I enjoyed myself better then than I ever have since. But we may distrust the reminiscences of old settlers, who see their youth in the flattering light of distance. The life was neither enjoyable nor wholesome. The rank woods were full of malaria, and singular epidemics from time to time ravaged the settlements. In the autumn of 1818 the little community of Pigeon Creek was almost exterminated by a frightful pestilence called the milk sickness, or in the dialect of the country, the milk sick. It is a mysterious disease, which has been the theme of endless wrangling among Western physicians, and the difficulty of ascertaining anything about it has been greatly increased by the local sensitiveness which forbids any one to admit that any well-defined case has ever been seen in his neighborhood. Although just over the creek, or in the next county, they have had it bad. It seems to have been a malignant form of fever, attributed variously to malaria and to the eating of poisonous herbs by the cattle, attacking cattle as well as human beings, attended with violent retching and a burning sensation in the stomach, often terminating fatally on the third day. In many cases those who apparently recovered lingered for years with health seriously impaired. Among the pioneers of Pigeon Creek, so ill-fed, ill-housed, and uncared for, there was little prospect of recovery from such a grave disorder. The sparrows, husband and wife, died early in October, and Nancy Hanks Lincoln followed them after an interval of a few days. Thomas Lincoln made the coffins for his dead, out of green lumber cut with a whipsaw, and they were all buried, with scant ceremony, in a little clearing of the forest. It is related of young Abraham, that he sorrowed most of all that his mother should have been laid away with such maimed rites, and that he contrived several months later to have a wandering preacher named David Elkin brought to the settlement to deliver a funeral sermon over her grave, already white with the early winter snows. Footnote. A stone has been placed over the site of the grave by P. E. Studebaker of South Bend, Indiana. The stone bears the following inscription. Nancy Hanks Lincoln, mother of President Lincoln, died October 5th, A.D. 1818, aged 35 years.
erected by a friend of her martyred son. 1879. End footnote. This was the dreariest winter of his life, for before the next December came his father had brought from Kentucky a new wife, who was to change the lot of all the desolate little family very much for the better. Sarah Bush had been an acquaintance of Thomas Lincoln before his first marriage. She had, it is said, rejected him to marry one Johnston, the jailer at Elizabethtown, who had died, leaving her with three children, a boy and two girls. When Lincoln's widowhood had lasted a year, he went down to Elizabethtown to begin again the wooing broken off so many years before. He wasted no time in preliminaries, but promptly made his wishes known, and the next morning they were married. It was growing late in the autumn, and the pioneer probably dreaded another lonely winter on Pigeon Creek. Mrs. Johnston was not altogether portionless. She had a store of household goods, which filled a four-horse wagon borrowed of Ralph Groom, Thomas Lincoln's brother-in-law, to transport the bride to Indiana. It took little time for this energetic and honest Christian woman to make her influence felt, even in those discouraging surroundings, and Thomas Lincoln and the children were the better for her coming all the rest of their lives. The lack of doors and floors was at once corrected. Her honest pride inspired her husband to greater thrift and industry. The goods she brought with her compelled some effort at harmony in the other fittings of the house. She dressed the children in warmer clothing, and put them to sleep in comfortable beds. With this slight addition to their resources, the family were much improved in appearance, behavior, and self-respect. Thomas Lincoln joined the Baptist Church at Little Pigeon in 1823. His oldest child, Sarah, followed his example three years later. They were known as active and consistent members of that communion. Lincoln was himself a good carpenter when he chose to work at his trade. A walnut table made by him is still preserved as part of the furniture of the church to which he belonged. Such a woman as Sarah Bush could not be careless of so important a matter as the education of her children, and they made the best use of the scanty opportunities the neighborhood afforded. It was a wild region, writes Mr. Lincoln, in one of those rare bits of autobiography which he left behind him, with many bears and other wild animals still in the woods. There were some schools, so called, but no qualification was ever required of a teacher beyond reading, writing, and ciphering to the rule of three. If a straggler supposed to understand Latin happened to sojourn in the neighborhood, he was looked upon as a wizard. There was absolutely nothing to excite ambition for education. But in the case of this ungainly boy there was no necessity of any external incentive. A thirst for knowledge as a means of rising in the world was innate in him. It had nothing to do with that love of science for its own sake, which has been so often seen in lowly savants, who have sacrificed their lives to the pure desire of knowing the works of God. All the little learning he ever acquired he seized as a tool to better his condition. He learned his letters that he might read books, and see how men in the great world outside of his woods had borne themselves in the fight for which he longed. He learned to write, first, that he might have an accomplishments his playmates had not, then that he might help his elders by writing their letters, and enjoy the feeling of usefulness which this gave him, and finally that he might copy what struck him in his reading, and thus make it his own for future use. He learned to cipher certainly from no love of mathematics, but because it might come in play in some more congenial business than the farm work which bounded the horizon of his contemporaries. Had it not been for that interior spur which kept his clear spirit at its task, his schools could have done little for him, for counting his attendance under Riney and Hazel in Kentucky, and under Dorsey, Crawford, and Swaney in Indiana, it amounted to less than a year in all. The schools were much alike. They were held in deserted cabins of round logs, with earthen floors, 
and small holes for windows, sometimes illuminated by as much light as could penetrate through panes of paper greased with lard. The teachers were usually in keeping with their primitive surroundings. The profession offered no reward sufficient to attract men of education or capacity. After a few months of desultory instruction, young Abraham knew all that these vagrant literati could teach him. His last school days were passed with one Swaney in 1826, who taught at a distance of four and a half miles from the Lincoln cabin. The nine miles of walking doubtless seemed to Thomas Lincoln a waste of time, and the lad was put at steady work, and saw no more of school. But it is questionable whether he lost anything by being deprived of the ministrations of the backwoods dominies. When his tasks ended, his studies became the chief pleasure of his life. In all the intervals of his work, in which he never took delight, knowing well enough that he was born for something better than that, he read, wrote, and ciphered incessantly. His reading was naturally limited by his opportunities, for books were among the rarest of luxuries in that region and time. But he read everything he could lay his hands on, and he was certainly fortunate in the few books of which he became the possessor. It would hardly be possible to select a better handful of classics for a youth in his circumstances than the few volumes he turned with a nightly and daily hand. The Bible, Aesop's Fables, Robinson Crusoe, The Pilgrim's Progress, A History of the United States, and Weems' Life of Washington. These were the best, and these he read over and over till he knew them almost by heart. But his veracity for anything printed was insatiable. He would sit in the twilight and read a dictionary as long as he could see. He used to go to David Turnham's, the town constable, and devour the revised statutes of Indiana, as boys in our day do the three guardsmen. Of the books he did not own, he took voluminous notes, filing his copy-book with choice extracts, and poring over them until they were fixed in his memory. He could not afford to waste paper upon his original compositions. He would sit by the fire at night and cover the wooden shovel with essays and arithmetical exercises, which he would shave off and then begin again. It is touching to think of this great-spirited child, battling year after year against his evil star, wasting his ingenuity upon devices and makeshifts, his high intelligence starving for want of the simple appliances of education that are now offered gratis to the poorest and most indifferent. He did a man's work from the time he left school. His strength and stature were already far beyond those of ordinary men. He wrought his appointed tasks ungrudgingly, though without enthusiasm. But when his employer's day was over, his own began. John Hanks says, When Abe and I returned to the house from work, he would go to the cupboard, snatch a piece of cornbread, take down a book, sit down, cock his legs up as high as his head, and read. The picture may be lacking in grace, but its truthfulness is beyond question. The habit remained with him always. Some of his greatest work in later years was done in this grotesque western fashion, sitting on his shoulder-blades. Otherwise, his life at this time differed little from that of ordinary farmhands. His great strength and intelligence made him a valuable laborer, and his unfailing good temper and flow of rude rustic wit rendered him the most agreeable of comrades. He was always ready with some kindly act or word for others. Once he saved the life of the town drunkard, whom he found freezing by the roadside, by carrying him in his strong arms to the tavern and working over him until he revived. It is a curious fact that this act of common humanity was regarded as something remarkable in the neighborhood. The grateful sot himself always said, It was mighty clever of Abe to tote me so far that cold night. It was also considered an eccentricity that he hated and preached against cruelty to animals. Some of his comrades remember still his bursts of righteous wrath, when a boy, against the wanton murder of turtles, 
and other creatures. He was evidently of better and finer clay than his fellows, even in those wild and ignorant days. At home he was the life of the singularly assorted household, which consisted, besides his parents and himself, of his own sister, Mrs. Lincoln's two girls and a boy, Dennis Hanks, the legacy of the dying Sparrow family, and John Hanks, son of the carpenter Joseph, with whom Thomas Lincoln learned his trade, who came from Kentucky several years after the others. It was probably as much the inexhaustible good nature and kindly helpfulness of young Abraham which kept the peace among all these heterogeneous elements, effervescing with youth and confined in a one-roomed cabin, as it was the Christian sweetness and firmness of the woman of the house. It was a happy and united household, brothers and sisters and cousins living peacefully under the gentle rule of the good stepmother, but all acknowledging from a very early period the supremacy in goodness and cleverness of their big brother Abraham. Mrs. Lincoln, not long before her death, gave striking testimony of his winning and loyal character. She said to Mr. Herndon, I can say what scarcely one mother in a thousand can say. Abe never gave me a cross word or look, and never refused in fact or appearance to do anything I asked him. His mind and mine, what little I had, seemed to run together. I had a son John, who was raised with Abe. Both were good boys, but I must say, both now being dead, that Abe was the best boy I ever saw, or expect to see. Such were the beginnings of this remarkable career, sacred as we see from childhood, to duty and to human kindliness. We are making no claim of early saintship for him. He was merely a good boy, with sufficient wickedness to prove his humanity. One of his employers, undazzled by recent history, faithfully remembers that young Abe liked his dinner and his pay better than his work. There is surely nothing alien to ordinary mortality in this. It is also reported that he sometimes impeded the celerity of harvest operations by making burlesque speeches, or worse than that, comic sermons, from the top of some tempting stump, to the delight of the hired hands and the exasperation of the farmer. His budding talents as a writer were not always used discreetly. He was too much given to scribbling coarse satires and chronicles in prose and in something which had to him and his friends the air of verse. From this arose occasional heart-burnings and feuds, in which Abraham bore his part according to the custom of the country. Despite his Quaker ancestry and his natural love of peace, he was no non-resistant, and when he once entered upon a quarrel the opponent usually had the worst of it but he was generous and placable, and some of his best friends were those with whom he had had differences, and had settled them in the way then prevalent, in a ring of serious spectators, calmly and judicially ruminant, under the shade of some spreading oak at the edge of the timber. Before we close our sketch of this period of Lincoln's life, it may not be amiss to glance for a moment at the state of society among the people with whom his lot was cast, in these important years. In most respects there had been little moral or material improvement since the early settlement of the country. Their houses were usually of one room, built of round logs with the bark on. We have known a man to gain the sobriquet of Split Log Mitchell by indulging in the luxury of building a cabin of square-hewn timbers. Their dress was still mostly of tanned deer hide, a material to the last degree uncomfortable when the wearer was caught in a shower. Their shoes were of the same, and a good western authority calls a wet moccasin a decent way of going barefoot. About the time, however, when Lincoln grew to manhood, garments of wool and of tow began to be worn, dyed with the juice of the butternut or white walnut and the hides of neat cattle began to be tanned. But for a good while it was only the women who indulged in these novelties. There was little public worship. Occasionally an itinerant preacher visited a county, and the settlers for miles around would go nearly in mass to the meeting. If a man was possessed of a wagon, 
the family rode luxuriously, but as a rule the men walked and the women went on horseback with the little children in their arms. It was considered no violation of the sanctities of the occasion to carry a rifle and take advantage of any game which might be stirring during the long walk. Arriving at the place of meeting, which was some log cabin if the weather was foul, or the shade of a tree if it was fair, the assembled worshippers threw their provisions into a common store and picnicked in neighborly companionship. The preacher would then take off his coat and go at his work with an energy unknown to our days. There were few other social meetings. Men came together for raisings, where a house was built in a day, for log-rollings, where tons of excellent timber were piled together and wastefully burned, for wolf-hunts, where a tall pole was erected in the midst of a prairie or clearing, and a great circle of hunters formed around it, sometimes of miles in diameter, which, gradually contracting with shouts and yells, drove all the game in the woods together at the pole for slaughter, and for horse-races, which bore little resemblance to those magnificent exhibitions which are the boast of Kentucky at this time. In these affairs the women naturally took no part, but weddings, which were entertainments scarcely less rude and boisterous, were their own peculiar province. These festivities lasted rarely less than twenty-four hours. The guests assembled in the morning. There was a race for the whiskey bottle, a midday dinner, an afternoon of rough games and outrageous practical jokes, a supper, and a dance at night, interrupted by the successive withdrawals of the bride and of the groom, attended with ceremonies and jests of more than Rabelaisian crudeness, and a noisy dispersal next day. The one point at which they instinctively clung to civilization was their regard for law and reverence for courts of justice. Yet these were of the simplest character and totally devoid of any adventitious accessories. An early jurist of the county writes, I was circuit prosecuting attorney at the time of the trials at the falls of Fall Creek, where Pendleton now stands. Four of the prisoners were convicted of murder, and three of them hung for killing Indians. The court was held in a double log cabin. The grand jury sat upon a log in the woods, and the foreman signed the bills of indictment which I had prepared upon his knee. There was not a petite juror that had shoes on. All wore moccasins, and were belted around the waist, and carried side-knives used by the hunters. Yet amidst all this apparent savagery we see justice was done, and the law vindicated even against the bitterest prejudices of these pioneer jurymen. They were full of strange superstitions. The belief in witchcraft had long ago passed away with the smoke of the faggots from old and new England, but it survived far into this century in Kentucky and the lower halves of Indiana and Illinois, touched with a peculiar tinge of African magic. The pioneers believed in it for good and evil. Their veterinary practice was mostly by charms and incantations, and when a person believed himself bewitched, a shot at the image of the witch with a bullet melted out of a half-dollar was the favorite curative agency. Luck was an active divinity in their apprehension, powerful for blessing or bane, announced by homely signs, to be placated by quaint ceremonies. A dog crossing the hunter's path spoiled his day, unless he instantly hooked his little fingers together and pulled till the animal disappeared. They were familiar with the ever-recurring mystification of the witch-hazel, or divining-rod, and the cure by faith was as well known to them as it has since become in a more sophisticated state of society. The commonest occurrences were heralds of death and doom. A bird lighting in a window, a dog baying at certain hours, the cough of a horse in the direction of a child, the sight, or worse still, the touch of a dead snake, heralded domestic woe. A wagon driving past the house with a load of baskets was a warning of atmospheric disturbance. A vague and ignorant astronomy governed their plantings and sowings, the breeding of their cattle, and all farm work. 
They must fell trees for fence rails before noon and in the waxing of the moon. Fences built when there was no moon would give way, but that was the proper season for planting potatoes and other vegetables whose fruit grows underground. Those which bore their product in the air must be planted when the moon shone. The magical power of the moon was wide in its influence. It extended to the most minute details of life. Among these people, and in all essential respects one of them, Abraham Lincoln passed his childhood and youth. He was not remarkably precocious. His mind was slow in acquisition, and his powers of reasoning and rhetoric improved constantly to the end of his life at a rate of progress marvelously regular and sustained. But there was that about him, even at the age of nineteen years, which might well justify his admiring friends in presaging for him an unusual career. He had read every book he could find, and could spell down the whole county at their orthographical contests. By dint of constant practice he had acquired an admirably clear and serviceable handwriting. He occasionally astounded his companions by such glimpses of occult science as that the world is round, and that the sun is relatively stationary. He wrote, for his own amusement and edification, essays on politics, of which gentlemen of standing who had been favored with a perusal said with authority at the crossroads grocery, The world can't beat it! One or two of these compositions got into print, and vastly increased the author's local fame. He was also a magnanimous boy, with a larger and kindlier spirit than common. His generosity, courage, and capability of discerning two sides to a dispute were remarkable even then, and won him the admiration of those to whom such qualities were unknown. But perhaps, after all, the thing which gained and fixed his mastery over his fellows was to a great degree his gigantic stature and strength. He attained his full growth six feet and four inches, two years before he came of age. He rarely met with a man he could not easily handle. His strength is still a tradition in Spencer County. One aged man says that he has seen him pick up and carry away a chicken house weighing six hundred pounds. At another time, seeing some men preparing a contrivance for lifting some large posts, Abe quickly shouldered the posts and took them where they were needed. One of his employers says, he could sink an axe deeper into wood than any man I ever saw. With strength like this and a brain to direct it, a man was a born leader in that country and at that time. There are, of course, foolish stories extant that Abraham used to boast and that others used to predict that he would become president some day. The same thing is daily said of thousands of boys who will never be constables but there is evidence that he felt too large for the life of a farmhand on Pigeon Creek, and his thoughts naturally turned, after the manner of restless boys in the West, to the river, as the avenue of escape from the narrow life of the woods. He once asked an old friend to give him a recommendation to some steamboat on the Ohio, but desisted from his purpose on being reminded that his father had the right to dispose of his time for a year or so more. But in 1828 an opportunity offered for a little glimpse of the world outside, and the boy gladly embraced it. He was hired by Mr. Gentry, the proprietor of the neighboring village of Gentryville, to accompany his son with a flat boat of produce to New Orleans and intermediate landings. The voyage was made successfully, and Abraham gained great credit for his management and sale of the cargo. The only important incident of the trip occurred at the plantation of Madame Duchesne, a few miles below Baton Rouge. The young merchants had tied up for the night and were asleep in the cabin when they were aroused by shuffling footsteps, which proved to be a gang of marauding negroes coming to rob the boat. Abraham instantly attacked them with a club, knocked several overboard, and put the rest to flight, Flushed with battle, he and Alan Gentry carried the war into the enemy's country, and pursued the retreating Africans some distance into the darkness. They then returned to the boat, bleeding but victorious, and hastily swung into the stream and floated down the river till daylight. 
Lincoln's exertion in later years for the welfare of the African race showed that this nocturnal battle had not led him to any hasty and hostile generalizations. The next autumn, John Hanks, the steadiest and most trustworthy of his family, went to Illinois. Though an illiterate and rather dull man, he had a good deal of solidity of character, and consequently some influence and consideration in the household. He settled in Macon County, and was so well pleased with the county, and especially with its admirable distribution into prairie and timber, that he sent repeated messages to his friends in Indiana to come out and join him. Thomas Lincoln was always ready to move. He had probably by this time despaired of ever owning any unencumbered real estate in Indiana, and the younger members of the family had little to bind them to the place where they saw nothing in the future but hard work and poor living. Thomas Lincoln handed over his farm to Mr. Gentry, sold his crop of corn and hogs, packed his household goods and those of his children and sons-in-law into a single wagon, drawn by two yoke of oxen, the combined wealth of himself and Dennis Hanks, and started for the new state. His daughter Sarah, or Nancy, for she was called by both names, who married Aaron Grigsby a few years before, had died in childbirth. The emigrating family consisted of the Lincolns, John Johnston, Mrs. Lincoln's son and her daughters, Mrs. Hall and Mrs. Hanks, with their husbands. Two weeks of weary tramping over forest roads and muddy prairie, and the dangerous fording of streams swollen by the February thaws, brought the party to John Hanks's place near Decatur. He met them with a frank and energetic welcome. He had already selected a piece of ground for them a few miles from his own, and had the logs ready for their house. They numbered men enough to build without calling in their neighbors, and immediately put up a cabin on the north fork of the Sangamon River. The family thus housed and sheltered, one more bit of filial work remained for Abraham before assuming his virile independence. With the assistance of John Hanks he plowed fifteen acres, and split from the tall walnut trees of the primeval forest enough rails to surround them with a fence. Little did either dream, while engaged in this work, that the day would come when the appearance of John Hanks in a public meeting, with two of these rails on his shoulder, would electrify a state convention, and kindle throughout the country a contagious and passionate enthusiasm whose results would reach to endless generations. End of section 2 Recording by Stephen L. Moss StephenLMoss.com Section 3 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Veronica Jenkins. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 3. Illinois in 1830. The Lincolns arrived in Illinois just in time to entitle themselves to be called pioneers. When, in after years, associations of old settlers began to be formed in central Illinois, the qualification for membership agreed upon by common consent was a residence in the country before the winter of the deep snow. This was in 1830-31, to 31, a season of such extraordinary severity that it has formed for half a century a recognized date in the middle counties of Illinois among those to whom in those days diaries and journals were unknown. The snowfall began in the Christmas holidays and continued until the snow was three feet deep on level ground. Then came a cold rain, freezing as it fell, until a thick crust of ice gathered over the snow. The winter became intensely cold, the mercury sinking to 12 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, and remaining there for two weeks. The storm came on with such a suddenness that all who were abroad had great trouble in reaching their homes, and many perished. One man relates that he and a friend or two were out in a hunting party with an ox team. They had collected a wagon load of game and were on their way home when the storm struck them. 
after they had gone four miles they were compelled to abandon their wagon the snow fell in heavy masses as if thrown from a scoop shovel arriving within two miles of their habitation they were forced to trust to the instinct of their animals and reached home hanging to the tails of their steers not all were so fortunate some were found weeks afterwards in the snowdrifts their flesh gnawed by famished wolves and the fate of others was unknown until the late spring sunshine revealed their resting places to those who escaped the winter was tedious and terrible it is hard for us to understand the isolation to which such weather condemned the pioneer for weeks they remained in their cabins hoping for some mitigation of the frost when at last they were driven out by the fear of famine the labor of establishing communications was enormous they finally made roads by wallowing through the snow as an illinois historian expresses it and going patiently over the same track until the snow was trampled hard and rounded like a turnpike these roads lasted far into the spring when the snow had melted from the plains and wound for miles like threads of silver over the rich black loam of the prairies after that winter game was never again so plentiful in the state much still remained of course but it never recovered entirely from the rigors of that season and the stupid enterprise of the pioneer hunters who when they came out of their snow beleaguered cabins began chasing and killing the starved deer by herds it was easy work the crust of the snow was strong enough to bear the weight of men and dogs but the slender hoofs of the deer would after a few bounds pierce the treacherous surface the destructive slaughter went on until the game grew too lean to be worth the killing all sorts of wild animals grew scarce from that winter old settlers say that the slow cowardly breed of prairie wolves which used to be caught and killed as readily as sheep disappeared about that time and none but the fleeter and stronger survived only once since then has nature shown such extravagant severity in illinois and that was on a day in the winter of eighteen thirty six known to illinoisans as the sudden change at noon on the twentieth of december after a warm and rainy morning the ground being covered with mud and slush the temperature fell instantly forty degrees a man riding into springfield for a marriage license says a roaring and crackling wind came up upon him and the raindrops dripping from his bridle reins and beard changed in a second into jingling icicles he rode hastily into the town and arrived in a few minutes at his destination but his clothes were frozen like sheet iron and man and saddle had to be taken into the house together to be thawed apart geese and chickens were caught by the feet and wings and frozen to the wet ground a drove of a thousand hogs which were being driven to st louis rushed together for warmth and became piled in a great heap those inside smothered and those outside froze and the ghastly pyramid remained there on the prairie for weeks the drovers barely escaped with their lives men killed their horses disemboweled them and crept into the cavity of their bodies to escape the murderous wind footnote although the old settlers of sagamon county are acquainted with these facts and we have often heard them and many others like them from the lips of eyewitnesses we have preferred to cite only these incidents of the sudden change which are given in the careful and conscientious compilation entitled the early settlers of sangamon county by john carroll power End footnote. the pioneer period of illinois was ending as thomas lincoln and his tall boy drove their ox team over the indiana line the population of the state had grown to a hundred and fifty seven thousand four hundred forty seven it still clung to the wooden borders of the water courses scattered settlements were to be found all along the mississippi and its affluents from where cairo struggled for life in the swamps of the ohio to the bustling and busy mining camps which the recent discovery of lead had brought to galena a line of villages from alton to peoria dotted the woodland which the illinois river had stretched like a green baldric diagonally across the bosom of the state then there were long reaches of wilderness before you came to fort dearborn where there was nothing as yet to give promise of that miraculous growth which was soon to make chicago a proverb to the world 
there were a few settlements in the fertile region called the military tract the southern part of the state was getting itself settled here and there people were coming in freely to the sangamon country but a grassy solitude stretched from galena to chicago and the upper half of the state was generally a wilderness the earlier emigrants principally of the poorer class of southern farmers shunned the prairies with something of a superstitious dread they preferred to pass the first years of their occupation in the wasteful and laborious work of clearing a patch of timber for corn rather than enter upon those rich savannas which were ready to break into fertility at the slightest provocation of culture even so late as eighteen thirty five writes j f speed no one dreamed the prairies would ever be occupied it was thought they would be used perpetually as grazing fields for stock for years the long procession of movers wound over those fertile and neglected plains taking no hint of the wealth suggested by the rank luxuriance of vegetable growth around them the carpet of brilliant flowers spread over the verdant knolls the strong succulent grass that waved in the breeze full of warm and vital odor as high as the waist of a man in after years when the emigration from the northern and eastern states began to pour in the prairies were rapidly taken up and the relative growth and importance of the two sections of the state were immediately reversed governor ford writing about eighteen forty seven attributes this result to the fact that the best class of southern people were slow to emigrate to a state where they could not take their slaves while the settlers from the north not being debarred by the state constitution from bringing their property with them were of a different class the northern part of the state was settled in the first instance by wealthy farmers enterprising merchants millers and manufacturers they made farms built mills churches schoolhouses towns and cities and constructed roads and bridges as if by magic so that although the settlements in the southern part of the state are from twenty to fifty years in advance on the score of age yet they are ten years behind in point of wealth and all the appliances of a higher civilization at the time which we are especially considering however the few inhabitants of the south and the centre were principally from what came afterward to be called the border slave states they were mostly a simple neighborly unambitious people contented with their condition living upon plain fare and knowing not much of anything better luxury was of course unknown even wealth if it existed could procure few of the comforts of refined life there was little or no money in circulation exchanges were effected by the most primitive forms of barter and each family had to rely chiefly upon itself for the means of living the neighbors would lend a hand in building a cabin for a newcomer after that he must in most cases shift for himself many a man arriving from an old community and imperfectly appreciating the necessities of pioneer life has found suddenly on the approach of winter that he must learn to make shoes or go barefoot the furniture of their houses was made with an axe from the trees of the forest their clothing was all made at home the buckskin days were over to a great extent though an occasional hunting shirt and pair of moccasins were still seen but flax and hemp had begun to be cultivated and as the wolves were killed off the sheepfolds increased and garments resembling those of civilization were spun and woven and cut and sewed by the women of the family when a man had a suit of jeans colored with butternut dye and his wife a dress of linsey they could appear with the best at a wedding or a quilting frolic the superfluous could not have been said to exist in a community where men made their own buttons where women dug roots in the woods to make their tea with where many children never saw a stick of candy until after they were grown the only sweetmeats known were those a skilful cook could compose from the honey plundered from the hollow oaks where the wild bees had stored it yet there was withal a kind of rude plenty the woods swarmed with game and after swine began to be raised there was the bacon and hoe cake which any southwestern farmer will say is good enough for a king the greatest privation was the lack of steel implements his axe was as precious to the pioneer as his sword to the knight-errant governor john reynolds speaks of the panic felt in his father's family when the axe was dropped into a stream 
a battered piece of tin was carefully saved and smoothed and made into a grater for green corn they had their own amusements of course no form of society is without them from the anthropoid apes to the jockey club as to the grosser and ruder shapes taken by the diversions of the pioneers we will let mr herndon speak their contemporary analyst and ardent panegyrist these men could shave a horse's mane and tail paint disfigure and offer it for sale to the owner they could hoop up in a hogshead a drunken man they themselves being drunk put in and nail fast the head and roll the man downhill a hundred feet or more they could run down a lean and hungry wild pig catch it heat a ten plate stove furnace hot and putting in the pig could cook it they dancing the while a merry jig wild oats of this kind seem hardly compatible with a harvest of civilization but it is contended that such of these roisterers as survived their stormy beginnings became decent and serious citizens indeed mr herndon insists that even in their hot youth they showed the promise of goodness and piety they attended church heard the sermon wept and prayed shouted got up and fought an hour and then went back to prayer just as the spirit moved them the camp meeting may be said with no irreverent intention to have been their principal means of intellectual excitement the circuit preachers were for a long time the only circulating medium of thought and emotion that kept the isolated settlements from utter spiritual stagnation they were men of great physical and moral endurance absolutely devoted to their work which they pursued in the face of every hardship and discouragement their circuits were frequently so great in extent that they were forced to be constantly on the route what reading they did was done in the saddle they received perhaps fifty dollars from the missionary fund and half as much more from their congregations paid for the most part in necessaries of life their oratory was suited to their longitude and was principally addressed to the emotions of their hearers it was often very effective producing shouts and groans and genuflections among the audience at large and terrible convulsions among the more nervous and excitable we hear sometimes of a whole congregation prostrated as by a hurricane flinging their limbs about in furious contortions with wild outcries to this day some of the survivors of that period insist that it was the spirit of the almighty and nothing less that thus manifested itself the minister however did not always share in the delirium of his hearers governor reynolds tells us of a preacher in sangamon county who before his sermon had set a wolf trap in view from his pulpit in the midst of his exhortations his keen eyes saw the distant trap collapse and he continued in the same intonation with which he had been preaching mind the text brethren till i go kill that wolf with all the failings and eccentricities of this singular class of men they did a great deal of good and are entitled to a special credit among those who conquered the wilderness the emotions they excited did not all die away in the shouts and contortions of the meeting not a few of the cabins in the clearings were the abode of a fervent religion and an austere morality many a traveller approaching a rude hut in the woods in the gathering twilight distrusting the gaunt and silent family who gave him an unsmiling welcome the bare interior the rifles and knives conspicuously displayed had felt his fears vanish when he sat down to supper and the master of the house in a few fervent words invoked the blessing of heaven on the meal there was very little social intercourse a visit was a serious matter involving the expenditure of days of travel it was the custom among families when the longing for the sight of kindred faces was too strong to withstand to move in a body to the distant settlement where their relatives lived and remain with them for months at a time the claims of consanguinity were more regarded than now almost the only festivities were those that accompanied weddings and these were of course of a primitive kind the perils and adventures through which the young pioneers went to obtain their brides furnished forth thousands of tales by western firesides instead of taking the rosy daughter of a neighbor the enterprising bachelor would often go back to kentucky 
and pass through as many adventures in bringing his wife home as a returning crusader would meet between Beirut and Vienna. If she was a young woman who respected herself, the household gear she would insist on bringing would entail an Iliad of embarrassments. An old farmer of Sangamon County still talks of a feather bed weighing fifty-four pounds with which his wife made him swim six rivers under penalty of desertion. It was not always easy to find a competent authority to perform the ceremony. A justice in McLean County lived by the bank of a river, and his services were sometimes required by impatient lovers on the other bank, when the waters were too torrential to cross. In such cases, being a conscientious man, he always insisted that they should ride into the stream far enough for him to discern their features, holding torches to their faces by night and by storm. The wooing of those days was prompt and practical. There was no time for the gradual approaches of an idler and more conventional age. It is related of one stout, one of the legendary Nimrods of Illinois, who was well and frequently married, that he had one unfailing formula of courtship. He always promised the ladies whose hearts he was besieging that they should live in the timber where they could pick up their own firewood. Theft was almost unknown, property being so hard to get was jealously guarded, as we have already noticed in speaking of the settlement of Kentucky. The pioneers of Illinois brought with them the same rigid notions of honesty which their environment maintained. A man in Macopin County left his wagon loaded with corn, stuck in the prairie mud for two weeks near a frequented road. When he returned he found some of his corn gone, but there was money enough tied in the sacks to pay for what was taken. Men carrying bags of silver from the towns of Illinois to St. Louis rather made a display of it, as it enhanced their own importance, and there was no fear of robbery. There were, of course, no locks on the cabin doors, and the early merchants sometimes left their stores unprotected for days together when they went to the nearest city to replenish their stock. Of course there were rare exceptions to this rule, but a single theft alarmed and excited a whole neighborhood. When a crime was traced home, the family of the criminal were generally obliged to remove. There were still, even so late as the time to which we are referring, two alien elements in the population of the state, the French and the Indians. The French settlements about Kaskaskia retained much of their national character, and the pioneers from the south who visited them, or settled among them, never ceased to wonder at their gaiety, their peaceable industry and enterprise, and their domestic affection, which they did not care to dissemble and conceal like their shy and reticent neighbors. It was a daily spectacle which never lost its strangeness for the Tennesseans and Kentuckians to see the Frenchman returning from his work, greeted by his wife and children with embraces of welcome, at the gate of his dooryard, and in view of all the villagers. The natural and kindly fraternization of the Frenchmen with the Indians was also a cause of wonder to the Americans. The friendly intercourse between them and their occasional intermarriages seemed little short of monstrous to the ferocious exclusiveness of the Anglo-Saxon. Footnote. Micolette notices this exclusiveness of the English and inveighs against it in his most lyric style. Crime contre la nature crime contre l'humanité, il sera expéi par la stérilité de l'esprit. End footnote. The Indians in the central part of Illinois cut very little figure in the reminiscences of the pioneers. They occupied much the same relation to them as the tramp to the housewife of today. The Winnebago War in 1827 and the Black Hawk War in 1831 disturbed only the northern portion of the state. A few scattered and vagrant lodges of Potawatomies and Kickapoos were all the pioneers of Sangamon and the neighboring counties ever met. They were spared the heroic struggle of the advance guard of civilization in other states. A woman was sometimes alarmed by a visit from a drunken savage. Poultry and pigs occasionally disappeared when they were in the neighborhood, but life was not darkened by the constant menace of massacre. A few years earlier, indeed, the relations of the two races had been more strained, as may be inferred from an act passed by the territorial legislature in 1814 
offering a reward of fifty dollars to any citizen or ranger who should kill or take any depredating Indian. As only two dollars was paid for killing a wolf, it is easy to see how the pioneers regarded the forest folk in point of relative noxiousness. But ten years later a handful only of the Kickapoos remained in Sangamon County, the specter of the vanished people. A chief named Machina came one day to a family who were clearing a piece of timber, and issued an order of eviction in these words. Too much come white man. T'other side Sangamon. He threw a handful of dried leaves in the air to show how he would scatter the pale faces, but he never fulfilled his threats, further than to come in occasionally and ask for a drink of whiskey. That such trivial details are still related only shows how barren of incident was the life of these obscure founders of a great empire. Any subject of conversation, any cause of sensation, was a godsend. When Vannoy murdered his wife in Springfield, whole families put on their best clothes and drove fifty miles through bottomless mud and swollen rivers to see him hanged. It is curious to see how naturally, in such a state of things, the fabric of political society developed itself from its germ. The county of Sangamon was called by an act of the legislature in 1821 out of a verdant solitude of more than a million acres inhabited by a few families. An election for county commissioners was ordered. Three men were chosen. They came together at the cabin of John Kelly at Spring Creek. He was a roving bachelor from North Carolina, devoted to the chase, who had built his hut three years before on the margin of a green-bordered rivulet, where the deer passed by in hundreds, going in the morning from the shady banks of the Sangamon to feed on the rich green grass of the prairie and returning in the twilight. He was so delighted with this hunter's paradise that he sent for his brothers to join him. They came and brought their friends, so it happened that in this immense county, several thousand square miles in extent, the settlement of John Kelly at Spring Creek was the only place where there was shelter for the commissioners, Thus it became the temporary county seat, duly described in the official report of the commissioners as a certain point in the prairie near John Kelly's field on the waters of Spring Creek, at the stake marked Z and D, the initials of the commissioners, to be the temporary seat of justice for said county, and we do further agree that the said county seat be called and known by the name of Springfield. In this manner the future capital received that hackneyed title when the distinctive and musical name of Sangamon was ready to their hands. The same day they agreed with John Kelly to build them a courthouse, for which they paid him forty-two dollars and fifty cents. In twenty-four days the house was built, one room of rough logs, the jury retiring to any sequestered glade they fancied for their deliberation. They next ordered the building of a jail, which cost just twice as much as the courthouse. Constables and overseers of the poor were appointed, and all the machinery of government prepared for the population which was hourly expected. It was taken for granted that malefactors would come, and the constables have employment, and the poor they would always have with them, when once they began to arrive. This was only a temporary arrangement, but when, a year or two later, the time came to fix upon a permanent seat of justice for the county, the resources of the Spring Creek men were equal to the emergency. When the commissioners came to decide on the relative merits of Springfield, and another site a few miles away, they led them through brake, through briar, by mud knee-deep, and by watercourses so exasperating that the wearied and baffled officials declared they would seek no further, and Springfield became the county seat for all time, and greater destinies were in store for it through means not wholly dissimilar. Nature had made it merely a pleasant hunting ground, the craft and the industry of its first settlers made it a capital. The courts which were held in these log huts were as rude as might be expected, yet there is evidence that although there was no superfluity of law or learning, justice was substantially administered. The lawyers came mostly from Kentucky, though an occasional New Englander confronted and lived down the general prejudice against his region and obtained preferment. The profits of the profession were inconceivably small, 
One early state's attorney describes his first circuit as a tour of shifts and privations not unlike the wanderings of a mendicant friar. In his first county he received a fee of five dollars for prosecuting the parties to a sanguinary affray. In the next he was equally successful, but barely escaped drowning in Spoon River. In the third there were but two families at the county seat, and no cases on the docket. Thence he journeyed across a trackless prairie sixty miles, and at Quincy had one case and gained five dollars. In Pike County our much-enduring jurist took no cash, but found a generous sheriff who entertained him without charge. He was one of nature's noblemen from Massachusetts, writes the grateful prosecutor. The lawyers in what was called good practice earned less than a street sweeper today. It is related that the famous Stephen A. Douglas, once traveled from Springfield to Bloomington, and made an extravagant speech, and having gained his case, received a fee of five dollars. In such a state of things, it was not to be wondered at that the technicalities of law were held in somewhat less veneration than what the pioneer regarded as the essential claims of justice. The infirmities of the jury system gave them less annoyance than they give us. Governor Ford mentions a case where a gang of horse thieves succeeded in placing one of their confederates upon a jury which was to try them, but he was soon brought to reason by his eleven colleagues making preparations to hang him to the rafters of the jury room. The judges were less hampered by the limitations of their legal lore than by their fears of a loss of popularity as a result of too definite charges in civil suits or too great severity in criminal cases they grew very dexterous in avoiding any commitment as to the legal or moral bearings of the questions brought before them they generally refused to sum up or to comment upon evidence when asked by the counsel to give instructions they would say why gentlemen the jury understand this case as well as you or i they will do justice between the parties one famous judge who was afterwards governor when sentencing a murderer impressed it upon his mind and wished him to inform his friends that it was the jury and not the judge who had found him guilty and then asked him on what day he would like to be hanged it is needless to say that the bench and bar were not all of this class there were even at the early day lawyers and not a few who had already won reputation in the older states and whose names are still honored in the profession cook mclean edwards kane thomas reynolds and others the earliest lawyers of the state have hardly been since surpassed for learning and ability in a community where the principal men were lawyers where there was as yet little commerce and industrial enterprise was unknown it was natural that one of the chief interests of life would be the pursuit of politics the young state swarmed with politicians they could be found chewing and whittling at every crossroads inn they were busy at every horse race arranging their plans and extending their acquaintance around the burgoo pot of the hunting party they discussed measures and candidates they even invaded the camp meeting and did not disdain the pulpit as a tribune of course there was no such thing as organization in the pioneer days men were voted for to a great extent independently of partisan questions affecting the nation at large and in this way the higher offices of the state were filled for many years by men whose personal character compelled the respect and esteem of the citizens the year eighteen twenty six is generally taken as the date which witnessed the change from personal to partisan politics though several years more elapsed before the rule of conventions came in which put an end to individual candidacy in that year daniel pope cook who had long represented the state in congress with singular ability and purity was defeated by governor joseph duncan the candidate of the jackson men on account of the vote given by cook which elected john quincy adams to the presidency the bitter intolerance of the jackson party naturally caused their opponents to organize against them and there were two parties in the state from that time forward the change in political methods was inevitable and it is idle to deplore it but the former system gave the better men in the new state a power and prominence which they never have since enjoyed such men as governor ninian edwards who came with the prestige of a distinguished family connection 
a large fortune a good education and a distinction of manners and of dress ruffles gold buttons and fair-topped boots which would hardly have been pardoned a few years later and governor edward coles who had been private secretary to madison and was familiar with the courts of europe a man as notable for his gentleness of manners as for his nobility of nature could never have come so readily and easily to the head of the government after the machine of the caucus had been perfected real ability then imposed itself with more authority upon the ignorant and unpretending politicians from the back timber so that it is remarked by those who study the early statutes of illinois that they are far better drawn up and better edited than those of a later period when illiterate tricksters conscious of the party strength behind them insisted on shaping legislation according to their own fancy the men of cultivation wielded an influence in the legislature entirely out of proportion to their numbers as the ruder sort of pioneers were naturally in a large majority the type of a not uncommon class in illinois tradition was a member from the south who could neither read nor write and whose apparently ironical patronymic was grammar when first elected he had never worn anything except leather but regarding his tattered buckskin as unfit for the garb of a lawgiver he and his sons gathered hazelnuts enough to barter at the nearest store for a few yards of blue strouding such as the indians used for breech clouts when he came home with his purchase and had called together the women of the settlement to make his clothes it was found that there was only material enough for a very short coat and a long pair of leggings and thus attired he went to kaskaskia the territorial capital uncouth as was his appearance he had in him the raw material of a politician he invented a system which was afterwards adopted by many whose breeches were more fashionably cut of voting against every measure which was proposed if it failed the responsibility was broadly shared if it passed and was popular no one would care who voted against it if it passed and did not meet the favor of the people john grammer could vaunt his foresight between the men like coles and the men like grammer there was a wide interval and the average was about what the people of the state deserved and could appreciate a legislator was as likely to suffer for doing right as for doing wrong governor ford in his admirable sketch of the early history of the state mentions two acts of the legislature both of them proper and beneficial as unequalled in their destructive influence upon the great folks of the state one was a bill for a loan to meet the honest obligations of the commonwealth commonly called the wiggins loan and the other was a law to prevent bulls of inferior size and breed from running at large this latter set loose all the winds of popular fury it was cruel it was aristocratic it was the interest of rich men and pampered foreign bulls and it ended the career of many an aspiring politician in a blast of democratic indignation and scorn the politician who relied upon immediate and constant contact with the people certainly earned all the emoluments of office he received his successes were hardly purchased by laborious affability a friend of mine says ford once informed me that he intended to be a candidate for the legislature but would not declare himself until just before the election and assigned as a reason that it was so very hard to be clever for a long time at once before the caucus had eliminated the individual initiative there was much more of personal feeling in elections a vote against a man had something of offense in it and sometimes stirred up a defeated candidate to heroic vengeance in eighteen twenty seven the legislature elected a state treasurer after an exciting contest and before the members had left the house the unsuccessful aspirant came in and soundly thrashed one after the other four of the representatives who had voted against him such energy was sure to meet its reward and he was soon after made clerk of the circuit court it is related by old citizens of menard county as a circumstance greatly to the credit of abraham lincoln that when he was a candidate for the legislature a man who wanted his vote for another place walked to the polls with him and ostentatiously voted for him hoping to receive his vote in return lincoln voted against him and the act was much admired by those who saw it 
one noticeable fact is observed in relation to the politicians of the day their careers were generally brief superannuation came early in the latter part of the last century and the first half of this men were called old whom we would regard as in the prime of life when the friends of washington were first pressing the presidency upon him in seventeen eighty eight he urged his advanced age as an imperative reason for declining it he was fifty-six years old when ninian edwards was a candidate for governor of illinois in eighteen twenty six he was only fifty-one and yet he considered it necessary in his published addresses to refer to the charge that he was too old for the place and while admitting the fact that he was no longer young to urge in extenuation that there are some old things like old whiskey old bacon and old friends which are not without their merits even so late as eighteen forty eight we find a remarkable letter from mr lincoln who was then in congress bearing upon the same point his partner william h herndon had written him a letter complaining that the old men in sangamon county were unwilling to let the young ones have any opportunity to distinguish themselves to this lincoln answered in his usual tone of grave kindness the subject of your letter is exceedingly painful to me and i cannot but think there is some mistake in your impression of the motives of the old men i suppose i am now one of the old men and i declare on my veracity which i think is good with you that nothing could afford me more satisfaction than to learn that you and others of my young friends at home were doing battle in the contest and endearing themselves to the people and taking a stand far above any i have ever been able to reach in their admiration i cannot conceive that other old men feel differently of course i cannot demonstrate what i say but i was young once and i am sure i was never ungenerously thrust back the man who thus consoled petulant youth with the experienced calmness of age was thirty-nine years old a state of society where one could at that age call himself or be called by others an old man is proved by that fact alone to be one of wearing hardships and early decay of the vital powers the survivors of the pioneer stoutly insist upon the contrary view it was a glorious life says one old patriarch men would fight for the love of it and then shake hands and be friends there is nothing like it now another says i never enjoy my breakfast now as i used to when i got up and ran down a deer before i could have anything to eat but they see the past through a rosy mist of memory transfigured by the eternal magic of youth the sober fact is that the life was a hard one with few rational pleasures few wholesome appliances the strong ones lived and some even attained great length of years but to the many age came early and was full of infirmity and pain if we could go back to what our forefathers endured in clearing the western wilderness we could then better appreciate our obligations to them it is detracting from the honor which is their due to say that their lives had much of happiness or comfort or were in any respect preferable to our own end of section three recording by veronica jenkins in ottawa illinois Section 4 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. By John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 4. New Salem during the latter part of the winter of the deep snow lincoln became acquainted with one denton offutt an adventurous and discursive sort of merchant with more irons in the fire than he could well manage he wanted to take a flat boat and cargo to new orleans and having heard that hanks and lincoln had some experience of the river he insisted on their joining him john johnston was afterwards added to the party probably at the request of his foster brother, to share in the golden profits of the enterprise. For fifty cents a day and a contingent dividend of twenty dollars apiece seemed like a promise of immediate opulence to the boys, 
in the spring when the rivers broke up and the melting snow began to pour in torrents down every ravine and gully the three young men paddled down the sangamon in a canoe to the point where jamestown now stands whence they walked five miles to springfield where offutt had given them rendezvous they met him at elliot's tavern and far from happy amid the multiplicity of his engagements he had failed to procure a flatboat and the first work his new hands must do was to build one they cut the timber with frontier innocence from congress land and soon had a serviceable craft afloat with which they descended the current of the sangamon to new salem a little village which seems to have been born for the occasion as it came into existence just before the arrival of lincoln nourished for seven years while he remained one of its citizens and died soon after he went away his introduction to his fellow citizens was effected in a peculiar and somewhat striking manner offutt's boat had come to serious embarrassment on rutledge's mill dam and the unwonted incident brought the entire population to the water's edge they spent a good part of the day watching the hapless flatboat resting midships on the dam the forward end in the air and the stern taking in the turbid sangamon water nobody knew what to do with the disaster except the bow oar who was described as a gigantic youth with his trousers rolled up some five feet who was wading about the boat and rigging up some undescribed contrivance by which the cargo was unloaded the boat tilted and the water let out by boring a hole through the bottom and everything brought safely to moorings below the dam this exploit gained for young lincoln the enthusiastic admiration of his employer and turned his own mind in the direction of an invention which he afterwards patented for lifting vessels over shoals the model on which he obtained this patent a little boat whittled by his own hand in eighteen forty nine after he had become prominent as a lawyer and politician is still shown to visitors at the department of the interior we have never learned that it has served any other purpose they made a quick trip down the sangamon the illinois and the mississippi rivers although it was but a repetition in great part of the trip young lincoln had made with gentry it evidently created a far deeper impression on his mind than the former one the simple and honest words of john hanks leave no doubt of this at new orleans he said they saw for the first time negroes chained maltreated whipped and scourged lincoln saw it his heart bled said nothing much was silent looked bad i can say knowing it that it was on this trip that he formed his opinion of slavery it run its iron in him then and there may eighteen thirty one i have heard him say so often the sight of men in chains was intolerable to him ten years after this he made another journey by water with his friend joshua speed of kentucky writing to speed about it after the lapse of fourteen years he says in eighteen forty one you and i had together a tedious low-water trip on a steamboat from louisville to st louis you may remember as i well do that from louisville to the mouth of the ohio there were on board ten or a dozen slaves shackled together with irons that sight was a continual torment to me and i see something like it every time i touch the ohio or any other slave border it is not fair for you to assume that i have no interest in a thing which has and continually exercises the power of making me miserable there have been several ingenious attempts to show the origin and occasion of mr lincoln's anti-slavery convictions they seem to us an idle waste of labor these sentiments came with the first awakening of his mind and conscience and were roused into active life and energy by the sight of fellow creatures in chains on an ohio river steamboat and on the wharf at new orleans the party went up the river in the early summer and separated in st louis abraham walked in company with john johnston from st louis to coles county and spent a few weeks there with his father who had made another migration the year before 
His final move was to Goose Nest Prairie, where he died in 1851. Footnote. His grave, a mile and a half west of the town of Farmington, Illinois, is surmounted by an appropriate monument erected by his grandson, the Honorable Robert T. Lincoln. End footnote. At the age of seventy-three years, after a life which, though not successful in any material or worldly point of view, was probably far happier than that of his illustrious son, being unvexed by enterprise or ambition. Abraham never lost sight of his parents. He continued to aid and befriend them in every way, even when he could ill afford it, and when his benefactions were imprudently used. He not only comforted their declining years with every aid his affection could suggest, but he did everything in his power to assist his stepbrother, Johnston, a hopeless task enough. The following rigidly truthful and yet kindly letters will show how mentor-like and masterful, as well as generous, were the relations that Mr. Lincoln held to these friends and companions of his childhood. Dear Johnston, your request for eighty dollars I do not think it best to comply with now. At the various times when I have helped you a little, you have said to me, We can get along very well now. But in a very short time I find you in the same difficulty again. Now this can only happen by some defect in your conduct. What that defect is, I think I know. You are not lazy, and still you are an idler. I doubt whether, since I saw you, you have done a good whole day's work in any one day. You do not very much dislike to work, and still you do not work much, merely because it does not seem to you that you could get much for it. This habit of uselessly wasting time is the whole difficulty and it is vastly important to you, and still more so to your children, that you should break the habit. It is more important to them because they have longer to live, and can keep out of an idle habit before they are in it easier than they can get out after they are in. You are now in need of some money, and what I propose is that you shall go to work tooth and nail for somebody who will give you money for it. Let father and your boys take charge of things at home, prepare for a crop, and make the crop, and you go to work for the best money wages, or in discharge of any debt you owe, that you can get. And to secure you a fair reward for your labor, I now promise you that for every dollar you will, between this and the first of next May, get for your own labor, either in money or as discharging your own indebtedness, I will then give you one other dollar. By this, if you hire yourself at ten dollars a month, from me you will get ten more, making twenty dollars a month for your work. In this I do not mean you should go off to St. Louis, or the lead mines, or the gold mines in California, but I mean for you to go at it for the best wages you can get close to home, in Coles County. Now, if you will do this, you will soon be out of debt, and what is better, you will have a habit that will keep you from getting in debt again. But if I should now clear you out of debt, next year you would be just as deep in as ever. You say you would almost give your place in heaven for seventy or eighty dollars. Then you value your place in heaven very cheap, for I am sure you can, with the offer I make, get the seventy or eighty dollars for four or five months' work. You say if I will furnish you the money, you will deed me the land, and if you don't pay the money back, you will deliver possession. Nonsense! If you can't now live with the land, how will you then live without it? You have always been kind to me, and I do not mean to be unkind to you. On the contrary, if you will but follow my advice, you will find it worth more than eighty times eighty dollars to you. Here is a later epistle, still more graphic and terse in statement, which has the unusual merit of painting both confessor and penitent to the life. Shelbyville, November 4, 1851 Dear Brother, When I came into Charleston, day before yesterday, I learned that you were anxious to sell the land where you live and move to Missouri. I have been thinking of this ever since, and cannot but think such a notion is utterly foolish. What can you do in Missouri better than here? Is the land any richer? Can you there, any more than here, raise corn and wheat and oats without work? 
Will anybody there, any more than here, do your work for you? If you intend to go to work, there is no better place than right where you are. If you do not intend to go to work, you cannot get along anywhere. Squirming and crawling about from place to place can do no good. You have raised no crop this year, and what you really want is to sell the land, get the money, and spend it. Part with the land you have, and my life upon it you will never after own a spot big enough to bury you in. Half you will get for the land you will spend in moving to Missouri, and the other half you will eat and drink and wear out, and no foot of land will be bought. Now I feel it is my duty to have no hand in such a piece of foolery. I feel that it is so even on your own account, and particularly on mother's account. The eastern forty acres I intend to keep for mother while she lives. If you will not cultivate it, it will rent for enough to support her. At least it will rent for something. Her dower in the other two forties she can let you have, and no thanks to me. Now do not misunderstand this letter. I do not write it in any unkindness. I write it in order, if possible, to get you to face the truth, which truth is, you are destitute because you have idled away all your time. Your thousand pretenses deceive nobody but yourself. Go to work is the only cure for your case. A volume of disquisition could not put more clearly before the reader the difference between Abraham Lincoln and the common run of southern and western rural laborers. He had the same disadvantages that they had. He grew up in the midst of poverty and ignorance. He was poisoned with the enervating malaria of the western woods, as all his fellows were, and the consequences of it were seen in his character and conduct to the close of his life. But he had, what very few of them possessed any glimmering notion of, a fixed and inflexible will to succeed. He did not love work, probably any better than John Johnston, but he had an innate self-respect and a consciousness that his self was worthy of respect that kept him from idleness as it kept him from all other vices, and made him a better man every year that he lived. We have anticipated a score of years in speaking of Mr. Lincoln's relations to his family, it was in August of the year 1831 that he finally left his father's roof, and swung out for himself into the current of the world to make his fortune in his own way. He went down to New Salem again to assist Offutt, in the business that lively speculator thought of establishing there. He was more punctual than either his employer or the merchandise, and met with the usual reward of punctuality in being forced to waste his time in waiting for the tardy ones. He seemed to the New Salem people to be loafing. Several of them have given that description of him. He did one day's work acting as clerk of a local election, a lettered loafer being pretty sure of employment on such an occasion. Footnote. Mrs. Lizzie H. Bell writes of this incident. My father, Menton Graham, was on that day as usual appointed to be a clerk, and Mr. McNamee, who was to be the other, was sick and failed to come. They were looking around for a man to fill his place when my father noticed Mr. Lincoln and asked if he could write. He answered that he could make a few rabbit tracks. End footnote. He also piloted a boat down the Sangamon for one Dr. Nelson, who had had enough of New Salem and wanted to go to Texas. This was probably a task not requiring much pilot craft, as the river was much swollen, and navigators had in most places two or three miles of channel to count upon. But Offutt and his goods arrived at last, and Lincoln and he got them immediately into position, and opened their doors to what commerce could be found in New Salem. There was clearly not enough to satisfy the volatile mind of Mr. Offutt, for he soon bought Cameron's mill at the historic dam and made Abraham superintendent also of that branch of the business. It is to be surmised that Offutt never inspired his neighbors and customers with any deep regard for his solidity of character. One of them says of him, with injurious pleonism, that he talked too much with his mouth. A natural consequence of his excessive fluency was soon to be made disagreeably evident to his clerk. He admired Abraham beyond measure, and praised him beyond prudence. 
he said that abe knew more than any man in the united states and he was certainly not warranted in making such an assertion as his own knowledge of the actual state of science in america could not have been exhaustive he also said that abe could beat any man in the county running jumping or wrestling this proposition being less abstract in its nature was more readily grasped by the local mind and was not likely to pass unchallenged public opinion at new salem was formed by a crowd of ruffianly young fellows who were called the clary's grove boys once or twice a week they descended upon the village and passed the day in drinking fighting and brutal horseplay if a stranger appeared in the place he was likely to suffer a rude initiation into the social life of new salem at the hands of these jovial savages sometimes he was nailed up in a hogshead and rolled down hill sometimes he was insulted into a fight and then mauled black and blue for despite their pretensions to chivalry they had no scruples about fair play or any such superstitions of civilization at first they did not seem inclined to molest young lincoln his appearance did not invite insolence his reputation for strength and activity was a greater protection to him than his inoffensive good nature but the loud admiration of offutt gave them umbrage it led to dispute contradictions and finally to a formal banter to a wrestling match lincoln was greatly averse to all this wooling and pulling as he called it but Offutt's indiscretion had made it necessary for him to show his mettle. Jack Armstrong, the leading bully of the gang, was selected to throw him, and expected an easy victory. But he soon found himself in different hands from any he had heretofore engaged with. Seeing he could not manage the tall stranger, his friends swarmed in, and by kicking and tripping nearly succeeded in getting Lincoln down at this as has been said of another hero the spirit of odin entered into him and putting forth his whole strength he held the pride of clary's grove in his arms like a child and almost choked the exuberant life out of him for a moment a general fight seemed inevitable but lincoln standing undismayed with his back to the wall looked so formidable in his defiance that an honest admiration took the place of momentary fury and his initiation was over. As to Armstrong, he was Lincoln's friend and sworn brother as soon as he recovered the use of his larynx, and the bond thus strangely created lasted through life. Lincoln had no further occasion to fight his own battles, while Armstrong was there to act as his champion. The two friends, although so widely different, were helpful to each other afterwards in many ways and Lincoln made ample amends for the liberty his hands had taken with Jack's throat, by saving, in a memorable trial, his son's neck from the halter. This incident, trivial and vulgar as it may seem, was of great importance in Lincoln's life. His behavior in this ignoble scuffle did the work of years for him, in giving him the position he required in the community where his lot was cast. He became from that moment, in a certain sense, a personage, with a name and standing of his own. The verdict of Clary's Grove was unanimous that he was the cleverest fellow that had ever broke into the settlement. He did not have to be constantly scuffling to guard his self-respect, and at the same time he gained the goodwill of the better sort by his evident peaceableness and integrity. He made, on the whole, a satisfactory clerk for Mr. Offutt, though his downright honesty must have seemed occasionally as eccentric in that position as afterwards it did to his associates at the bar. Dr. Holland has preserved one or two incidents of this kind, which have their value. Once, after he had sold a woman a little bill of goods and received the money, he found on looking over the account again that she had given him six and a quarter cents too much. The money burned in his hands until he locked the shop and started on a walk of several miles in the night to make restitution before he slept. On another occasion, after weighing and delivering a pound of tea, he found a small weight on the scales. He immediately weighed out the quantity of tea of which he had innocently defrauded his customer and went in search of her, his sensitive conscience not permitting any delay. To show that the young merchant was not too good for this world, 
the same writer gives an incident of his shopkeeping experience of a different character a rural bully having made himself especially offensive one day when women were present by loud profanity lincoln requested him to be silent this was of course a cause of war and the young clerk was forced to follow the incensed ruffian into the street where the combat was of short duration lincoln threw him at once to the ground and gathering a handful of the dog fennel with which the roadside was plentifully bordered he rubbed the ruffian's face and eyes with it until he howled for mercy he did not howl in vain for the placable giant when his discipline was finished brought water to bathe the culprit's smarting face and doubtless improved the occasion with quaint admonition a few passages at arms of this sort gave abraham a redoubtable reputation in the neighborhood but the principal use he made of his strength and his prestige was in the capacity of peacemaker an office which soon devolved upon him by general consent whenever old feuds blossomed into fights by offit's door or the chivalry of clary's grove attempted in its energetic way to take the conceit out of some stranger or a canine duel spread contagion of battle among the masters of the beasts lincoln usually appeared upon the scene and with a judicious mixture of force and reason and invincible good nature restored peace while working with offutt his mind was turned in the direction of english grammar from what he had heard of it he thought it a matter within his grasp if he could once fall in with the requisite machinery consulting with minton footnote this name has always been written in illinois minter but a letter from mr graham's daughter mrs bell says that her father's name is as given in the text End footnote. graham the schoolmaster in regard to it in learning the whereabouts of a vagrant kirkham's grammar he set off at once and soon returned from a walk of a dozen miles with the coveted prize he devoted himself to the new study with that peculiar intensity of application which always remained his most valuable faculty and soon knew all that can be known about it from rules he seemed surprised as others have been at the meagre dimensions of the science he had acquired and the ease with which it yielded all there was of it to the student but it seemed no slight achievement to the new salemites and contributed not a little to the prevalent impression of his learning his name is prominently connected with an event which just at this time caused an excitement and interest in salem and the neighboring towns entirely out of proportion to its importance it was one of the articles of faith of most of the settlers on the banks of the sangamon river that it was a navigable stream and the local politicians found that they could in no way more easily hit the fancy of their hearers than by discussing this assumed fact and the logical corollary derived from it that it was the duty of the state or the nation to clear out the snags and give free course to the commerce which was waiting for an opportunity to pour along this natural highway at last one captain vincent bogue of springfield determined to show that the thing could be done by doing it the first promise of the great enterprise appears in the sangsmo journal of january twenty sixth eighteen thirty two in a letter from the captain at cincinnati saying he would ascend the sangamon by steam on the breaking up of the ice he asked that he might be met at the mouth of the river by ten or twelve men having axes with long handles to cut away the overhanging branches of the trees on the banks from this moment there was great excitement public meetings appointment of committees appeals for subscriptions and a scattering fire of advertisements of goods and freight to be bargained for which sustained the prevailing interest it was a day of hope and promise when the advertisement reached springfield from cincinnati that the splendid upper cabin steamer talisman would positively start for the sangamon on a given day as the paper containing this joyous intelligence also complained that no mail had reached springfield from the east for three weeks it is easy to understand the desire for more rapid and regular communications from week to week the progress of the talisman impeded by bad weather and floating ice was faithfully recorded until at last the party with long-handled axes went down to beardstown to welcome her 
it is needless to state that lincoln was one of the party his standing as a scientific citizen of new salem would have been enough to ensure his selection even if he had not been known as a bold navigator he piloted the talisman safely through the windings of the sangamon and springfield gave itself up to extravagant gaiety on the event that proved she could no longer be considered an inland town captain bogue announced fresh and seasonable goods just received per steamboat talisman and the local poets illuminated the columns of the journal with odes on her advent the joy was short-lived the talisman met the natural fate of steamboats a few months later being burned at the st louis wharf neither state nor nation has ever removed the snags from the sangamon and no subsequent navigator of its waters has been found to eclipse the fame of the earliest one end of section four recording by pamela Krantz. section five of abraham lincoln a history volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 5. Lincoln in the Black Hawk War. Side note, 1832. A new period in the life of Lincoln begins with the summer of 1832, he then obtained his first public recognition and entered upon the course of life which was to lead him to a position of prominence and great usefulness the business of offutt had gone to pieces and his clerk was out of employment when governor reynolds issued his call for volunteers to move the tribe of black hawk across the mississippi for several years the raids of the old sac chieftain upon that portion of his patrimony which he had ceded to the united states had kept the settlers in the neighborhood of rock island in terror and menaced the peace of the frontier in the spring of eighteen thirty one he came over to the east side of the river with a considerable band of warriors having been encouraged by secret promises of cooperation from several other tribes these failed him however when the time of trial arrived and an improvised force of state volunteers assisted by general e p gaines and his detachment had little difficulty in compelling the indians to recross the mississippi and to enter into a solemn treaty on the thirtieth of june by which the former treaties were ratified and black hawk and his leading warriors bound themselves never again to set foot on the east side of the river without express permission from the president or the governor of illinois side note reynolds life and times page three twenty five side note history of illinois page one ten but black hawk was too old a savage to learn respect for treaties or resignation under fancied wrongs he was all at a term of life chief of his nation for more than forty years he had scalped his first enemy when scarcely more than a child having painted on his blanket the blood-red hand which marked his nobility at fifteen years of age peace under any circumstances would doubtless have been irksome to him but a peace which forbade him free access to his own hunting grounds and to the graves of his fathers was more than he could now school himself to endure he had come to believe that he had been foully wronged by the treaty which was his own act he had even convinced himself that land cannot be sold a proposition in political economy which our modern socialists would be puzzled to accept or confute besides this the tenderest feelings of his heart were outraged by this exclusion from his former domain he had never passed a year since the death of his daughter without making a pilgrimage to her grave at Okwaka and spending hours in mystic ceremonies and contemplation. He was himself prophet as well as warrior, and had doubtless his share of mania, which is the strength of prophets. The promptings of his own broken heart readily seemed to him the whisperings of attendant spirits, and day by day these unseen incitements increased around him until he could not be resisted even if death stood in the way 
He made his combinations during the winter, and had it not been for the loyal attitude of Keokuk, he could have brought the entire nation of the Sacks and Foxes to the warpath. As it was, the flower of the young men came with him, when, with the opening spring, he crossed the river once more. He came this time, he said, to plant corn, but as a preliminary to this peaceful occupation of the land, he marched up the Rock River, expecting to be joined by the Winnebagoes and Potawatomies. But the time was past for honorable alliances among the Indians. His oath-bound confederates gave him little assistance, and soon cast in their lot with the stronger party. This movement excited general alarm in the state. General Henry Atkinson, commanding the United States troops, sent a formal summons to Black Hawk to return. But the old chief was already well on his way to the lodge of his friend, the prophet Wabakishik, at Prophetstown, and treated the summons with contemptuous defiance. The governor immediately called for volunteers, and was himself astonished at the alacrity with which the call was answered. Among those who enlisted at the first tap of the drum was Abraham Lincoln, and equally to his surprise and delight he was elected captain of his company. The volunteer organizations of those days were conducted on purely democratic principles. The company assembled on the green, an election was suggested, and three-fourths of the men walked over to where Lincoln was standing. Most of the small remainder joined themselves to one Kirkpatrick, a man of some substance and standing from Spring Creek. We have the word of Mr. Lincoln for that no subsequent success ever gave him such unmixed pleasure as this earliest distinction. It was a sincere, unsought tribute of his equals to those physical and moral qualities which made him the best man of his hundred and as such was accepted and prized. Side note, Reynolds, Life and Times, page 363. At the Beardstown Rendezvous, Captain Lincoln's company was attached to Colonel Samuel Thompson's regiment, the 4th Illinois, which was organized at Richland, Sangamon County, on the 21st of April, and moved on the 27th with the rest of the command under General Samuel Whitesides for Yellow Banks where the boats with provisions had been ordered to meet them. It was arduous marching. There were no roads and no bridges, and the day's task included a great deal of labor. The third day out they came to the Henderson River, a stream some fifty yards wide, swift and swollen with the spring thaws, with high and steep banks. To most armies this would have seemed a serious obstacle, but these backwoodsmen swarmed to the work like beavers, and in less than three hours the river was crossed with the loss of only one or two horses and wagons. When they came to Yellow Banks on the Mississippi, the provision boats had not arrived, and for three days they waited there literally without food. Very uncomfortable days for Governor Reynolds, who accompanied the expedition, and was forced to hear the outspoken comments of two thousand hungry men on his supposed inefficiency. But the 6th of May the William Wallace arrived, and this sight, says the governor with characteristic sincerity, was, I presume, the most interesting I ever beheld. From there they marched to the mouth of Rock River, and thence General Whitesides proceeded with his volunteers up the river some ninety miles to Dixon, where they halted to await the arrival of General Atkinson with the regular troops and provisions. There they found two battalions of fresh horsemen under Majors Stillman and Bailey, who had as yet seen no service, and were eager for the fray. Whiteside's men were tired with their forced march, and besides, in their ardor to get forward, they had thrown away a good part of their provisions and left their baggage behind. It pleased the governor, therefore, to listen to the prayers of Stillman's braves, and he gave them orders to proceed to the head of Old Man's Creek where it was supposed there were some hostile Indians, and coerced them into submission. I thought, says the governor in his memoirs, they might discover the enemy. The supposition was certainly well founded. They rode merrily away, came to Old Man's Creek, thereafter to be called Stillman's Run, and encamped for the night. By the failing light a small party of Indians was discovered on the summit of a hill a mile away, and a few courageous gentlemen hurriedly saddled their horses, and without orders rode after them. 
the indians retreated but were soon overtaken and two or three of them killed the volunteers were now strung along a half mile of hill and valley with no more order or care than if they had been chasing rabbits black hawk who had been at supper when the running fight began hastily gathered a handful of warriors and attacked the scattered whites the onset of the savages acted like an icy bath on the red-hot valor of the volunteers they turned and ran for their lives stampeding the camp as they fled there was very little resistance so little that black hawk fearing a ruse tried to recall his warriors from the pursuit but in the darkness and confusion could not enforce his orders the indians killed all they caught up with but the volunteers had the fleeter horses and only eleven were overtaken the rest reached dixon by twos and threes rested all night and took courage general whitesides marched out to the scene of the disaster the next morning but the indians were gone they had broken up into small parties and for several days they reaped the bloody fruit of their victory in the massacre of peaceful settlements in the adjacent districts the time of enlistment of the volunteers had now come to an end and the men seeing no prospect of glory or profit and weary of the work and the hunger which were the only certain incidents of the campaign refused in great part to continue in service but it is hardly necessary to say that captain lincoln was not one of these homesick soldiers not even the trammels of rank which are usually so strong among the trailers of the sabre could restrain him from what he considered his simple duty as soon as he was mustered out of his captaincy he re-enlisted on the same day may twenty seven as a private soldier several other officers did the same among them general whitesides and major john t stewart lincoln became a member of captain elijah isles company of mounted volunteers sometimes called the independent spy battalion an organization unique of its kind if we may judge from the account given by one of its troopers it was not says mr george m harrison under the control of any regiment or brigade but received orders directly from the commander-in-chief and always when with the army camped within the lines and had many other privileges such as having no camp duties to perform and drawing rations as much and as often as we pleased which would seem to liken this battalion as nearly as possible to the fabled regiment of brigadiers with this elite corps lincoln served through his second enlistment though it was not his fortune to take part in either of the two engagements in which general james d henry at the wisconsin bluffs and the bad axe broke and destroyed forever the power of black hawk and the british band of sacks and foxes after lincoln was relieved of the weight of dignity involved in his captaincy the war became a sort of holiday and the tall private from new salem enjoyed it as much as any one he entered with great zest into the athletic sports with which soldiers loved to beguile the tedium of camp he was admitted to be the strongest man in the army and with one exception the best wrestler indeed his friends never admitted the exception and severely blamed lincoln for confessing himself defeated on the occasion when he met the redoubtable thompson and the two fell together on the turf his popularity increased from the beginning to the end of the campaign and those of his comrades who still survive always speak with hearty and affectionate praise of his character and conduct in those rough yet pleasantly remembered days side note manuscript letters from thomas greg and others the spy battalion formed no part of general henry's forces when by a disobedience of orders as prudent as it was audacious he started with his slender force on the fresh trail which he was sure would lead him to black hawk's camp he found and struck the enemy at bay on the bluffs of the wisconsin river on the twenty first of july and inflicted upon them a signal defeat the broken remnant of black hawk's power then fled for the mississippi river the whole army following in close pursuit general atkinson in front and general henry bringing up the rear fortune favored the latter once more for while black hawk with a handful of men was engaging and drawing away the force under atkinson general henry struck the main trail and brought on the battle of the bad axe 
if that could be called a battle which was an easy slaughter of the weary and discouraged savages fighting without heart or hope an army in front and the great river behind black hawk escaped the fate of his followers to be captured a few days later through the treachery of his allies he was carried in triumph to washington and presented to president jackson to whom he made this stern and defiant speech showing how little age or disaster could do to tame his indomitable spirit i am a man and you are another i did not expect to conquer the white people i took up the hatchet to avenge injuries which could no longer be borne footnote it is a noteworthy coincidence that president lincoln's proclamation at the opening of the war calls for troops to redress wrongs already long enough endured End footnote. had i borne them longer my people would have said black hawk is a squaw he is too old to be a chief he is no sack this caused me to raise the war whoop i say no more of it all is known to you he returned to Iowa and died on the 3rd of October, 1838, at his camp on the River Des Moines. He was buried in gala dress, with cocked hat and sword, and the medals presented him by two governments. He was not allowed to rest even in his grave. His bones were exhumed by some greedy wretch, and sold from hand to hand, till they came at last to the Burlington Museum, where they were destroyed by fire it was on the sixteenth of june a month before the slaughter of the bad axe that the battalion to which lincoln belonged was at last mustered out at whitewater wisconsin his final release from the service was signed by a young lieutenant of artillery robert anderson who twenty-nine years later in one of the most awful crises in our annals was to sustain to lincoln relations of prodigious importance on a scene illuminated by the flash of the opening guns of the Civil War. Footnote. A story to the effect that Lincoln was mustered into service by Jefferson Davis has for a long time been current, but the strictest search in the records fails to confirm it. We are indebted to General R. C. Drum, Adjutant General of the Army, for an interesting letter giving all the known facts in relation to this story. General Drum says, the company of the fourth regiment illinois mounted volunteers commanded by mr lincoln was with others called out by general reynolds and was organized at richland sangamon county illinois april twenty one eighteen thirty two the muster in roll is not on file but the records show that the company was mustered out at the mouth of fox river may twenty seventh eighteen thirty two by nathaniel buckmaster brigade major to general samuel whiteside's illinois volunteers on the muster roll of captain elijah isles company illinois mounted volunteers a lincoln sangamon county appears as a private from may twenty seventh eighteen thirty two to june sixteenth eighteen thirty two when the company was mustered out of service by lieutenant robert anderson third united states artillery and colonel assistant inspector general illinois volunteers brigadier general henry atkinson in his report of may thirty eighteen thirty two stated that the illinois volunteers were called out by the governor of that state but in haste and for no definite period of service on their arrival at ottawa they became clamorous for their discharge which the governor granted retaining of those who were discharged and volunteered for a further period of twenty days a sufficient number of men to form six companies which general atkinson found at ottawa on his arrival there from rock river general atkinson further reports that these companies and some three hundred regular troops remaining in position at rock river were all the force left him to keep the enemy in check until the assemblage of the three thousand additional illinois militia called out by the governor upon his general a's requisition to rendezvous at ottawa june twelfth through fifteenth eighteen thirty two there can be no doubt that captain isles company mentioned above was one of the six which served until june sixteenth eighteen thirty two while the fact is fully established that the company of which mr lincoln was a member was mustered out by lieutenant robert anderson who in april eighteen sixty one was in command of fort sumter there is no evidence to show that it was mustered in by lieutenant jefferson davis mr davis's company 
B, 1st United States Infantry, was stationed at Fort Crawford, Wisconsin, during the months of January and February, 1832, and he is borne on the rolls as absent on detached service at the Dubuque Mines by order of Colonel Morgan. From March 26 to August 18, 1832, the muster rolls of his company report him as absent on furlough. End footnote. The men started home the next day in high spirits, schoolboys for their holidays. Lincoln had need, like Horatio, of his good spirits, for they were his only outfit for the long journey to New Salem. He and his messmate, Harrison, footnote, George M. Harrison, who gives an account of his personal experiences in Le Mans, page 116, end footnote, having had their horses stolen the day before by some patriot over-anxious to reach home. But as Harrison says, I laughed at our fate, and he joked at it, and we all started off merrily. The generous men of our company walked and rode by turns with us, and we fared about equal with the rest. But for this generosity our legs would have had to do the better work, for in that day this dreary route furnished no horses to buy or to steal, and whether on horse or afoot we always had company, for many of the horses' backs were too sore for riding. It is not hard to imagine with what quips and quirks of native fancy Lincoln and his friends beguiled the way through forest and prairie. With youth, good health, and a clear conscience, and even then the dawn of a young and undefiled ambition in his heart, nothing was wanting to give zest and spice to this long, sociable walk of a hundred leagues. One joke is preserved, and this one is at the expense of Lincoln. One chilly morning he complained of being cold. "'No wonder,' said some facetious cavalier, "'there is so much of you on the ground.'" Footnote. Dr. Holland gives this homely joke, Life of Lincoln, page 71, but transfers it to a time four years later when Lincoln had permanently assumed shoes and had a horse of his own. End footnote. We hope Lincoln's contributions to the fun were better than this, but of course the prosperity of these jests lay rather in the liberal ears that heard them than in the good-natured tongues that uttered them. Lincoln and Harrison could not have been altogether penniless, for at Peoria they bought a canoe and paddled down to Pekin. Here the ingenious Lincoln employed his hereditary talent for carpentry by making an oar for the frail vessel while Harrison was providing the commissary stores. The latter goes on to say, The river, being very low, was without current, so that we had to pull hard to make half the speed of legs on land. In fact, we let her float all night, and on the next morning always found the objects still visible that were beside us the previous evening. The water was remarkably clear for this river of plants, and the fish appeared to be sporting with us as we moved over or neared them. On the next day, after we left Pekin, we overhauled a raft of saw logs, with two men afloat on it to urge it on with poles, and to guide it in the channel. We immediately pulled up to them and went on the raft, where we were made welcome by various demonstrations, especially by an invitation to a feast on fish, cornbread, eggs, butter, and coffee, just prepared for our benefit. Of these good things we ate almost immoderately, for it was the only warm meal we had made for several days. While preparing it, and after dinner, Lincoln entertained them, and they entertained us for a couple of hours very amusingly. Kindly human companionship was a luxury in that green wilderness, and was readily appreciated and paid for. The returning warriors dropped down the river to the village of Havana, from Pekin to Havana in a canoe. The country is full of these geographical nightmares, the necessary result of freedom of nomenclature bestowed by circumstances upon minds equally destitute of taste or education. There they sold their boat, no difficult task, for a canoe was a staple article in any river town, and again set out the old way over the sand ridges for Petersburg. As we drew near home the impulse became stronger and urged us on amazingly. The long strides of Lincoln, often slipping back in the loose sand, six inches every step, were just right for me, and he was greatly diverted when he noticed me behind him, stepping along in his tracks to keep from slipping. Thus the two comrades came back from their soldierings to their humble homes, from which Lincoln was soon to start on the way marked out for him by Providence 
with strides which no comrade, with whatever good will, might hope to follow. He never took his campaigning seriously. The politician's habit of glorifying the petty incidents of a candidate's life always seemed absurd to him, and in his speech, made in 1848, ridiculing the effort on the part of General Cass's friends to draw some political advantage from that gentleman's respectable but obscure services on the frontier in the war with Great Britain, he stopped any future eulogist from painting his own military achievements in two lively colors. "'Did you know, Mr. Speaker,' he said, "'I am a military hero. "'In the days of the Black Hawk War I fought, bled, and came away. "'I was not at Stillman's defeat, "'but I was about as near it as General Cass was to Hull's surrender. "'And like him I saw the place very soon afterwards. "'It is quite certain I did not break my sword, "'for I had none to break. "'But I bent my musket pretty badly on one occasion.' if general cass went in advance of me picking whortleberries i guess i surpassed him in charges on the wild onions if he saw any live fighting indians it was more than i did but i had a good many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes and although i never fainted from loss of blood i can truly say i was often very hungry if ever i should conclude to doff whatever our democratic friends may suppose there is of black cockade federalism about me and thereupon they shall take me up as their candidate for the presidency i protest that they shall not make fun of me as they have of general cass by attempting to write me into a military hero end of section five recording by pamela Krantz. section six of abraham lincoln a history volume one this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen L. Moss Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 6. Surveyor and Representative the discharged volunteer arrived in New Salem only ten days before the August election, in which he had a deep personal interest. Before starting for the wars he had announced himself, according to the custom of the time, by a handbill circular, as a candidate for the legislature from Sangamon County. Footnote. We are aware that all former biographers have stated that Lincoln's candidacy for the legislature was subsequent to his return from the war, and a consequence of his service, but his circular is dated March 9, 1832, and the Sangamo Journal mentions his name among the candidates in July, and apologizes for having accidentally omitted it in May. End footnote. He had done this in accordance with his own natural bent for public life and desire for usefulness and distinction, and not without strong encouragement from friends whose opinion he valued. He had even then considerable experience in speaking and thinking on his feet. He had begun his practice in that direction before leaving Indiana, and continued it everywhere he had gone. Mr. William Butler tells us that on one occasion, when Lincoln was a farmhand at Island Grove, the famous circuit rider, Peter Cartwright, came by, electioneering for the legislature, and Lincoln at once engaged in a discussion with him in the cornfield, in which the great Methodist was equally astonished at the close reasoning and the uncouth figure of Mr. Brown's extraordinary hired man. At another time, after one Posey, a politician in search of office, had made a speech in Macon, John Hanks, whose admiration of his cousin's oratory was unbounded, said that Abe could beat it. He turned a keg on end, and the tall boy mounted it and made his speech. The subject was the navigation of the Sangamon, and Abe beat him to death, says the loyal Hanks so it was not without the tremor of a complete novice that the young man took the stump during the few days left him between his return and the election. He ran as a Whig. As this has been denied on authority which is generally trustworthy, it is well enough to insist upon the fact. 
we have a memorandum in Mr. Lincoln's own handwriting in which he says he ran as an avowed clay man. In one of the few speeches of his, which made at this time, have been remembered and reported, he said, I am in favor of a national bank. I am in favor of the internal improvement system and of a high protective tariff. These are my sentiments and political principles. Nothing could be more unqualified or outspoken than this announcement of his adhesion to what was then and for years afterwards called the American system of Henry Clay. Other testimony is not wanting to the same effect. Both Major Stewart and Judge Logan, footnote, the Democrats of New Salem worked for Lincoln out of their personal regard for him. That was the general understanding of the matter here at the time. In this he made no concession of principle whatever. He was as stiff as a man could be in his Whig doctrines. They did this for him simply because he was popular, because he was Lincoln. Stephen T. Logan, July 6, 1875, and footnote say that Lincoln ran in 1832 as a Whig, and that his speeches were unevasively in defense of the principles of that party. Without discussing the merits of the party or its purposes, we may insist that his adopting them thus openly at the outset of his career was an extremely characteristic act, and marks thus early the scrupulous conscientiousness which shaped every action of his life. The state of Illinois was by a large majority democratic, hopelessly attached to the person and policy of Jackson. Nowhere had that despotic leader more violent and unscrupulous partisans than there. They were proud of their very servility, and preferred the name of Whole Hog Jackson Men to that of Democrats. The Whigs embraced in their scanty ranks the leading men of the state, those who have since been most distinguished in its history, such as S. T. Logan, Stuart, Browning, Dubois, Hardin, Brees, and many others. But they were utterly unable to do anything except by dividing the Jackson men, whose very numbers made their party unwieldy, and by throwing their votes with the more decent and conservative portion of them. In this way, in the late election, they had secured the success of Governor Reynolds, the old ranger, against Governor Kinney, who represented the vehement and proscriptive spirit which Jackson had just breathed into the party. He had visited the general in Washington, and had come back giving out threatenings and slaughter against the Whigs in the true Tennessee style, declaring that all Whigs should be whipped out of office like dogs out of a meat house. The force of southwestern simile could no further go. But the great popularity of Reynolds and the adroit management of the Whigs carried him through successfully. A single fact will show on which side the people who could read were enlisted. The whole hog party had one newspaper, the opposition five. Of course it would have been impossible for Reynolds to poll a respectable vote if his loyalty to Jackson had been seriously doubted. As it was, he lost many votes through a report that he had been guilty of saying that he was as strong for Jackson as any reasonable man should be. The governor himself, in his naive account of the canvass, acknowledges the damaging nature of this accusation, and comforts himself with quoting an indiscretion of Kinney's, who opposed a projected canal on the ground that it would flood the country with Yankees. It showed some moral courage, and certainly an absence of the shuffling politician's fair-weather policy, that Lincoln, in his obscure and penniless youth, at the very beginning of his career, when he was not embarrassed by antecedents or family connections, and when, in fact, what little social influence he knew would have led him the other way, chose to oppose a furiously intolerant majority, and to take his stand with the party which was doomed to long-continued defeat in Illinois. The motives which led him to take this decisive course are not difficult to imagine. The better sort of people in Sangamon County were Whigs, though the majority were Democrats, and he preferred, through life, the better sort to the majority. The papers he read were the Louisville Journal and the Sangamo Journal, both Whig. Reading the speeches and debates of the day, he sided with Webster against Calhoun, and with Clay against anybody 
though his notions of politics, like those of any ill-educated young man of twenty-two, must have been rather crude, and not at all sufficient to live and to die by, he had adopted them honestly and sincerely, with no selfish regard to his own interests, and though he ardently desired success, he never abated one jot or tittle of his convictions for any possible personal gain, then or thereafter. In the circular in which he announced his candidacy he made no reference to national politics, but confined himself mainly to a discussion of the practicability of improving the navigation of the Sangamon, the favorite hobby of the place and time. He had no monopoly of this issue. It formed the burden of nearly every candidate's appeal to the people in that year. The excitement occasioned by the trip of the talisman had not yet died away, although the little steamer was now dust and ashes, and her bold commander had left the state to avoid an awkward meeting with the sheriff. The hope of seeing Springfield an emporium of commerce was still lively among the citizens of Sangamon County, and in no one of the handbills of the political aspirants of the season was that hope more judiciously encouraged than in the one signed by Abraham Lincoln. It was a well-written circular, remarkable for its soberness and reserve when we consider the age and the limited advantages of the writer. It concluded in these words, Upon the subjects of which I have treated, I have spoken as I have thought. I may be wrong in regard to any or all of them, but holding it a sound maxim that it is better only sometimes to be right than at all times wrong, so soon as I discover my opinions to be erroneous I shall be ready to renounce them. Every man is said to have his peculiar ambition. Whether it be true or not, I can say for one that I have no other so great as that of being truly esteemed by my fellow men by rendering myself worthy of their esteem. How far I shall succeed in gratifying this ambition is yet to be developed. I am young and unknown to many of you. I was born and have ever remained in the most humble walks of life. I have no wealthy or powerful relations or friends to recommend me. My case is thrown exclusively upon the independent voters of the county, and, if elected, they will have conferred a favor upon me for which I shall be unremitting in my labors to compensate. But if the good people in their wisdom shall see fit to keep me in the background, I have been too familiar with disappointments to be very much chagrined. This is almost precisely the style of his later years. The errors of grammar and construction which spring invariably from an effort to avoid redundancy of expression remained with him through life. He seemed to grudge the space required for necessary parts of speech. But his language was, at twenty-two, as it was thirty years later, the simple and manly attire of his thought, with little attempt at ornament and none at disguise. There was an intermediate time when he sinned in the direction of fine writing, but this ebullition soon passed away, and left that marvelously strong and transparent style in which his two inaugurals were written. Of course, in the ten days left him after his return from the field, a canvas of the county, which was then, before its division, several thousand square miles in extent, was out of the question. He made a few speeches in the neighborhood of New Salem, and at least one in Springfield. He was wholly unknown there except by his few comrades in arms. We find him mentioned in the county paper only once during the summer, in an editorial note adding the name of Captain Lincoln to those candidates for the legislature who were periling their lives on the frontier and had left their reputations in charge of their generous fellow citizens at home. On the occasion of his speaking at Springfield, most of the candidates had come together to address a meeting there to give their electors some idea of their quality. These were severe ordeals for the rash aspirants for popular favor. Besides those citizens who came to listen and judge, there were many whose only object was the free whiskey provided for the occasion, and who, after potations pottle deep, became not only highly unparliamentary, but even dangerous to life and limb. 
This wild chivalry of Lick Creek was, however, less redoubtable to Lincoln than it might be to an urban statesman unacquainted with the frolic brutality of Clary's Grove. Their gambols never caused him to lose his self-possession. It is related that once, while he was speaking, he saw a ruffian attack a friend of his in the crowd, and the rencontre, not resulting according to the orator's sympathies, he descended from the stand seized the objectionable fighting man by the neck, threw him some ten feet, then calmly mounted to his place and finished his speech, the course of his logic undisturbed by this athletic parenthesis. Judge Logan saw Lincoln for the first time on the day when he came up to Springfield on his canvas this summer. He thus speaks of his future partner. He was a very tall, gawky, and rough-looking fellow then. His pantaloons didn't meet his shoes by six inches. But after he began speaking I became very much interested in him. He made a very sensible speech. His manner was very much the same as in after life. That is, the same peculiar characteristics were apparent then, though of course in after years he evinced more knowledge and experience. But he had then the same novelty and the same peculiarity in presenting his ideas. He had the same individuality that he kept through all his life. There were two or three men at the meeting whose good opinion was worth more than all the votes of Lick Creek to one beginning life. Stephen T. Logan, a young lawyer who had recently come from Kentucky with the best equipment for a Nisi Prius practitioner ever brought into the state. Major Stewart, whom we have met in the Black Hawk War, once commanding a battalion and then marching as a private, and William Butler, afterwards prominent in state politics, at that time a young man of the purest western breed in body and character, clear-headed and courageous, and ready for any emergency where a friend was to be defended or an enemy punished. We do not know whether Lincoln gained any votes that day, but he gained what was far more valuable, the active friendship of these able and honorable men, all Whigs and all Kentuckians like himself. The acquaintances he made in his canvass, the practice he gained in speaking, and the added confidence which this experience of measuring his abilities with those of others gave, were all the advantages which Lincoln derived from this attempt. He was defeated, for the only time in his life, in a contest before the people. The fortunate candidates were E. D. Taylor, J. T. Stewart, Achilles Morris, and Peter Cartwright, the first of whom received 1,127 votes, and the last 815. Lincoln's position among the eight defeated candidates was a very respectable one. He had 657 votes, and there were five who fared worse, among them his old adversary Kirkpatrick. What must have been especially gratifying to him was the fact that he received the almost unanimous vote of his own neighborhood, the precinct of New Salem, 277 votes against three, a result which showed more strongly than any words could do the extent of the attachment and the confidence which his genial and upright character had inspired among those who knew him best. Having been, even in so slight a degree, a soldier and a politician, he was unfitted for a day laborer, but being entirely without means of subsistence, he was forced to look about for some suitable occupation. We know he thought seriously at this time of learning the trade of a blacksmith, and using in that honest way the sinew and brawn which nature had given him. But an opening for another kind of business occurred, which prevented his entering upon any merely mechanical occupation. Two of his most intimate friends were the brothers Herndon, called, according to the fashion of the time, which held it unfriendly to give a man his proper name, and arrogant for him to claim it, Roe and Jim. They kept one of those grocery stores in which everything saleable on the frontier was sold, and which seemed to have changed their occupants as rapidly as sentry boxes. Jim sold his share to an idle and dissolute man named Barry, and Roe soon transferred his interest to Lincoln. It was easy enough to buy, as nothing was ever given in payment but a promissory note. A short time afterwards, one Reuben Radford, who kept another shop of the same kind, 
happened one evening to attract the dangerous attention of the Clary's Grove boys, who, with their usual prompt and practical facetiousness, without a touch of malice in it, broke his windows and wrecked his store. The next morning, while Radford was ruefully contemplating the ruin, and doubtless concluding that he had had enough of a country where the local idea of neighborly humor found such eccentric expression, he hailed a passer-by named Green, and challenged him to buy his establishment for four hundred dollars. This sort of trade was always irresistible to these western speculators, and Green at once gave his note for the amount. It next occurred to him to try to find out what the property was worth, and doubting his own skill, he engaged Lincoln to make an invoice of it. The young merchant, whose appetite for speculation had just been whetted by his own investment, undertook the task, and finding the stock of goods rather tempting, offered Green two hundred fifty dollars for his bargain, which was at once accepted. Not a cent of money changed hands in all these transactions. By virtue of half a dozen signatures, Barry and Lincoln became proprietors of the only mercantile establishment in the village, and the apparent wealth of the community was increased by a liberal distribution of their notes among the Herndons, Radford, Green, and a Mr. Rutledge, whose business they had also bought. Fortunately for Lincoln and for the world, the enterprise was not successful. It was entered into without sufficient reflection, and from the very nature of things was destined to fail. To Barry the business was merely the refuge of idleness. He spent his time in gossip, and drank up his share of the profits, and it is probable that Lincoln was far more interested in politics and general reading than in the petty traffic of his shop. In the spring of the next year, finding that their merchandise was gaining them little or nothing, they concluded to keep a tavern in addition to their other business, and the records of the county court of Sangamon County show that Barry took out a license for that purpose on the 6th of March, 1833. Footnote the following is an extract from the court record. March 6, 1833. Ordered that William F. Barry, in the name of Barry and Lincoln, have license to keep a tavern in New Salem, to continue twelve months from this date, and that they pay one dollar in addition to six dollars heretofore prepaid as per treasurer's receipt, and that they be allowed the following rates, viz. French brandy per pint, twenty-five. Peach, one eighty three slash four, apple twelve, Holland gin one eighty three slash four, domestic one twenty one slash two, wine twenty five, rum one eighty three slash four, whiskey one twenty one slash two, breakfast dinner or supper twenty five, lodging for night one twenty one slash two, horse for night twenty five. Single feed, 121-2. Breakfast, dinner, or supper for stage passengers, 371-2. Who gave bond as required by law? End footnote. But it was even then too late for any expedients to save the moribund partnership. The tavern was never opened, for about this time Lincoln and Barry were challenged to sell out to a pair of vagrant brothers named Trent, who, as they had no idea of paying, were willing to give their notes to any amount. They soon ran away, and Barry expired, extinguished in rum. Lincoln was thus left loaded with debts, and with no assets except worthless notes of Barry and the Trents. It is greatly to his credit that he never thought of doing by others as others had done by him. The morality of the frontier was deplorably loose in such matters and most of these people would have concluded that the failure of the business expunged its liabilities. But Lincoln made no effort even to compromise the claims against him. He promised to pay when he could, and it took the labor of years to do it, but he paid at last every farthing of the debt, which seemed to him and his friends so large that it was called among them the National Debt. He had already begun to read elementary books of law, borrowed from Major Stewart and other kindly acquaintances, 
Indeed, it is quite possible that Barry and Lincoln might have succeeded better in business if the junior member of the firm had not spent so much of his time reading Blackstone and Chitty in the shade of a great oak just outside the door, while the senior quietly fuddled himself within. Eyewitnesses still speak of the grotesque youth, habited in homespun tow, lying on his back with his feet on the trunk of the tree, and poring over his book by the hour, grinding around with the shade, as it shifted from north to east. After his store, to use his own expression, had winked out, he applied himself with more continuous energy to his reading, doing merely what odd jobs came to his hand to pay his current expenses, which were of course very slight. He sometimes helped his friend Ellis in his store, sometimes went into the field and renewed his exploits as a farmhand, which had gained him a traditional fame in Indiana, sometimes employed his clerky hand in straightening up a neglected ledger. It is probable that he worked for his board oftener than for any other compensation, and his hearty friendliness and vivacity, as well as his industry in the field, made him a welcome guest in any farmhouse in the county. His strong arm was always at the disposal of the poor and needy, it is said of him, with a graphic variation of a well-known text, that he visited the fatherless and the widow, and chopped their wood. In the spring of this year, 1833, he was appointed postmaster of New Salem, and held the office for three years. Its emoluments were slender, and its duties light, but there was in all probability no citizen of the village who could have made so much of it as he. The mails were so scanty that he was said to carry them in his hat, and he is also reported to have read every newspaper that arrived. It is altogether likely that this formed the leading inducement of his taking the office. His incumbency lasted until New Salem ceased to be populous enough for a post station, and the mail went by to Petersburg. Dr. J. G. Holland relates a sequel to this official experience, which illustrates the quaint honesty of the man. Several years later, when he was a practicing lawyer, an agent of the post office department called upon him, and asked for a balance due from the New Salem office, some seventeen dollars. Lincoln rose, and opening a little trunk which lay in a corner of the room, took it from a cotton rag in which was tied up the exact sum required. "'I never use any man's money but my own,' he quietly remarked. When we consider the pinching poverty in which these years had been passed, we may appreciate the self-denial which had kept him from making even a temporary use of this little sum of government money. John Calhoun, the surveyor of Sangamon County, was at this time overburdened with work. The principal local industry was speculation in land. Every settler, of course, wanted his farm surveyed and marked out for him, and every community had its syndicate of leading citizens who cherished a scheme of laying out a city somewhere. In many cases the city was plotted, the sites of the principal buildings, including a courthouse and a university, were determined, and a sonorous name was selected out of Plutarch before its location was even considered. For this latter office the intervention of an official surveyor was necessary, and therefore Mr. Calhoun had more business than he could attend to without assistance. Looking about for a young man of good character, intelligent enough to learn surveying at short notice, his attention was soon attracted to Lincoln. He offered young Abraham a book containing the elements of the art, and told him when he had mastered it he should have employment. The offer was a flattering one and Lincoln, with that steady self-reliance of his, accepted it, and armed with his book went out to the schoolmasters, Menton Grahams, and in six weeks close application made himself a surveyor. Footnote. There has been some discussion as to whether Lincoln served as deputy under Calhoun or Neal. The truth is that he served under both of them. Calhoun was surveyor in 1833, when Lincoln first learned the business. Neal was elected in 1835, and immediately appointed Lincoln and Calhoun as his deputies. The Sangamo Journal of September 12, 1835, contains the following official advertisement. Surveyor's Notice I have appointed John B. Watson, Abram Lincoln, and John Calhoun, deputy surveyors for Sangamon County. <laughs> 
In my absence from town, any persons wishing their land surveyed will do well to call at the recorder's office and enter his or their names in a book left for that purpose, stating township and range in which they respectively live, and their business shall be promptly attended to. T. M. Neal an article by Colonel G. A. Pierce, printed April 21st, 1881, in the Chicago Inter-Ocean, describes an interview held in that month with W. G. Green of Menard County, in which this matter is referred to. But Mr. Green relies more on the document in his possession than on his recollection of what took place in 1833. "'Where did Lincoln learn his surveying?' I asked. "'Took it up himself,' replied Mr. Green as he did a hundred things, and mastered it too. When he acted as surveyor, here he was deputy of T. M. Neal, and not of Calhoun, as has often been said. There was a dispute about this, and many sketches of his life gave Calhoun, Candlebox Calhoun, as he was afterwards known during the Kansas Troubles and election frauds, as the surveyor, but it was Neal. Mr. Green turned to his desk and threw out an old certificate in the handwriting of Lincoln, giving the boundaries of certain lands, and signed T. M. Neal, Surveyor, by A. Lincoln, Deputy, thus settling the question. Mr. Green was a Democrat, and has leaned towards that party all his life, but what he thought and thinks of Lincoln can be seen by an endorsement on the back of the certificate named, which is as follows. Preserve this, as it is the noblest of God's creation, A. Lincoln, the second preserver of his country. May 3, 1865, penned by W. G. Green, who taught Lincoln the English grammar in 1831. End footnote. It will be remembered that Washington in his youth adopted the same profession, but there were few points of similarity in the lives of the two great presidents in youth or later manhood. The Virginian had every social advantage in his favor, and was by nature a man of more thrift and greater sagacity in money matters. He used the knowledge gained in the practice of his profession so wisely that he became rather early in life a large landholder, and continually increased his possessions until his death. Lincoln, with almost unbounded opportunities for the selection and purchase of valuable tracts, made no use whatever of them. He employed his skill and knowledge merely as a breadwinner, and made so little provision for the future that when Mr. Van Bergen, who had purchased the Radford note, sued and got judgment on it, his horse and his surveying instruments were taken to pay the debt, and only by the generous intervention of a friend was he able to redeem these invaluable means of his living. He was, nevertheless, an excellent surveyor. His portion of the public work executed under the directions of Mr. Calhoun and his successor, T. M. Neal, was well performed, and he soon found his time pretty well employed with private business which came to him from Sangamon and the adjoining counties. Early in the year 1834 we find him appointed one of three viewers to locate a road from Salt Creek to the county line in the direction of Jacksonville. The board seems to have consisted mainly of its chairman, as Lincoln made the deposit of money required by law, surveyed the route, plotted the road, and wrote the report. Footnote. As this is probably the earliest public document extant, written and signed by Lincoln, we give it in full. March 3, 1834. Reuben Harrison presented the following petition. We, the undersigned, respectfully request your honorable body to appoint viewers to view and locate a road from Music's Ferry on Salt Creek, via New Salem, to the county line in the direction of Jacksonville. And Abram Lincoln deposited with the clerk ten dollars, as the law directs, ordered that Michael Killen, Hugh Armstrong, and Abram Lincoln be appointed to view said road, and said Lincoln to act as surveyor. To the County Commissioner's Court for the County of Sangamon at its June term, 1834. We, the undersigned, being appointed to view and locate a whole length of road, 26 road, beginning at Music's Ferry on Salt Creek, via New Salem, to the county line in the direction of Jacksonville, 
respectfully report that we have performed the duties of said view and location as required by law and that we have made the location on good ground and believe the establishment of the same to be necessary and proper the enclosed map gives the courses and distances as required by law michael killen hugh armstrong a lincoln endorsement in pencil also in lincoln's handwriting a lincoln five days at three dollars fifteen dollars john a kelso chain bearer for five days at seventy five cents three dollars seventy five cents robert lloyd at seventy five cents three dollars seventy five cents hugh armstrong for services as axeman five days at seventy five cents three dollars and seventy five cents a lincoln for making plot and report two dollars and fifty cents on map whole length of road twenty six miles and seventy chains scale two inches to the mile End footnote though it is evident that the post office and the surveyor's compass were not making a rich man of him they were sufficient to enable him to live decently and during the year he greatly increased his acquaintance and his influence in the county the one followed the other naturally every acquaintance he made became his friend and even before the end of his unsuccessful canvass in eighteen thirty two it had become evident to the observant politicians of the district that he was a man whom it would not do to leave out of their calculations there seemed to be no limit to his popularity nor to his aptitudes in the opinion of his admirers he was continually called on to serve in the most incongruous capacities old residents say he was the best judge at a horse race the county afforded he was occasionally second in a duel of fisticuffs though he usually contrived to reconcile the adversaries on the turf before any damage was done he was the arbiter on all controverted points of literature science or woodcraft among the disputatious denizens of clary's grove and his decisions were never appealed from his native tact and humor were invaluable in his work as a peacemaker and his enormous physical strength which he always used with a magnanimity rare among giants placed his off-hand decrees beyond the reach of contemptuous question he composed differences among friends and equals with good-natured raillery but he was as rough as need be when his wrath was roused by meanness and cruelty we hardly know whether to credit some of the stories apparently well attested by living witnesses of his prodigious muscular powers he is said to have lifted at rutledge's mill a box of stones weighing over half a ton it is also related that he could raise a barrel of whiskey from the ground and drink from the bung but the narrator adds that he never swallowed the whiskey whether these traditions are strictly true or not they are evidently founded on the current reputation he enjoyed among his fellows for extraordinary strength and this was an important element in his influence he was known to be capable of handling almost any man he met yet he never sought a quarrel he was everybody's friend and yet used no liquor or tobacco he was poor and had scarcely ever been at school yet he was the best informed young man in the village he had grown up on the frontier the utmost fringe of civilization yet he was gentle and clean of speech innocent of blasphemy or scandal his good qualities might have excited resentment if displayed by a well-dressed stranger from an eastern state but the most uncouth ruffians of new salem took a sort of proprietary interest and pride in the decency and the cleverness and the learning of their friend and comrade abe lincoln it was regarded therefore almost as a matter of course that lincoln should be a candidate for the legislature at the next election which took place in august eighteen thirty four he was sure of the united support of the whigs and so many of the democrats also wanted to vote for him that some of the leading members of that party came to him and proposed they should give him an organized support he was too loyal a partisan to accept their overtures without taking counsel from the whig candidates he laid the matter before major stuart who at once advised him to make the canvass it was a generous and chivalrous action for by thus encouraging the candidacy of lincoln he was endangering his own election but his success two years before in the face of a vindictive opposition led by the strongest jackson men in the district 
had made him somewhat confident, and he perhaps thought he was risking little by giving a helping hand to his comrade in the spy battalion. Before the election Lincoln's popularity developed itself in rather a portentous manner, and it required some exertion to save the seat of his generous friend. At the close of the poll, the four successful candidates held the following relative positions. Lincoln, 1,376. Dawson, 1,370. Carpenter, 1,170. And Stewart, at that time probably the most prominent young man in the district, and the one marked out by the public voice for an early election to Congress, 1,164. End of section six. Recording by Stephen L. Moss. Stephen L. Moss dot com. Section seven of Abraham Lincoln, a history, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 7, Legislative Experience. The election of Mr. Lincoln to the legislature may be said to have closed the pioneer portion of his life. He was done with the wild carelessness of the woods, with the jolly ruffianism of Clary's Grove, with the petty chaffering of grocery stores, with odd jobs for daily bread, with all the uncouth squalor of the frontier poverty. It was not that his pecuniary circumstances were materially improved. He was still, and for years continued to be, a very poor man, harassed by debts which he was always working to pay, and sometimes in distress for the means of decent subsistence. But from this time forward, his associations were with a better class of men than he had ever known before, and a new feeling of self-respect must naturally have grown up in his mind from his constant intercourse with them, a feeling which extended to the minor morals of civilized life. A sophisticated reader may smile at the mention of anything like social ethics in Vandalia in 1834, but, compared with Gentryville and New Salem, the society which assembled in the winter at that little capital was polished and elegant. The state then contained nearly 250,000 inhabitants, and the members of the legislature, elected purely on personal grounds, nominated by themselves or their neighbors without the intervention of party machinery, were necessarily the leading men, in one way or another, in their several districts. Among the colleagues of Lincoln at Vandalia were young men with destinies only less brilliant than his own. They were to become governors, senators, and judges. They were to organize the Whig Party of Illinois, and afterward the Republican, they were to lead brigades and divisions in two great wars. Among the first persons he met there, not in the legislature proper, but in the lobby, where he was trying to appropriate an office then filled by Colonel John J. Hardin, was his future antagonist, Stephen A. Douglas. Neither seemed to have any presentiment of the future greatness of the other. Douglas thought little of the raw youth from the Sangamon timber, and Lincoln said the dwarfish Vermonter was the least man he had ever seen. To all appearances, Vandalia was full of better men than either of them, clever lawyers, men of wit and standing, some of them sons of provident early settlers, but more who had come from older states to seek their fortunes in these fresh fields. During his first session, Lincoln occupied no especially conspicuous position. He held his own respectably among the best. One of his colleagues tells us, he was not distinguished by any external eccentricity, that he wore, according to the custom of the time, a decent suit of blue jeans, that he was known simply as a rather quiet young man, good-natured and sensible. Before the session ended, he had made the acquaintance of most of the members, and had evidently come to be looked upon as possessing more than ordinary capacity. His unusual common sense began to be recognized. His name does not often appear in the records of the year. He introduced a resolution in favor of securing to the state a part of the proceeds of the sales of public lands within its limits. He took part in the organization of the ephemeral White Party, which was designed to unite all the anti-Jackson elements under the leadership of Hugh L. White of Tennessee. He voted with the minority in favor of Young against Robinson for senator, 
and with the majority that passed the bank and canal bills, which were received with great enthusiasm throughout Illinois, and which were only the precursors of those gigantic and ill-advised schemes that came to maturity two years later and inflicted incalculable injury upon the state. Lincoln returned to New Salem after this winter's experience of men and things at the little capital, much firmer on his feet than ever before. He had had the opportunity of measuring himself with the leading men of the community, and had found no difficulty whatever in keeping pace with them. He continued his studies of the law and surveying together, and became quite indispensable in the latter capacity, so much so that General Neal, announcing in September 1835 the names of the deputy surveyors of Sangamon County, placed the name of Lincoln before that of his old master in the science, John Calhoun. He returned to the legislature in the winter of 1835-6, through six, and one of the first important incidents of the session was the election of a senator to fill the vacancy occasioned by the death of Elias Kent Kane. There was no lack of candidates. A journal of the time says, This intelligence reached Vandalia on the evening of the 26th of December, and in the morning nine candidates appeared in that place, and it was anticipated that a number more would soon be in, among them the Lion of the North, who, it is thought, will claim the office by preemption. It is not known who was the roaring celebrity here referred to, but the successful candidate was General William L. D. Ewing, who was elected by a majority of one vote. Lincoln and the other Whigs voted for him, not because he was a white man, as they frankly stated, but because he had been proscribed by the Van Buren party. Mr. Semple, the candidate for the regular Democratic caucus, was beaten simply on account of his political orthodoxy. A minority is always strongly in favor of independent action and bitterly opposed to caucuses, and therefore we need not be surprised at finding Mr. Lincoln, a few days later in the session, joining in hearty denunciation of the convention system which had already become popular in the East, and which General Jackson was then urging upon his faithful followers. The missionaries of this new system in Illinois were Stephen A. Douglas, recently from Vermont, the shifty young lawyer from Morgan County, who had just succeeded in having himself made circuit attorney in place of Colonel Hardin, and a man who was then regarded in Vandalia as a far more important and dangerous person than Douglas, Ebenezer Peck of Chicago. Peck was looked upon with distrust and suspicion for several reasons, all of which seemed valid to the rural legislators assembled here. He came from Canada, where he had been a member of the provincial parliament, it was therefore imagined that he was permeated with secret hostility to Republican institutions. His garb, his furs, were of the fashion of Quebec, and he passed his time indoctrinated the Jackson men with the theory and practice of party organization, teachings which they eagerly absorbed, and which seemed sinister and ominous to the Whigs. He was showing them, in fact, the way in which elections were to be won. And though the Whigs denounced his system as subversive of individual freedoms and private judgment, it was not long before they were also forced to adopt it, or be left alone with their virtue. The organization of political parties in Illinois really takes its rise from this time, and in great measure from the work of Mr. Peck with the Vandalia legislature. There was no man more dreaded and disliked than he was by the stalwart young Whigs against whom he was organizing that solid and disciplined opposition. But a quarter of a century brings wonderful changes. Twenty-five years later, Mr. Peck stood shoulder to shoulder with these very men who then reviled him as a Canadian emissary of tyranny and corruption, with S.T. Logan, O.H. Browning, and J.K. Dubois, organizing a new party for victory under the name of Abraham Lincoln. The legislature adjourned on the 18th of January, having made a beginning, it is true, in the work of improving the state by statute, though its modest work incorporating canal and bridge companies, and providing for public roads, bore no relation to the ambitious essays of its successor. Among the bills passed at this session was an apportionment act by which Sangamon County became entitled to seven representatives and two senators, and early in the spring eight white statesmen of the county were ready for the field, the ninth, Mr. Herndon, holding over a state senator, it seems singular to us of a later day that just eight prominent men on a side should have offered themselves for these places without the intervention of any primary meetings. Such a thing, if we mistake not, was never known again in Illinois. The convention system was afterwards seen to be an absolute necessity to prevent the disorganization of parties, 
through the restless vanity of obscure and insubordinate aspirants. But the eight who took the stump in Sangamon in summer of 1836 were supported as loyally and as energetically as if they had been nominated with all the solemnity of modern days. They became famous in the history of the state, partly for their stature and partly for their influence in legislation. They were called, with Herndon, the Long Nine. Their average height was over six feet, and their aggregate altitude was said to be fifty-five feet. Their names were Abraham Lincoln, John Dawson, Dan Stone, Ninian W. Edwards, William F. Elkin, R. L. Wilson, and Andrew McCormick, candidates for the House of Representatives, and Job Fletcher for the Senate of Illinois. Mr. Lincoln began his canvass with the following circular. New Salem, June 13, 1836, to the editor of The Journal. In your paper of last Saturday, I see a communication over the signature, Many Voters, in which the candidates who were announced in the journal are called upon to show their hands. Agreed. Here is mine. I go for all sharing the privileges of the government who assist in bearing its burdens. Consequently, I go for admitting all whites to the right of suffrage who pay taxes or bear arms, by no means excluding females. If elected, I shall consider the whole people of Sangamon my constituents, as well those that oppose as those that support me. While acting as their representative, I shall be governed by their will on all subjects upon which I have the means of knowing what their will is, and upon all others I shall do what my own judgment teaches me will best advance their interests. Whether elected or not, I go for distributing the proceeds of the sales of the public lands to the several states to enable our state, in common with others, to dig canals and construct railroads without borrowing money and paying interest on it. If alive on the first Monday in November, I shall vote for Hugh L. White for president. Footnote. This phrase seems to have been adopted as a formula by the anti-Jackson party. The cards of several candidates contain it. End footnote. Very respectfully, A. Lincoln. It would be hard to imagine a more audacious and unqualified declaration of principles and intentions, but it was the fashion of the hour to promise exact obedience to the will of the people, and the two practical questions touched by this circular were the only ones then much to talk about. The question of suffrage for aliens was a living problem in the state, and Mr. Lincoln naturally took liberal ground on it. He was also in favor of getting from the sale of public lands a portion of the money he was ready to vote for internal improvements. This was good Whig doctrine at the time, and the young politician did not fancy he could go wrong in following in such a matter the lead of his idol, Henry Clay. He made an active canvass, and spoke frequently during the summer. He must have made some part of the campaign on foot, for we find in the county paper an advertisement of a horse which had strayed or been stolen from him while on a visit to Springfield. It was not an imposing animal, to judge from the description. It was plainly marked with harness and was believed to have lost some of his shoes. But it was a large horse, as suited a cavalier of such stature, and trotted and paced in a serviceable manner. In July, a rather remarkable discussion took place at the county seat, in which many of the leading men on both sides took part. Ninian Edwards, son of the late governor, is said to have opened the debate with much effect. Mr. Early, who followed him, was so roused by his energetic attack that he felt his only resource was a flat contradiction, which in those days meant mischief. In the midst of great and increasing excitement, Dan Stone and John Calhoun made speeches which did not tend to pour oil on the waters of contention, and then came Mr. Lincoln's turn. As an article in the journal states that he seemed embarrassed in his opening, for this was the most important contest in which he had ever been engaged, but he soon felt the easy mastery of his powers come back to him, and he finally made what was universally regarded as the strongest speech of the day. One of his colleagues says that on this occasion he used in his excitement for the first time that singularly effective clear tenor tone of voice which afterwards became so widely known in the political battles of the West. The canvas was an energetic one throughout, and excited more interest in the district than even the presidential election which occurred some months later. Mr. Lincoln was elected at the head of the poll by a majority greatly in excess of the average majority of his friends, which shows conclusively how his influence and popularity had increased. The Whigs in this election 
effected a revolution in the politics of the county. By force of their ability and standing, they had before managed to divide the suffrages of the people, even while they were unquestionably in the minority. But this year they completely defeated their opponents and gained that control of the county which they never lost as long as the party endured. If Mr. Lincoln had no other claims to be remembered than his services in the legislature of 1836-7, through there would be little to say in his favor. Its history is one of disaster to the state. Its legislation was almost wholly unwise and hurtful. The most we can say for Mr. Lincoln is that he obeyed the will of his constituents as he promised to do, and labored with singular skill and ability to accomplish the objects desired by the people who gave him their votes. The especial work entrusted to him was the subdivision of the county, and the project for the removal of the capital of the state to Springfield. Footnote. Lincoln was at the head of the project to remove the seat of government to Springfield. It was entirely entrusted to him to manage. The members were all elected on one ticket, but they all looked to Lincoln as the head. Stephen T. Logan. End footnote. In both of these, he was successful. In the account of errors and follies committed by the legislature to the lasting injury of the state, he is entitled to no praise or blame beyond the rest. He shared in that sanguine epidemic of financial and industrial quackery, which devastated the entire community, and voted with the best men of the country in favor of schemes which appeared then like a promise of an immediate millennium, and seem now like a midsummer madness. He entered political life in one of those eras of delusive prosperity, which so often precede great financial convulsions. The population of the state was increasing at an enormous rate of 200% in 10 years. It had extended northward along the lines of the wooded valleys of creeks and rivers in the center to Peoria, on the west by the banks of the Mississippi to Galena, on the east with wide intervals of wilderness to Chicago. The edge of the timber was everywhere pretty well occupied, though the immigrants from the forest states of Kentucky and Tennessee had as yet avoided the prairies. The rich soil and equable climate were now attracting an excellent class of settlers from the older states, and the long-neglected northern counties were receiving the attention they deserved. The War of Black Hawk had brought the country into notice. The utter defeat of his nation had given the guarantee of a permanent peace. The last lodges of the Potawatomis had disappeared from the country in 1833. The money spent by the general government during the war, and paid to the volunteers at its close, added to the common prosperity. There was a brisk trade in real estate, and there was even a beginning in Chicago of that passion for speculation in town lots which afterwards became a frenzy. It was too much to expect of the Illinois legislature that it should understand that the best thing it could do to forward this prosperous tendency of things was to do nothing. For this is a lesson which has not yet been learned by any legislature in the world. For several years they had been tinkering, at first modestly and tentatively, at a scheme of internal improvements which should not cost too much money. In 1835 they began to grant charters for railroads, which remained in embryo, as the stock was never taken. Surveys for other railroads were also proposed to cross the state in different directions, and the project of uniting Lake Michigan with Illinois River by a canal was of too evident utility to be overlooked. In fact, the route had been surveyed and estimates of cost made, companies incorporated, and all preliminaries completed many years before, though nothing further had been done, as no funds had been offered from any source. But at the special session of 1835, a law was passed authorizing a loan of half a million dollars for this purpose. The loan was effected by the Governor Duncan the following year, and in June, a board of canal commissioners having been appointed, a beginning was actually made with pick and shovel. A restless feeling of hazardous speculation seemed to be taking possession of the state. It commenced, said Governor Ford, in his admirable chronicle, at Chicago, and was the means of building up that place in a year or two from a village of a few houses to be a city of several thousand inhabitants. The story of the sudden fortunes made there excited at first wonder and amazement, next a gambling spirit of adventure, and lastly an all-absorbing desire for sudden and splendid wealth. Chicago had been for some time only one great town market. The plots of towns for hundred miles around were carried there to be disposed of at auction. The eastern people had caught the mania. Every vessel coming west was loaded with them, their money and means bound for Chicago, the great fairyland of fortunes, 
but as enough did not come to satisfy the insatiable greediness of the Chicago sharpers and speculators, they frequently consigned their wares to eastern markets. In fact, land and town lots were the staple of the country and were the only article of export. The contagion spread so rapidly, towns and cities were laid out so profusely, that it was a standing joke that before long there would be no land left in the state for farming purposes. The future of the state for many years to come was thus discounted by the fervid imaginations of its inhabitants. We have every requisite of great empire, they said, except enterprise and inhabitants. And they thought that a little enterprise would bring the inhabitants. Through the spring and summer of 1836, the talk of internal improvements grew more general and more clamorous. The candidates for office spoke about little else, and the only point of emulation among the parties was which should be more reckless and grandiose in its promises. When the time arrived for the assembling of the legislature, the members were not left to their own zeal and the recollection of their campaign pledges, but meetings and conventions were everywhere held to spur them up to the fulfillment of their mandate. The resolutions passed by the principal body of delegates who came together in December directed the legislature to vote a system of internal improvements commensurate with the wants of the people, a phrase which is never lacking in the mouth of a charlatan or demagogue. These demands were pressed upon a not reluctant legislature. They addressed themselves at once to the work required of them, and soon devised with reckless and unreasoning haste a scheme of railroads covering the vast uninhabited prairies as with a gridiron. There was to be a railroad from Galena to the mouth of the Ohio River, from Alton to Shawneetown, from Alton to Mount Carmel, from Alton to the eastern state boundary, by virtue of which lines Alton was to take the life of St. Louis without further notice, from Quincy to the Wabash River, from Bloomington to Pekin, from Peoria to Warsaw, in all 1,350 miles of railway. Some of these terminal cities were not in existence except upon neatly designed surveyor's maps. The scheme provided also for the improvement of every stream in the state on which a child's shingle boat could sail, and to the end that all objections should be stifled on the part of those neighborhoods which had neither railroads nor rivers, a gift of $200,000 was voted to them, and with this sop they were fain to be content and not trouble the general joy. To accomplish this stupendous scheme, the legislature voted $8 million to be raised by loan. Four millions were also voted to complete the canal. These sums, monstrous as they were, were still ridiculously inadequate to the purpose in view. But while the frenzy lasted, there was no consideration of cost or of possibilities. These vast works were voted without estimates, without surveys, without any rational consideration of their necessity. The voice of reason seemed to be silent in the assembly. Only the utterances of fervid prophecy found listeners. Governor Ford speaks of one orator who insisted amid enthusiastic plaudits that the state could well afford to borrow one hundred millions for internal improvements. The process of reasoning, or rather predicting, was easy and natural. The roads would raise the price of land. The state could enter large tracts and sell them at profit. Foreign capital would be invested in the land and could be heavily taxed to pay bonded interest. And the roads, as fast as they were built, could be operated at a great profit to pay for their own construction. The climax of the whole folly was reached by the provision of law directing that work should begin at once at the termini of all the roads and the crossings of all rivers. It is futile and disingenuous to attempt, as some have done, to fasten upon one or the other of the political parties of the state the responsibility of this bedlam legislation. The governor and a majority of the legislature were elected as Jackson Democrats, but the Whigs were as earnest in passing these measures as their opponents, and after they were adopted, the superior wealth, education, and business capacity of the Whigs had their legitimate influence, and they filled the principal positions upon the boards and commissions which came into existence under the Acts. The bills were passed, not without opposition, it is true, but by sufficient majorities, and the news was received by the people of the state with the most extravagant demonstrations of delight. The villages were illuminated, bells were rung in the rare steeples of the churches, fireballs, bundles of candle wicks soaked in turpentine, were thrown by night all over the country. The day of payment was far away, and those who trusted the assurances of the sanguine politicians thought that in some mysterious way the scheme would pay for itself. 
Mr. Lincoln is continually found voting with his friends in favor of this legislation, and there is nothing to show that he saw any danger in it. He was a Whig, and as such in favor of internal improvements in general, and a liberal construction of constitutional law in such matters. As a boy, he had interested himself in the details of local improvements of rivers and roads, and he doubtless went with the current in Vandalia in favor of this enormous system. He took, however, no prominent part in the work by which these railroad bills were passed. He considered himself as specially commissioned to procure the removal of the state capital from Vandalia to Springfield, and he applied all his energies to the accomplishment of this work. The enterprise was hedged round with difficulties, for although it was everywhere agreed, except at Vandalia, that the capital ought to be moved, every city in the state, and several which existed only on paper, demanded to be made the seat of government. The question had been submitted to a popular vote in 1834, and the result showed about as many cities desirous of opening their gates to the legislature as claimed the honor of being the birthplace of Homer. Of these, Springfield was only a third in popular estimation, and it was evident that Mr. Lincoln had need of all his wits if he were to fulfill the trust confided to him. It is said by Governor Ford that the Long Nine were not averse to using the hopes and fears of other members in relation to their special railroads to gain their adherence to the Springfield program, but this is by no means clear. We are rather inclined to trust the direct testimony of Jesse K. Dubois that the success of the Sangamon County delegation in obtaining the capital was due to the adroit management of Mr. Lincoln, first in inducing all the rival claimants to unite in a vote to move the capital from Vandalia, and then in carrying a direct vote for Springfield through the joint convention by the assistance of the southern counties. His personal authority accomplished this in great part. Mr. Dubois says, He made Webb and me vote for the removal, though we belong to the southern end of the state. We defended our vote before our constituents by saying that necessity would ultimately force the seat of government to a central position. But in reality, we gave the vote to Lincoln because we liked him, because we wanted to oblige our friend, and because we recognized him as our leader. To do this, they were obliged to quarrel with their most intimate associates, who had bought a piece of waste land at the exact geographical center of the state, and were striving to have the capital established there in the interest of their own pockets and territorial symmetry. The bill was passed only a short time before the legislature adjourned, and the long nine came back to their constituents wearing their well-won laurels. They were complimented in the newspapers, at public meetings, and even at subscription dinners. We read of one at Springfield, at the rural hotel, to which sixty guests sat down, where there were speeches by Browning, Lincoln, Douglas, who had resigned his seat in the legislature to become the register of the land office at the new capital, S. T. Logan, Baker, and others, whose wit and wisdom were lost to history through the absence of reporters. Another dinner was given them at Athens a few weeks later. Among the toasts on these occasions were two which we may transcribe. Abraham Lincoln, he has fulfilled the expectations of his friends and disappointed the hopes of his enemies. And A. Lincoln, one of nature's noblemen. End of section 7. Recording by Jesse Crisp Sears in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Section 8 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay, Section 8, The Lincoln Stone Protest. On the 3rd of March, the day before the legislature adjourned, Mr. Lincoln caused to be entered upon its records a paper which excited but little interest at the time, but which will probably be remembered long after the good and evil actions of the Vandalia Assembly have faded away from the minds of men. It was the authentic record of the beginning of a great and momentous career. The following protest was presented to the House, which was read and ordered to be spread on the journals, to wit, Resolutions upon the subject of domestic slavery having passed both branches of the General Assembly at its present session, the undersigned hereby protest against the passage of the same. They believe that the institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy.
but that the promulgation of abolition doctrines tends rather to increase than abate its evils. They believe that the Congress of the United States has no power under the Constitution to interfere with the institution of slavery in the different states. They believe that the Congress of the United States has the power under the Constitution to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, but that the power ought not to be exercised unless at the request of the people of the district. The difference between these opinions and those contained in the above resolutions is their reason for entering this protest. Signed, Dan Stone, A. Lincoln, Representatives from the County of Sangamon. It may seem strange to those who shall read these pages that a protest so mild and cautious as this should ever have been considered either necessary or remarkable. We have gone so far away from the habits of thought and feeling prevalent at that time that it is difficult to appreciate such acts at their true value. But if we look a little carefully into the state of politics and public opinion in Illinois in the first half of this century, we shall see how much of inflexible conscience and reason there was in this simple protest. The whole of the Northwest Territory had, it is true, been dedicated to freedom by the Ordinance of 1787. But in spite of that famous prohibition, slavery existed in a modified form throughout that vast territory, wherever there was any considerable population. An act legalizing a sort of slavery by indenture was passed by the Indiana Territorial Legislature in 1807, and this remained in force in the Illinois country after its separation. Another act providing for the hiring of slaves from southern states was passed in 1814 for the ostensible reason that mills could not be successfully operated in the territory for want of laborers, and that the manufacture of salt could not be successfully carried on by white laborers. Yet, in an unconscious satire upon such pretenses, from time to time the most savage acts were passed to prohibit the immigration of free Negroes into the territory, which was represented as pining for black labor. Those who held slaves under the French domination, and their heirs, continued to hold them and their descendants in servitude, after Illinois had become nominally a free territory and a free state, on the ground that their vested rights of property could not have been abrogated by the ordinance, and that under the rule of the civil law partus sequitur ventrum. But this quasi-toleration of the institution was not enough for the advocates of slavery. Soon after the adoption of the state constitution which prohibited slavery hereafter, it was evident that there was strong undercurrent of desire for its introduction into the state. Some of the leading politicians, exaggerating the extent of this desire, imagined they saw in it a means of personal advancement, and began to agitate the question of a convention to amend the Constitution. At that time, there was a considerable emigration setting through the state from Kentucky and Tennessee to Missouri. Day by day, the teams of movers passed through the Illinois settlements, and wherever they halted for rest and refreshments, they would affect to deplore the short-sighted policy which, by prohibiting slavery, had prevented their settling in that beautiful country. When young bachelors came from Kentucky on trips of business or pleasure, they dazzled the eyes of the women and excited the envy of their male rivals with their black retainers. The early Illinoisans were perplexed with a secret and singular sense of inferiority, to even so new and raw a community as Missouri, because of its possessions of slavery. Governor Edwards, complaining so late as 1829 of the superior mail facilities afforded to Missouri, says, I can conceive of no reason for this preference, unless it be supposed that because the people of Missouri have Negroes to work for them, they are to be considered as gentlefolks entitled to higher consideration than us plain free state folks who have to work for ourselves. The attempt was at last seriously made to open the state to slavery by the legislature of 1822-3. through three. The governor, Edward Coles, of Virginia, a strong anti-slavery man, had been elected by a division of the pro-slavery party, but came in with a legislature largely against him. The Senate had the requisite pro-slavery majority of two-thirds for a convention. In the House of Representatives, there was a contest for a seat upon the result of which the two-thirds majority depended. The seat was claimed by John Shaw and Nicholas Hansen of Pike County. 
The way in which the contest was decided affords a curious illustration of the moral sense of the advocates of slavery. They wanted at this session to elect a senator and provide for the convention. Hansen would vote for their senator, and not for the convention. Shaw would vote for the convention, but not for Thomas, their candidate for senator. In such a dilemma they determined not to choose, but impartially to use both. They gave the seat to Hansen, and with his vote elected Thomas. They then turned him out, gave the place to Shaw, and with his vote carried the act for submitting the convention question to popular vote. They were not more magnanimous in their victory than scrupulous in the means by which they had gained it. The night after the vote was taken, they formed in a wild and drunken procession and visited the residences of the governor and the other free state leaders with loud and indecent demonstrations of triumph. They considered their success already assured, but they left out of view the value of the moral forces called into being by their insolent challenge. The better class of people in the state, those heretofore unknown in politics, the schoolmasters, the ministers, immediately prepared for the contest, which became one of the severest the state has ever known. They established three newspapers and sustained them with money and contributions. The governor gave his entire salary for four years to the expenses of this contest, in which he had no personal interest whatever. The anti-slavery members of the legislature made up a purse of a thousand dollars. They spent their money mostly in printer's ink and in the payment of active and zealous colporters. The result was a decisive defeat for the slave party. The convention was beaten by 1,800 majority in a total vote of 11,612, and the state saved forever from slavery. But these supreme efforts of the advocates of public morals, uninfluenced by considerations of personal advantage, are of rare occurrence and necessarily do not survive the exigencies that call them forth. The apologists of slavery, beaten in the canvas, were more successful in the field of social opinion. In the reaction which succeeded the triumph of the anti-slavery party, it seemed as if there had never been any anti-slavery sentiment in the state. They had voted, it is true, against the importation of slaves from the South, but they were content to live under a code of draconian ferocity, inspired by the very spirit of slavery, visiting the immigration of free Negroes with penalties of the most savage description. Even Governor Coles, the public-spirited and popular politician, was indicted and severely fined for having brought his own freedmen into the state and having assisted them in establishing themselves around him on farms of their own. The legislature remitted the fine, but the circuit court declared it had no constitutional power to do so, though the Supreme Court afterwards overruled this decision. Any mention of the subject of slavery was thought in the worst possible taste, and no one could avow himself opposed to it without the risk of social ostracism. Every town had its one or two abolitionists, who were regarded as harmless or dangerous lunatics, according to the energy with which they made their views known. From this arose a singular prejudice against New England people. It was attributable partly to the natural feeling of distrust of strangers, which is common to ignorance and provincialism, but still more to a general suspicion that all Eastern men were abolitionists. Mr. Cook, who so long represented the state in Congress, used to relate with much amusement how he once spent the night in a farmer's cabin and listened to the honest man's denunciation of that Yankee Cook. Cook was a Kentuckian, but his enemies could think of no more dreadful stigma to apply to him than that of calling him a Yankee. Senator James A. McDougall once told us that although he made no pretense of concealing his eastern nativity, he never could keep his ardent friends in Pike County from denying the fact and fighting anyone who asserted it. The great preacher, Peter Cartwright, used to denounce eastern men roundly in his sermons, calling them imps who lived on oysters, instead of honest cornbread and bacon. The taint of slavery, the contagion of a plague they had not quite escaped, was on the people of Illinois. They were strong enough to rise once in their might, and say they would not have slavery among them. But in the petty details of every day, in their ordinary talk, and in their routine legislation, their sympathies were still with the slaveholders. They would not enlist with them, but they would fight their battles in their own way.
Their readiness to do what came to be called later in a famous speech, the dirty work of the South, was seen in the tragic death of Reverend Elijah P. Lovejoy in this very year of 1837. He had for some years been publishing a religious newspaper in St. Louis, but finding the atmosphere of that city becoming dangerous to him on account of the freedom of his comments upon Southern institutions, he moved to Alton in Illinois, 25 miles further up the river. His arrival excited an immediate tumult in that place. A mob gathered there on the day he came, it was Sunday, and the good people were at leisure, and threw his press into the Mississippi. Having thus expressed their determination to vindicate the law, they held a meeting and cited him before it to declare his intentions. He said they were altogether peaceful and legal, that he intended to publish a religious newspaper and not to meddle with politics. This seemed satisfactory to the people, and he was allowed to fish out his press, buy new types, and set up his paper. But Mr. Lovejoy was a predestined martyr. He felt there was a woe upon him if he held his peace against the wickedness across the river. He wrote and published what was in his heart to say, and Alton was again vehemently moved. A committee appointed itself to wait upon him, for this sort of outrage is usually accomplished with a curious formality, which makes it seem to the participants legal and orderly. The preacher met them with an undaunted front, and told them he must do his duty as it appeared to him, that he was amenable to law, but nothing else. He even spoke in condemnation of mobs. Such language, from a minister of the gospel, shocked and infuriated the committee and those whom they represented. The people assembled, says Governor Ford, and quietly took the press and types and threw them into the river. We venture to say that the word quietly never before found itself in such company. It is not worth while to give the details of the bloody drama that now rapidly ran to its close. There was a fruitless effort at compromise, which to Lovejoy meant merely surrender, and which he firmly rejected. The threats of the mob were answered by defiance from the little band that surrounded the abolitionist. A new press was ordered and arrived, and it was stored in a warehouse where Lovejoy and his friends shut themselves up, determined to defend it with their lives. They were there besieged by the infuriated crowd, and after a short interchange of shots, Lovejoy was killed, his friends dispersed, and the press once more, and this time finally, thrown into the turbid flood. These events took place in the autumn of 1837, but they indicate sufficiently the temper of the people of the state in the earlier part of the year. The vehemence with which the early anti-slavery apostles were conducting their agitation in the East naturally roused a corresponding violence of expression in every other part of the country. William Lloyd Garrison, the boldest and most aggressive non-resistant that ever lived, had, since 1831, been pouring forth once a week in The Liberator his earnest and eloquent denunciations of slavery, taking no account of the expedient or the possible, but demanding with all the fervor of an ancient prophet the immediate removal of the cause of offense. Oliver Johnson attacked the national sin and wrong in the standard with zeal and energy equally hot and untiring. Their words stung the slaveholding states to something like frenzy. The Georgia legislature offered a reward of $5,000 to anyone who should kidnap Garrison or who should bring to conviction anyone circulating the liberator in the state. Yet so little known in their own neighborhoods were these early workers in this great reform that when the mayor of Boston received remonstrances from certain southern states against such an incendiary publication as the Liberator, he was able to say that no member of the city government, and no person of his acquaintance, had ever heard of the paper or its editor, that on search being made it was found that his office was an obscure hole, his only visible auxiliary a negro boy, and his supporters a very few insignificant persons of all colors. But the leaven worked continually, and by the time of which we are writing, the anti-slavery societies of the Northeast had attained a considerable vitality, and the echoes of their work came back from the South in furious resolutions of legislatures and other bodies, which, in their exasperation, could not refrain from this injudicious advertising of their enemies. Petitions to Congress, which were met by gag laws, constantly increasing in severity, brought the dreaded discussion more and more before the public. 
but there was as yet little or no anti-slavery agitation in Illinois. There was no sympathy with, nor even toleration for any public expression of hostility to slavery. The zeal of the followers of Jackson, although he had ceased to be president, had been wedded by his public denunciation of the anti-slavery propaganda. Little more than a year before, he had called upon Congress to take measures to prohibit under severe penalties the further progress of such incendiary proceedings as were calculated to stimulate the slaves to insurrection and to produce all the horrors of civil war. But in spite of all this, people with uneasy consciences continued to write and to talk and to petition Congress against slavery, and most of the state legislatures began to pass resolutions denouncing them. In the last days of 1836, Governor Duncan sent to the Illinois legislature the reports and resolutions of several states in relation to this subject. They were referred to a committee, who in due time reported a set of resolves highly disapproving abolition societies, holding that the right of property in slaves is secured to the slaveholding states by the federal constitution that the general government cannot abolish slavery in the District of Columbia against the consent of the citizens of said district without a manifest breach of good faith, and requesting the governor to transmit to the states which had sent their resolutions to him a copy of those tranquilizing expressions. A long and dragging debate ensued of which no record has been preserved. The resolutions, after numberless amendments had been voted upon, were finally passed in the Senate unanimously, in the House with none but Lincoln and five others in the negative. Footnote. We are under obligation to John M. Adair for transcripts of the state records bearing on this matter. End footnote. No report remains of the many speeches which prolonged the debate. They have gone the way of all bunkum. The sound and fury of them have passed away into silence. But they awoke an echo in one sincere heart, which history will be glad to perpetuate. There was no reason that Abraham Lincoln should take a special notice of these resolutions, more than another. He had done his work at this session in effecting the removal of the capital. He had only to shrug his shoulders at the violence and untruthfulness of the majority, vote against them, and go back to his admiring constituents, to his dinners and his toasts. But his conscience and his reason forbade him to be silent. He felt a word must be said on the other side to redress the distorted balance. He wrote his protest, saying not one word he was not ready to stand by then and thereafter, wasting not a syllable in rhetoric or feeling, keeping close to law and truth and justice. When he had finished it, he showed it to some of his colleagues for their adhesion, but one and all refused, except Dan Stone, who was not a candidate for re-election, having retired from politics to a seat on the bench. The risk was too great for the rest to run. Lincoln was twenty-eight years old. After a youth of singular privations and struggles, he had arrived at an enviable position in the politics and the society of the state. His intimate friends, those whom he loved and honored, were Browning, Butler, Logan, and Stewart, Kentuckians all, and strongly averse to any discussion of the question of slavery. The public opinion of his county, which was then little less than the breath of his life, was all the same way. But all these considerations could not withhold him from performing a simple duty, a duty which no one could have blamed him for leaving undone. The crowning grace of the whole act is in the closing sentence. The difference between these opinions and those contained in the said resolutions is their reason for entering this protest. Reason enough for the Lincolns and the Luthers. He had many years of growth and development before him. There was a long distance to be traversed between the guarded utterances of this protest and the heroic audacity which launched the proclamation of emancipation. But the young man who dared declare, in the prosperous beginnings of his political life, in the midst of a community imbued with slave state superstitions, that he believed the institution of slavery was founded on both injustice and bad policy, attacking thus its moral and material supports, while at the same time recognizing all the constitutional guarantees which protected it, had in him the making of a statesman, and if need be, a martyr. His whole career was to run in the lines marked out by these words, written in the hurry of a closing session, and he was to accomplish few acts in that great history which God reserved for him 
wiser and nobler than this. End of section 8. Recording by Jesse Crisp Sears in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Section 9 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 9, Collapse of the System. Mr. Lincoln had made thus far very little money, nothing more, in fact, than a subsistence of the most modest character. But he had made some warm friends, and this meant much among the early Illinoisans. He had become intimately acquainted at Vandalia with William Butler, who was greatly interested in the removal of the capital to Springfield, and who urged the young legislator to take up his residence at the new seat of government. Lincoln readily fell in with this suggestion, and accompanied his friend home when the legislature adjourned, sharing the lodging of Joshua F. Speed, a young Kentucky merchant, and taking his meals at the house of Mr. Butler for several years. In this way began Mr. Lincoln's residence in Springfield, where he was to remain until called to one of the highest of destinies entrusted to men, and where his ashes were to rest forever in monumental marble. It would have seemed a dreary village to one accustomed to the world, but in a letter written about this time, Lincoln speaks of it as a place where there was a good deal of flourishing about in carriages, a town of some pretentious to elegance. It had a population of 1,500. The county contained nearly 18,000 souls, of whom 78 were free Negroes, 20 registered indentured servants, and 6 slaves. Scarcely a perceptible trace of color, one would say, yet we find in the Springfield paper a leading article beginning with the startling announcement our state is threatened to be overrun with free Negroes. The county was one of the richest in Illinois, possessed of a soil of inexhaustible fertility, and divided to the best advantage between prairie and forest. It was settled early in the history of the state, and the country was held in high esteem by the aborigines. The name of Sangamon is said to mean, in the Potawatomi language, land of plenty. Its citizens were an excellent class of people, a large majority of them from Kentucky, though representatives were not wanting from eastern states, men of education and character. There had been very little of what might be called pioneer life in Springfield. Civilization came in with a reasonably full equipment at the beginning. The Edwardses, in fair-top boots and ruffled shirts, the Ridgelys brought their banking business from Maryland, the Logans and Conklings were good lawyers before they arrived. Another family came from Kentucky, with a cotton manufactory which proved its aristocratic character by never doing any work. With a population like this, the town had, from the beginning, a more settled and orderly type than was usual in the South and West. A glance at the advertising columns of the newspaper will show how much attention to dress was paid in the new capital. Cloths, cassinets, casimirs, velvet, silk, satin, and Marseille vestings, fine calf boots, seal and morocco pumps for gentlemen. And for the sex, which in barbarism dresses less and in civilization dresses more than the male, silks, barrages, crepe lisse, lace veils, thread lace, Tibet shawls, lace handkerchiefs, fine prunella shoes, etc. It is evident that the young politician was confronting a social world more formidably correct than anything he had as yet seen. Governor Ford began some years before this to remark with pleasure the change in the dress of the people of Illinois. The gradual disappearance of leather and linsey woolsey, the hunting knife and the tomahawk, from the garb of men, the deerskin moccasin supplanted by the leather boot and shoe, the leather breeches tied around the ankle replaced by modern pantaloons, and the still greater improvement in the adornment of women, the former bare feet decently shod, and homespun frocks giving way to gowns of calico and silk and the heads tied up in red cotton turbans disappearing in favor of those surmounted by pretty bonnets of silk or straw. We admit that these changes were not unattended with the grumbling ill-will of the pioneer patriarchs. They predicted nothing but ruin to a country that thus forsook the old ways, which were good enough for their fathers. But with the change in dress came other alterations which were all for the better. A growing self-respect among the young, 
an industry and thrift by which they could buy good clothes, a habit of attending religious service where they could show them, a progress in sociability, civility, trade, and morals. The taste for civilization had sometimes a whimsical manifestation. Mr. Stewart said the members of the legislature bitterly complained of the amount of game, venison and grouse of the most delicious quality, which was served them at the taverns in Vandalia. They clamored for bacon. They were starving, they said, for something civilized. There was plenty of civilized nourishment in Springfield. Wheat was fifty cents a bushel, rye thirty-three, corn and oats were twenty-five, potatoes twenty-five, butter was eight cents a pound, and eggs were eight cents a dozen. Pork was two and a half cents a pound. The town was built on the edge of the woods, the north side touching the timber, the south encroaching on the prairie. The richness of the soil was seen in the mud of the streets, black as ink and of an unfathomable depth in time of thaw. There were, of course, no pavements or sidewalks. An attempt at crossings was made by laying down large chunks of wood. The houses were almost all wooden and were disposed in a rectangular blocks. A large square had been left in the middle of town in anticipation of future greatness, and there, when Lincoln began his residence, the work of clearing the ground for the new state house was already going forward. In one of the largest houses looking on the square at the northwest corner, the county court had its office, and other rooms in the building were let to lawyers. One of these was occupied by Stuart and Lincoln, for the friendship formed in the Black Hawk War and strengthened at Vandalia induced Major Stuart to offer a partnership to Captain Lincoln. Footnote. It is not unworthy of notice that in a country where military titles were conferred with ludicrous profusion and borne with absurd complacency, Abraham Lincoln, who had actually been commissioned and had served as captain, never used the designation after he laid down his command. Lincoln did not gain any immediate eminence at the bar. His preliminary studies had been cursory and slight, and Stuart was then too much engrossed in politics to pay the unremitting attention to the law which that jealous mistress requires. He had been a candidate for Congress the year before, and had been defeated by W. L. May. He was a candidate again in 1838, and was elected over so agile an adversary as Stephen Arnold Douglas. His paramount interest in these canvases necessarily prevented him from setting to his junior partner the example which Lincoln so greatly needed, of close and steady devotion to their profession. It was several years later that Lincoln found with Judge Logan the companionship and inspiration which he required, and began to be really a lawyer. During the first year or two, he is principally remembered in Springfield as an excellent talker. The life and soul of the little gatherings about the county offices, a storyteller of the first rank, a good-natured, friendly fellow whom everybody liked and trusted. He relied more upon his influence with a jury than upon his knowledge of law in the few cases he conducted in court his acquaintance with human nature being far more extensive than his legal lore. Lincoln was not yet done with Vandalia, its dinners of game, and its political intrigue. The archives of the state were not removed to Springfield until 1839, and Lincoln remained a member of the legislature by successive re-elections from 1834 to 1842. His campaigns were carried on almost entirely without expense, Joshua Speed told the writers that on one occasion some of the Whigs contributed a purse of two hundred dollars, which Speed handed to Lincoln to pay his personal expenses in the canvas. After the election was over, the successful candidate handed Speed one hundred and ninety-nine dollars and twenty-five cents, with the request that he return it to the subscribers. I did not need the money, he said. I made the canvas on my own horse. My entertainment, being at the houses of friends, cost me nothing and my only outlay was seventy-five cents for a barrel of cider, which some farm hands insisted I should treat them to. He was called down to Vandalia in the summer of 1837 by a special session of the legislature. The magnificent schemes of the foregoing winter required some repairing. The banks throughout the United States had suspended specie payments in the spring, and as the state banks in Illinois were the fiscal agents of the railroads and canals, the governor called upon the lawmakers to revise their own work to legalize the suspension and bring their improvement system within possible bounds. They acted as might have been expected, complied with the former suggestion, but flatly refused to touch their masterpiece. They had been glorifying their work too energetically to destroy it in its infancy. It was said you could recognize a legislator that year in any crowd 
by his automatic repetition of the phrase, thirteen hundred fellow citizens and fifty miles of railroad. There was nothing to be done but to go on with the stupendous folly. Loans were effected with surprising and fatal facility, and before the end of the year, work had begun at many points on the railroad. The whole state was excited to the highest pitch of frenzy and expectation. Money was as plenty as dirt. Industry, instead of being stimulated, actually languished. We exported nothing, says Governor Ford, and everything from abroad was paid for by the borrowed money expended among us. Not only upon the railroads, but on the canal as well, the work was begun on a magnificent scale. Nine millions of dollars were thought to be a mere trifle in view of the colossal sum expected to be realized from the sale of canal lands, 300,000 acres of which had been given by the general government. There were rumors of coming trouble and of an unhealthy condition of the banks, but it was considered disloyal to look too curiously into such matters. One frank patriot who had been sent as one of a committee to examine the bank at Shawneetown, when asked what he found there, replied with winning candor, plenty of good whiskey and sugar to sweeten it. But a year of baleful experience destroyed a great many illusions, and in the election of 1838 the subject of internal improvements was treated with much more reserve by candidates. The debt of the state, issued at a continually increasing discount, had already attained enormous proportions. The delirium of the last few years was ending, and sensible people began to be greatly disquieted. Nevertheless, Mr. Cyrus Edwards boldly made his canvass for governor as a supporter of the system of internal improvements, and his opponent, Thomas Carlin, was careful not to commit himself strongly on the other side. Carlin was elected, and finding that a majority of the legislature was still opposed to any steps backward, he made no demonstration against the system at the first session. Lincoln was a member of this body, and being by that time the unquestioned leader of the Whig minority, was nominated for speaker and came within one vote of an election. The legislature was still stiff-necked and perverse in regard to the system. It refused to modify it in the least, and voted, as if in bravado, another $800,000 to extend it. But this was the last paroxysm of a fever that was burnt out. The market was glutted with Illinois bonds. One banker and one broker after another, to whose hands they had been recklessly confided in New York and London, failed, or made away with the proceeds of sales. The system had utterly failed. There was nothing to do but repeal it, stop work on the visionary roads, and endeavor to invent some means of paying the enormous debt. This work taxed the energies of the legislature in 1839 and for some years after. It was a dismal and disheartening task. Blue Monday had come after these years of intoxication, and a crushing debt rested upon a people who had been deceiving themselves with the fallacy that it would somehow pay itself by acts of the legislature. Many were the schemes devised for meeting these oppressive obligations without unduly taxing the voters. One of them, not especially wiser than the rest, was contributed by Mr. Lincoln. It provided for the issue of bonds for the payment of the interest due by the state, and for the appropriation of a special portion of state taxes to meet the obligations thus incurred. He supported his bill in a perfectly characteristic speech, making no effort to evade his share of the responsibility for the crisis, and submitting his views with diffidence to the approval of the assembly. His plan was not adopted. It was too simple and straightforward, even if it had any other merits, to meet the approval of an assembly intent only upon getting out of the immediate embarrassment by means which might save them future trouble on the stump. There was even an undercurrent of sentiment in favor of repudiation. But the payment of the interest for that year was provided for by an ingenious expedient which shifted upon the fund commissioners the responsibility of deciding what portion of the debt was legal and how much interest was therefore to be paid. Bonds were sold for this purpose at a heavy loss. This session of the legislature was enlivened by a singular contest between the Whigs and Democrats in relation to the state banks. Their suspension of specie payments had been legalized up to the adjournment of the next session of the legislature. They were not now able to resume, and it was held by the Democrats that if the special session adjourned sine die, the charter of the banks would be forfeited, a purpose the party was eager to accomplish. The Whigs, who were defending the banks, wished to prevent the adjournment of the special session until the regular session should begin, during the course of which 
they expected to renew the lease of life now held under sufferance by the banks, in which, it may be here said, they were finally successful. But on one occasion, being in the minority, and having exhausted every other parliamentary means of opposition and delay, and seeing the vote they dreaded imminent, they tried to defeat it by leaving the house in a body, and the doors being locked, a number of them, among whom Lincoln's tall figure was prominent, jumped from the windows of the church where the legislature was then holding its sessions. I think, says Mr. Joseph Gillespie, who was one of those who performed this feat of acrobatic politics, Mr. Lincoln always regretted it, as he deprecated everything that savored of the revolutionary. Two years later, the persecuted banks, harried by the demagogues and swindled by the state, fell with great ruin. The financial misery of the state was complete. Nothing was left of the brilliant schemes of the historic legislature of 1836 but a load of debt which crippled for many years the energy of the people, a few miles of embankments which the grass hastened to cover, and a few abutments which stood for years by the sides of leafy rivers, waiting for their long-delaying bridges and trains. During the winter of 1840-41 occurred the first clash of opinion and principle between Mr. Lincoln and his lifelong adversary, Mr. Douglas. There are those who can see only envy and jealousy in that strong dislike and disapproval with which Mr. Lincoln always regarded his famous rival. But we think that few men have ever lived who were more free from those degrading passions than Abraham Lincoln, and the personal reprobation with which he always visited the public acts of Douglas arose from his sincere conviction that able as Douglas was, and in many respects admirable in character, he was essentially without fixed political morals. They had met for the first time in 1834 at Vandalia, where Douglas was busy in getting the circuit attorneyship away from John J. Hardin. He held it only long enough to secure a nomination to the legislature in 1836. He went there to endeavor to have the capital removed to Jacksonville, where he lived, but he gave up the fight for the purpose of having himself appointed Register of the Land Office at Springfield. He held this place as a means of being nominated for Congress the next year, he was nominated and defeated. In 1840, he was engaged in another scheme to which we will give a moment's attention, as it resulted in giving him a seat on the supreme bench of the state, which he used merely as a perch from which to get into Congress. There had been a difference of opinion in Illinois for some years as to whether the Constitution, which made voters of all white male inhabitants of six months' residence, meant to include aliens in that category. As the aliens were nearly all Democrats, that party insisted on their voting, and the Whigs objected. The best lawyers in the state were Whigs, and so it happened that most of the judges were of that complexion. A case was made up for the decision, and decided adversely to the aliens, who appealed it to the Supreme Court. This case was to come on at the June term in 1840, and the Democratic Council, chief among whom was Mr. Douglas, were in some anxiety, as an unfavorable decision would lose them about 10,000 alien votes in the presidential election in November. In this conjuncture, one Judge Smith of the Supreme Court, an ardent Democrat, willing to enhance his value in the party, communicated to Mr. Douglas two important facts. First, that a majority of the court would certainly decide against the aliens, and secondly, that there was a slight imperfection in the record by which counsel might throw the case over to December term and save the alien vote for Van Buren and the Democratic ticket. This was done, and when legislature came together with its large Democratic majority, Mr. Douglas handed in a bill reforming the judiciary, for they had learned that serviceable word already. The circuit judges were turned out of office, and five new judges were added to the Supreme Court, who were to perform circuit duty also. It is needless to say that Judge Douglas was one of these, and he had contrived also in the course of the discussion to disgrace his friend Smith so thoroughly by quoting his treacherous communication of matters which took place within the court that Smith was no longer a possible rival for political honors. It was useless for the Whigs to try to prevent this degradation of the bench. There was no resource but a protest, and here again Lincoln uttered the voice of the conscience of the party. He was joined on this occasion by Edward D. Baker, footnote, afterward senator from Oregon, and as colonel of the 71st Pennsylvania, called the 1st California, killed at Ball's Bluff. 
and some others who protested against the act because, first, it violates the principles of free government by subjecting the judiciary to the legislature. Second, it is a fatal blow at the independence of the judges and the constitutional terms of their offices. Third, it is a measure not asked for or wished for by the people. Fourth, it will greatly increase the expense of our courts or else greatly diminish their utility. Fifth, it will give our courts a political and partisan character, thereby impairing public confidence in their decisions. Sixth, it will impair our standing with other states and the world. Seventh, it is a party measure for party purposes from which no practical good to the people can possibly arise, but which may be the source of immeasurable evils. The undersigned are well aware that this protest will be altogether unavailing with the majority of this body. The blow has already fallen, and we are compelled to stand by the mournful spectators of the ruin it will cause. It will be easy to ridicule this indignant protest as the angry outcry of beaten partisans. But fortunately we have evidence which cannot be gainsaid from the justice of its sentiments and the wisdom of its predictions. Governor Ford, himself a democratic leader, as able as he was honest, writing seven years after these proceedings, condemned them as wrong and impolitic, and adds, Ever since this reforming measure, the judiciary has been unpopular with democratic majorities. Many and most of the judges have had great personal popularity, so much so as to create complaint of so many of them being elected or appointed to other offices. But the bench itself has been the subject of bitter attacks by every legislature since. It had been soiled by unclean contact and could not be respected as before. End of section 9. Recording by Jesse Crisp Sears in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Section 10 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen L. Moss. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 10. Early Law Practice. During all the years of his service in the legislature, Lincoln was practicing law in Springfield, in the dingy little office at the corner of the square. A youth named Milton Hay, who afterwards became one of the foremost lawyers of the state, had made the acquaintance of Lincoln at the county clerk's office, and proposed to study law with him. He was at once accepted as a pupil, and his days being otherwise employed he gave his nights to reading, and as his vigils were apt to be prolonged he furnished a bedroom adjoining the office, where Lincoln often passed the night with him. Mr. Hay gives this account of the practice of the law in those days. Quote, in forming our ideas of Lincoln's growth and development as a lawyer, we must remember that in those early days litigation was very simple as compared with that of modern times. Population was sparse and society scarcely organized, land was plentiful and employment abundant. There was an utter absence of the abstruse questions and complications which now beset the law. There was no need of that close and searching study into principles and precedents which keeps the modern law student buried in his office. On the contrary, the very character of this simple litigation drew the lawyer into the street and neighborhood, and into close and active intercourse with all the classes of his fellow men. The suits consisted of actions of tort and assumpsit. If a man had a debt not collectible, the current phrase was, I'll take it out of his hide. This would bring on an action for assault and battery. The free comments of the neighbors on the fracas or the character of the parties would be productive of slander suits. A man would for his convenience lay down an irascible neighbor's fence and indolently forget to put it up again, and an action of trespass would grow out of it. The suit would lead to a free fight, and sometimes furnish the bloody incidents for a murder trial. Occupied with this class of business, the half-legal, half-political lawyers were never found plotting in their offices. In that case, they would have waited long for the recognition of their talents or a demand for their services. Out of this characteristic of the times also grew the street discussions I have adverted to. 
There was scarcely a day or hour when a knot of men might not have been seen near the door of some prominent store, or about the steps of the courthouse, eagerly discussing a current political topic, not as a question of news, for news was not then received quickly or frequently, as it is now, but rather for the sake of debate. And the men from the country, the pioneers and farmers, always gathered eagerly about those groups and listened with open-mouthed interest, and frequently manifested their approval or dissent in strong words, and carried away to their neighborhoods a report of the debater's wit and skill. It was in these street talks that the rising and aspiring young lawyer found his daily and hourly forum. Often by good luck or prudence he had the field entirely to himself, and so escaped the dangers and discouragements of a decisive conflict with a trained antagonist. End quote. Mr. Stewart was either in Congress or actively engaged in canvassing his district a great part of the time that his partnership with Lincoln continued, so that the young lawyer was thrown a good deal on his own resources for occupation. There was not enough business to fill up all his hours, and he was not at that time a close student, so that he soon became as famous for his racy talk and good fellowship at all the usual lounging places in Springfield as he had ever been in New Salem. Mr. Hay says, speaking of the youths who made the county clerk's office their place of rendezvous, quote, It was always a great treat when Lincoln got amongst us. We were sure to have some of those stories for which he already had a reputation, and there was this peculiarity about them, that they were not only entertaining in themselves, but always singularly illustrative of some point he wanted to make." After Mr. Hay entered his office, and was busily engaged with his briefs and declarations, the course of their labors was often broken by the older man's wise and witty digressions. Once an interruption occurred which affords an odd illustration of the character of discussion then prevalent. We will give it in Mr. Hay's words. Quote, the custom of public political debate, while it was sharp and acrimonious, also engendered a spirit of equality and fairness. Every political meeting was a free fight open to every one who had the talent and spirit, no matter to which party the speaker belonged. These discussions often used to be held in the courtroom, just under our office, and through a trap-door, made there when the building was used for a storehouse, we could hear everything that was said in the hall below. One night there was a discussion in which E. D. Baker took part. He was a fiery fellow, and when his impulsiveness was let loose among the rough element that composed his audience, there was a fair prospect of trouble at any moment. Lincoln was lying on the bed, apparently paying no attention to what was going on. Lamborn was talking, and we suddenly heard Baker interrupting him with a sharp remark, then a rustling and uproar. Lincoln jumped from the bed and down the trap, lighting on the platform between Baker and the audience, and quieted the tumult as much by the surprise of his sudden apparition as by his good-natured and reasonable words." End quote. He was often unfaithful to his Quaker traditions in those days of his youth. Those who witnessed his wonderful forbearance and self-restraint in later manhood would find it difficult to believe how promptly and with what pleasure he used to resort to measures of repression against a bully or brawler. On the day of election in 1840, word came to him that one Radford, a Democratic contractor, had taken possession of one of the polling places with his workmen and was preventing the Whigs from voting. Lincoln started off at a gate which showed his interest in the matter in hand. He went up to Radford and persuaded him to leave the polls without a moment's delay. One of his candid remarks is remembered and recorded. Quote, Radford, you'll spoil and blow if you live much longer. End quote. Radford's prudence prevented an actual collision, which, it must be confessed, Lincoln regretted. He told his friend Speed he wanted Radford to show fight so that he might, quote, knock him down and leave him kicking, end quote. Early in the year 1840 it seemed possible that the Whigs might elect General Harrison to the presidency, and this hope lent added energy to the party even in the states where the majority was so strongly against them as in Illinois. Lincoln was nominated for president-elector, and threw himself with ardor into the canvass, 
traversing a great part of the state and speaking with remarkable effect. Only one of the speeches he made during the year has been preserved entire. This was an address delivered in Springfield as one of a series, a sort of oratorical tournament participated in by Douglas, Calhoun, Lamborn, and Thomas on the part of the Democrats, and Logan, Baker, Browning, and Lincoln on the part of the Whigs. The discussion began with great enthusiasm and with crowded houses, but by the time it came to Lincoln's duty to close the debate the fickle public had tired of the intellectual jousts, and he spoke to a comparatively thin house. But his speech was considered one of the best of the series, and there was such a demand for it that he wrote it out, and it was printed and circulated in the spring as a campaign document. It was a remarkable speech in many respects, and in none more than in this, that it represented the highest expression of what might be called his, quote, first manner, end quote. It was the most important and the last speech of its class which he ever delivered, not destitute of sound and close reasoning, yet filled with boisterous fun and florid rhetoric. It was, in short, a rattling stump speech of the kind then universally popular in the West, and which is still considered a very high grade of eloquence in the South. But it is of no kindred with his inaugural addresses, and resembles the Gettysburg speech no more than the Comedy of Errors resembles Hamlet. One or two extracts will give some idea of its humorous satire and its lurid fervor. Attacking the corruptions and defalcations of the administration party, he said, quote, Mr. Lamborn insists that the difference between the Van Buren party and the Whigs is that, although the former sometimes err in practice, they are always correct in principle, whereas the latter are wrong in principle, and the better to impress this proposition, he uses a figurative expression in these words, quote, The Democrats are vulnerable in the heel, but they are sound in the heart and head, end quote. The first branch of the figure, that is, the Democrats, are vulnerable in the heel, I admit is not merely figuratively, but literally true. Who that looks but for a moment at their Swartwouts, their Prices, their Harringtons, and their hundreds of others scampering away with the public money to Texas, to Europe, and to every spot of the earth where a villain may hope to find refuge from justice, can at all doubt that they are most distressingly affected in their heels with a species of running itch. It seems that this malady of their heels operates on the sound-headed and honest-hearted creatures, very much as the cork leg in the comic song did on its owner, which, when he once got started on it, the more he tried to stop it, the more it would run away. At the hazard of wearing this point threadbare, I will relate an anecdote which seems to be too strikingly in point to be omitted. A witty Irish soldier, who was always boasting of his bravery when no danger was near, but who invariably retreated without orders at the first charge of the engagement, being asked by his captain why he did so, replied, "'Captain, I have as brave a heart as Julius Caesar ever had, but somehow or other, whenever danger approaches, my cowardly legs will run away with it.' So with Mr. Lamborn's party— they take the public money into their hands for the most laudable purpose that wise heads and honest hearts can dictate, but before they can possibly get it out again, their rascally vulnerable heels will run away with them." Quote. The speech concludes with these swelling words, quote, Mr. Lamborn refers to the late elections in the states, and from their results confidently predicts every state in the Union will vote for Mr. Van Buren at the next presidential election. Address that argument to cowards and slaves. With the free and the brave it will affect nothing. It may be true, if it must, let it. Many free countries have lost their liberty, and ours may lose hers, but if she shall, be it my proudest plume, not that I was the last to desert, but that I never deserted her. I know that the great volcano at Washington, 
aroused and directed by the evil spirit that reigns there, is belching forth the lava of political corruption in a current broad and deep, which is sweeping with frightful velocity over the whole length and breadth of the land, bidding fair to leave unscathed no green spot or living thing while on its bosom are riding like demons on the wave of hell the imps of the evil spirit and fiendishly taunting all those who dare to resist its destroying course with the hopelessness of their efforts and knowing this i cannot deny that all may be swept away broken by it i too may be bow to it i never will the probability that we may fall in the struggle ought not to deter us from the support of a cause we believe to be just. It shall not deter me. If ever I feel the soul within me elevate and expand to those dimensions not wholly unworthy of its almighty architect, it is when I contemplate the cause of my country, deserted by all the world beside, and I standing up boldly alone, hurling defiance at her victorious oppressors. Here, without contemplating consequences before heaven and in face of the world, I swear eternal fealty to the just cause, as I deem it, of the land of my life, my liberty, and my love. And who that thinks with me will not fearlessly adopt the oath that I take? Let none falter who thinks he is right, and we may succeed. But if, after all, we should fail, be it so. We still shall have the proud consolation of saying to our consciences and to the departed shade of our country's freedom that the cause approved of our judgment and adored of our hearts in disaster, in chains, in torture, in death, we never faltered in defending. End quote. These perfervid and musical metaphors of devotion and defiance have often been quoted as Mr. Lincoln's heroic challenge to the slave power, and Bishop Simpson gave them that lofty significance in his funeral oration. But they were simply the utterances of a young and ardent Whig, earnestly advocating the election of old Tippecanoe, and not unwilling, while doing this, to show the people of the capital a specimen of his eloquence. The whole campaign was carried on in a tone somewhat shrill. The Whigs were recovering from the numbness into which they had fallen during the time of Jackson's imperious predominance, and in the new prospect of success they felt all the excitement of prosperous rebels. The taunts of the party in power, when Harrison's nomination was first mentioned, their sneers at hard cider and log cabins, had been dexterously adopted as the slogan of the opposition, and gave rise to the distinguishing features of that extraordinary campaign. Log cabins were built in every western county, tons of hard cider were filled and emptied at all the Whig mass meetings, and as the canvas gained momentum and vehemence, a curious kind of music added its inspiration to the cause, and after the main election was over, with its augury of triumph, every Whig who was able to sing, or even to make a joyful noise, was roaring the inquiry, Oh, have you heard how old Maine went? And the profane but powerfully accented response, She went hell-bent for Governor Kent and Tippecanoe and Tyler too. It was one of the busiest and most enjoyable seasons of Lincoln's life. He had grown by this time thoroughly at home in political controversy, and he had the pleasure of frequently meeting Mr. Douglas in rough-and-tumble debate in various towns of the state as they followed Judge Treat on his circuit. If we may trust the willing testimony of his old associates, Lincoln had no difficulty in holding his own against his adroit antagonist, and it was even thought that the recollection of his ill success in these encounters was not without its influence in inducing Douglas and his followers, defeated in the nation, though victorious in the state, to wreak their vengeance on the Illinois Supreme Court. In Lincoln's letters to Major Stewart, then in Washington, we see how strongly the subject of politics overshadows all others in his mind. Under date of November 14, 1839, he wrote, quote, I have been to the secretary's office within the last hour, and find things precisely as you left them. No new arrivals of returns on either side. Douglas has not been here since you left. 
a report is in circulation here now that he has abandoned the idea of going to washington but the report does not come in very authentic form so far as i can learn though speaking of authenticity you know that if we had heard douglas say that he had abandoned the contest it would not be very authentic there is no news here noah i still think will be elected very easily i am afraid of our race for representative dr knapp has become a candidate and i fear the few votes he will get will be taken from us also some one has been tampering with old squire wickoff and induced him to send in his name to be announced as a candidate francis refused to announce him without seeing him and now i suppose there is to be a fuss about it i have been so busy that i have not seen mrs stuart since you left though i understand she wrote to you by to-day's mail which will inform you more about her than i could the very moment a speaker is elected write me who he is your friend as ever again he wrote on new year's day eighteen forty a letter curiously destitute of any festal suggestions quote, there is a considerable disposition on the part of both parties in the legislature to reinstate the law bringing on the congressional elections next summer what motive for this the locos have i cannot tell the whigs say that the canal and other public works will stop and consequently we shall then be clear of the foreign votes whereas by another year they may be brought in again the whigs of our district say that everything is in favor of holding the election next summer except the fact of your absence and several of them have requested me to ask your opinion on the matter write me immediately what you think of it on the other side of this sheet i send you a copy of my land resolutions which passed both branches of our legislature last winter will you show them to mr calhoun informing him of the fact of their passage through our legislature mr calhoun suggested a similar proposition last winter and perhaps if he finds himself backed by one of the states he may be induced to take it up again after the session opened january twentieth he wrote to mr stuart accurately outlining the work of the winter quote, the following is my guess as to what will be done the internal improvement system will be put down in a lump without benefit of clergy the bank will be resuscitated with some trifling modifications end quote. state affairs have evidently lost their interest however and his soul is in arms for the wider fray quote, be sure to send me as many copies of the life of Harrison as you can spare. Be very sure to send me the Senate Journal of New York for September 1814, end quote. He had seen in a newspaper a charge of disloyalty made against Mr. Van Buren during the war with Great Britain, but as usual wanted to be sure of his facts. And in general, he adds, quote, send me everything you think will be a good war club. The nomination of Harrison takes first rate. You know I am never sanguine, but I believe we will carry the state. The chance for doing so appears to me twenty-five per cent. Better than it did for you to beat Douglas. A great many of the grocery sort of Van Buren men are out for Harrison. Our Irish blacksmith Gregory is for Harrison. You have heard that the Whigs and Locos had a political discussion shortly after the meeting of the legislature. Well, I made a big speech which is in progress of printing in pamphlet form. To enlighten you and the rest of the world, I shall send you a copy when it is finished. End quote. The big speech was the one from which we have just quoted. The sanguine mood continued in his next letter, March 1st. Quote, I have never seen the prospects of our party so bright in these parts as they are now. We shall carry this county by a larger majority than we did in 1836 when you ran against May. I do not think my prospects individually are very flattering, for I think it probable I shall not be permitted to be a candidate, but the party ticket will succeed triumphantly. Subscriptions to the old soldier pour in without abatement. This morning I took from the post office a letter from Dubois, enclosing the names of sixty subscribers, and on carrying it to Francis, footnote Simeon Francis, editor of the Sangamo Journal, and footnote, I found he had received one hundred and forty more from other quarters by the same day's mail. Yesterday Douglas 
having chosen to consider himself insulted by something in the journal, undertook to cane Francis in the street. Francis caught him by the hair and jammed him back against a market cart, where the matter ended by Francis being pulled away from him. The whole affair was so ludicrous that Francis and everybody else, Douglas excepted, have been laughing about it ever since. End quote. Douglas seems to have had a great propensity to such wrong contras, of which the issue was ordinarily his complete discomfiture, as he had the untoward habit of attacking much bigger and stronger men than himself. He weighed at that time little, if anything, over a hundred pounds, yet his heart was so valiant that he made nothing of assaulting men of ponderous flesh like Francis, or of great height and strength like Stuart. He sought a quarrel with the latter, during their canvass in 1838, in a grocery, with the usual result. A bystander who remembers the incident says that Stuart, "'Just mop the floor with him!' In the same letter, Mr. Lincoln gives a long list of names to which he wants documents to be sent. It shows a remarkable personal acquaintance with the minutest needs of the canvass. This one is a doubtful Whig. That one is an inquiring Democrat. That other, a zealous young fellow who would be pleased by the attention. Three brothers are mentioned who, quote, fell out with us about early and are doubtful now, end quote. And finally, he tells Stuart that Joe Smith is an admirer of his, and that a few documents had better be mailed to the Mormons, and he must be sure, the next time he writes, to send Evan Butler his compliments. It would be strange, indeed, if such a politician as this were slighted by his constituents, and in his next letter we find how groundless were his forebodings in that direction. The convention had been held. The rural delegates took all the nominations away from Springfield except two, Baker for the Senate and Lincoln for the House of Representatives. Ninian, he says, meaning Ninian W. Edwards, quote, was very much hurt at not being nominated, but he has become tolerably well reconciled. I was much, very much, wounded myself at his being left out. The fact is, the country delegates made the nominations as they pleased, and they pleased to make them all from the country, except Baker and me, whom they supposed necessary to make stump speeches. Old Colonel Elkin is nominated for sheriff. That's right. End quote. Harrison was elected in November, and the great preoccupation of most of the Whigs was, of course, the distribution of the offices which they felt belonged to them as the spoils of battle. This demoralizing doctrine had been promulgated by Jackson, and acted upon for so many years that it was too much to expect of human nature that the Whigs should not adopt it, partially at least, when their turn came. But we are left in no doubt as to the way in which Lincoln regarded the unseemly scramble. It is probable that he was asked to express his preference among applicants, and he wrote under date of December 17th, quote, This affair of appointments to office is very annoying, more so to you than to me doubtless. I am, as you know, opposed to removals to make places for our friends. Bearing this in mind, I express my preference in a few cases as follows. For Marshall, first. John Dawson, second. B. F. Edwards for postmaster here, Dr. Henry at Carlinville, Joseph C. Howell. End quote. The mention of this last post office rouses his righteous indignation, and he calls for justice upon a wrongdoer. Quote, there is no question of the propriety of removing the postmaster at Carlinville. I have been told by so many different persons as to preclude all doubt of its truth, that he boldly refused to deliver from his office during the canvass all documents franked by Whig members of Congress." Once more, on the 23rd of January, 1841, he addresses a letter to Mr. Stewart which closes the correspondence and which affords a glimpse of that strange condition of melancholia into whose dark shadow he was then entering, and which lasted with only occasional intervals of healthy cheerfulness to the time of his marriage. We give this remarkable letter entire from the manuscript submitted to us by the late John T. Stewart. Dear Stewart, Yours of the third instant is received, 
and I proceed to answer it as well as I can, though from the deplorable state of my mind at this time I fear I shall give you but little satisfaction. About the matter of the congressional election, I can only tell you that there is a bill now before the Senate adopting the general ticket system, but whether the party have fully determined on its adoption is yet uncertain. There is no sign of opposition to you among our friends, and none that I can learn among our enemies, though of course there will be if the general ticket be adopted. The Chicago American, Peoria Register, and Sangamo Journal have already hoisted your flag upon their own responsibility, and the other Whig papers of the district are expected to follow immediately. On last evening there was a meeting of our friends at Butler's, and I submitted the question to them and found them unanimously in favor of having you announced as a candidate. A few of us in the morning, however, concluded that as you were already being announced in the papers, we would delay announcing you as by your authority for a week or two. We thought that to appear too keen about it might spur our opponents on about their general ticket project. Upon the whole, I think I may say with certainty that your re-election is sure, if it be in the power of the Whigs to make it so. For not giving you a general summary of news, you must pardon me. It is not in my power to do so. I am now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on earth. Whether I shall ever be better I cannot tell. I awfully forebode I shall not. To remain as I am is impossible. I must die or be better, it appears to me. The matter you speak of on my account you may attend to, as you say, unless you shall hear of my condition forbidding it. I say this because I fear I shall be unable to attend to any business here, and a change of scene might help me. If I could be myself, I would rather remain at home with Judge Logan. I can write no more. Your friend, as ever, A. Lincoln. End of section 10 Recording by Stephen L. Moss, stephenlmoss.com Section 11 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 11. Marriage. The foregoing letter brings us to the consideration of a remarkable passage in Lincoln's life. It has been the cause of much profane and idle discussion among those who were constitutionally incapacitated from appreciating ideal sufferings, and we would be tempted to refrain from adding a word to what has already been said if it were possible to omit all reference to an experience so important in the development of his character. In the year 1840 he became engaged to be married to Miss Mary Todd of Lexington, Kentucky, a young lady of good education and excellent connections, who was visiting her sister, Mrs. Ninian W. Edwards, at Springfield. Footnote. Mrs. Lincoln was the daughter of the Honorable Robert S. Todd of Kentucky. Her great-uncle John Todd and her grandfather Levi Todd accompanied General George Rogers Clark to Illinois and were present at the capture of Kaskaskia and Vincennes. In December 1778, John Todd was appointed by Patrick Henry, governor of Virginia, to be lieutenant of the county of Illinois, then a part of Virginia. He was killed at the Battle of the Blue Licks in 1782. His brother Levi was also at that battle and was one of the few survivors of it. Colonel Todd was one of the original proprietors of the town of Lexington, Kentucky, while encamped on the site of the present city he heard of the opening battle of the revolution and named his infant settlement in its honor arnold's life of lincoln page sixty eight End footnote. 
the engagement was not in all respects a happy one as both parties doubted their compatibility and a heart so affectionate and a conscience so sensitive as lincoln's found material for exquisite self-torment in these conditions his affection for his betrothed which he thought was not strong enough to make happiness with her secure his doubts which yet were not convincing enough to induce him to break off all relations with her his sense of honor which was wounded in his own eyes by his own act his sense of duty which condemned him in one course and did not sustain him in the opposite one all combined to make him profoundly and passionately miserable to his friends and acquaintances who were unused to such finely wrought and even fantastic sorrows his trouble seemed so exaggerated that they could only account for it on the ground of insanity but there is no necessity of accepting this crude hypothesis the coolest and most judicious of his friends deny that his depression ever went to such an extremity orville h browning who was constantly in his company says that his worst attack lasted only about a week that during this time he was incoherent and distraught but that in the course of a few days it all passed off leaving no trace whatever i think says mr browning it was only an intensification of his constitutional melancholy his trials and embarrassments pressed him down to a lower point than usual side note western characters this taint of constitutional sadness was not peculiar to lincoln it may be said to have been endemic among the early settlers of the west it had its origin partly in the circumstances of their lives the severe and dismal loneliness in which their struggle for existence for the most part went on their summers were passed in the solitude of the woods in the winter they were often snowed up for months in the more desolate isolation of their own poor cabins their subjects of conversation were limited their range of thoughts and ideas narrow and barren there was as little cheerfulness in their manners as there was incentive to it in their lives they occasionally burst out into wild frolic which easily assumed the form of comic outrage but of the sustained cheerfulness of social civilized life they knew very little one of the few pioneers who have written their observations of their own people john l mcconnell says they are at the best not a cheerful race though they sometimes join in festivities it is but seldom and the wildness of their dissipation is too often in proportion to its infrequency there is none of that serene contentment which distinguishes the tillers of the ground in other lands acquainted with the character of the pioneer you do not expect him to smile much but now and then he laughs besides this generic tendency to melancholy very many of the pioneers were subject in early life to malarial influences the effect of which remained with them all their days hewing out their plantations in the primeval woods amid the undisturbed shadow of centuries breaking a soil thick with ages of vegetable decomposition sleeping in half-faced camps where the heavy air of the rank woods was in their lungs all night or in the fouler atmosphere of overcrowded cabins they were especially subject to miasmatic fevers many died and of those who survived a great number after they had outgrown the more immediate manifestations of disease retained in nervous disorders of all kinds the distressing traces of the maladies which afflicted their childhood in the early life of lincoln these unwholesome physical conditions were especially prevalent the country about pigeon creek was literally devastated by the terrible malady called milk sickness which carried away his mother and half her family his father left his home in macon county also on account of the frequency and severity of the attacks of fever and ague which were suffered there and in general abraham was exposed through all the earlier part of his life to those malarial influences which made during the first half of this century the various preparations of peruvian bark a part of the daily food of the people of indiana and illinois in many instances this miasmatic poison did not destroy the strength or materially shorten the lives of those who absorbed it in their youth but the effects remained in periodical attacks of gloom and depression of spirits which would seem incomprehensible to thoroughly healthy organizations and which gradually lessened in middle life 
often to disappear entirely in old age. Side note, Western characters. Upon a temperament thus predisposed to look at things in their darker aspect, it might naturally be expected that a love affair which was not perfectly happy would be productive of great misery. But Lincoln seemed especially chosen to the keenest suffering in such a conjuncture. The pioneer, as a rule, was comparatively free from any troubles of the imagination. To quote Mr. McConnell again, there was no romance in his The Pioneer's Composition. He had no dreaminess. Meditation was no part of his mental habit. A poetical fancy would, in him, have been an indication of insanity. If he reclined at the foot of a tree on a still summer day, it was to sleep. If he gazed out over the waving prairie, it was to search for the column of smoke, which told of his enemy's approach. If he turned his eyes towards the blue heaven, it was to prognosticate tomorrow's rain or sunshine. If he bent his gaze towards the green earth, it was to look for Indian sign or buffalo trail. His wife was only a helpmate. He never thought of making a divinity of her. But Lincoln could never have claimed this happy immunity from ideal trials. His published speeches show how much the poet in him was constantly kept in check, and at this time of his life his imagination was sufficiently alert to inflict upon him the sharpest anguish. His reverence for women was so deep and tender that he thought an injury to one of them was a sin too heinous to be expiated. No Hamlet dreaming amid the turrets of Elsinore, no Sidney creating a chivalrous Arcadia, was fuller of mystic and shadowy fancies of the worth and dignity of woman than this backwoods politician. Few men ever lived more sensitively and delicately tender towards the sex. Besides his stepmother, who was a plain, God-fearing woman, he had not known many others until he came to live in New Salem. There he had made the acquaintance of the best people the settlement contained, and among them had become much attached to a young girl named Anne Rutledge, the daughter of one of the proprietors of the place. She died in her girlhood, and though there does not seem to have been any engagement between them, he was profoundly affected by her death. But the next year a young woman from Kentucky appeared in the village, to whom he paid such attentions as in his opinion fully committed him as a suitor for her hand. He admired her, and she seems to have merited the admiration of all the manhood there was in New Salem. She was handsome and intelligent, and of an admirable temper and disposition. While they were together he was constant in his attentions, and when he was at Vandalia, or at Springfield, he continued his assiduities in some of the most singular love-letters ever written. They are filled mostly with remarks about current politics, and with arguments going to show that she had better not marry him. At the same time, he clearly intimates that he is at her disposition if she is so inclined. At last, feeling that his honor and duty were involved, he made a direct proposal to her, and received an equally direct, kind, and courteous refusal. Not knowing but that this indicated merely a magnanimous desire to give him a chance for escape, he persisted in his offer and she in her refusal. When the matter had ended in this perfectly satisfactory manner to both of them, he sat down and wrote, by way of epilogue to the play, a grotesquely comic account of the whole affair to Mrs. O. H. Browning, one of his intimate Vandalia acquaintances. This letter has been published and severely criticized as showing a lack of gentlemanlike feeling, but those who take this view forget that he was writing to an intimate friend of a matter which had greatly occupied his own mind for a year, that he mentioned no names, and that he threw such an air of humorous unreality about the whole story, that the person who received it never dreamed that it recorded an actual occurrence until twenty-five years afterwards when, having been asked to furnish it to a biographer, she was warned against doing so by the President himself, who said there was too much truth in it for print. The only significance the episode possesses is in showing this almost abnormal development of conscience in the young man, who was perfectly ready to enter into a marriage which he dreaded simply because he thought he had given a young woman reason to think that he had such intentions. While we admit that this would have been an irremediable error, 
we cannot but wonder at the nobleness of the character to which it was possible in this vastly more serious matter which was we may say at once the crucial ordeal of his life the same invincible truthfulness the same innate goodness the same horror of doing a wrong are combined with an exquisite sensibility and a capacity for suffering which mark him as a man picked out among ten thousand his habit of relentless self-searching reveals to him a state of feeling which strikes him with dismay his simple and inflexible veracity communicates his trouble and his misery to the woman whom he loves his freedom when he has gained it yields him nothing but an agony of remorse and humiliation he could not shake off his pain like men of cooler heads and shallower hearts it took fast hold of him and dragged him into awful depths of darkness and torture the letter to stuart which we have given shows him emerging from the blackest period of that time of gloom immediately after this he accompanied his close friend and confidant joshua f speed to kentucky where in a way so singular that no writer of fiction would dare to employ the incident he became almost cured of his melancholy and came back to illinois and his work again mr speed was a kentuckian carrying on a general mercantile business in springfield a brother of the distinguished lawyer james speed of louisville who afterwards became attorney general of the united states he was one of those men who seem to have a greater extent than others the genius of friendship the pythias the pilates the horatios of the world it is hardly too much to say that he was the only as he was certainly the last intimate friend that lincoln ever had he was his closest companion in springfield and in the evil days when the letter to stuart was written he took him with brotherly love and authority under his special care he closed up his affairs in springfield and went with lincoln to kentucky and introducing him to his own cordial and hospitable family circle strove to soothe his perturbed spirit by every means which unaffected friendliness could suggest that Lincoln found much comfort and edification in that genial companionship is shown by the fact that after he became president, he sent to Mr. Speed's mother a photograph of himself, inscribed, For Mrs. Lucy G. Speed, from whose pious hand I accepted the present of an Oxford Bible twenty years ago. But the principal means by which the current of his thoughts was changed was never dreamed of by himself or by his friend when they left Illinois during this visit speed himself fell in love and became engaged to be married and either by a singular chance or because the maladies of the soul may be propagated by constant association the feeling of despairing melancholy which he had found so morbid and so distressing an affliction in another took possession of himself and threw him into the same slough of despondency from which he had been laboring to rescue lincoln between friends so intimate there were no concealments and from the moment lincoln found his services as nurse and consoler needed the violence of his own trouble seemed to diminish the two young men were in springfield together in the autumn and lincoln seems by that time to have laid aside his own peculiar besetments in order to minister to his friend they knew the inmost thoughts of each other's hearts and each relied upon the honesty and loyalty of the other to an extent rare among men when speed returned to kentucky to a happiness which awaited him there so bright that it dazzled and blinded his moral vision lincoln continued his counsels and encouragements in letters which are remarkable for their tenderness and delicacy of thought and expression like another poet he looked into his own heart and wrote his own deeper nature had suffered from these same fantastic sorrows and terrors of his own grief he made a medicine for his comrade while speed was still with him he wrote a long letter which he put into his hands at parting full of wise and affectionate reasonings to be read when he should feel the need of it he predicts for him a period of nervous depression first because he will be exposed to bad weather on his journey and secondly because of the absence of all business and conversation of friends which might divert his mind and give it occasional rest from the intensity of thought which will sometimes wear the sweetest idea threadbare and turn it to the bitterness of death 
the third cause he says is the rapid and near approach of that crisis on which all your thoughts and feelings concentrate if in spite of all these circumstances he should escape without a twinge of the soul his friend will be most happily deceived but he continues if you shall as i expect you will at some time be agonized and distressed let me who have some reason to speak with judgment on the subject beseech you to ascribe it to the causes i have mentioned and not to some false and ruinous suggestion of the devil this forms the prelude to an ingenious and affectionate argument in which he labors to convince speed of the loveliness of his betrothed and of the integrity of his own heart a strange task one would say to undertake in behalf of a young and ardent lover but the two men understood each other and the service thus rendered was gratefully received and remembered by speed all his life lincoln wrote again on the third of february eighteen forty two congratulating speed upon a recent severe illness of his destined bride for the reason that your present distress and anxiety about her health must forever banish those horrid doubts which you feel as to the truth of your affection for her as the period of speed's marriage drew near lincoln's letters betray the most intense anxiety he cannot wait to hear the news from his friend but writes to him about the time of the wedding admitting that he is writing in the dark that words from a bachelor may be worthless to a benedict but still unable to keep silence he hopes he is happy with his wife but should i be mistaken in this should excessive pleasure still be accompanied with a painful counterpart at times still let me urge you as i have ever done to remember in the depth and even agony of despondency that very shortly you are to feel well again further on he says if you went through the ceremony calmly or even with sufficient composure not to excite alarm in any present you are safe beyond question seeking by every device of subtle affection to lift up the heart of his friend with a solicitude apparently greater than that of the nervous bridegroom he awaited the announcement of the marriage and when it came he wrote february twenty five i opened the letter with intense anxiety and trepidation so much that although it turned out better than i expected i have hardly yet at the distance of ten hours become calm i tell you speed our forebodings for which you and i are peculiar are all the worst sort of nonsense i fancied from the time i received your letter of saturday that the one of wednesday was never to come and yet it did come and what is more it is perfectly clear both from its tone and handwriting that you had obviously improved at the very time i had so much fancied you would have grown worse you say that something indescribably horrible and alarming still haunts you you will not say that three months from now i will venture the letter goes on in the same train of sympathetic cheer but there is one phrase which strikes the keynote of all lives whose ideals are too high for fulfilment it is the peculiar misfortune of both you and me to dream dreams of elysium far exceeding all that anything earthly can realize but before long a letter came from speed who had settled with his black-eyed kentucky wife upon a well-stocked plantation disclaiming any further fellowship of misery and announcing the beginnings of that life of uneventful happiness which he led ever after his peace of mind has become a matter of course he dismisses the subject in a line but dilates with a new planter's rapture upon the beauties and attractions of his farm lincoln frankly answers that he cares nothing about his farm i can only say that i am glad you are satisfied and pleased with it but on that other subject to me of the most intense interest whether in joy or sorrow i never had the power to withhold my sympathy from you it cannot be told how it now thrills me with joy to hear you say you are far happier than you ever expected to be i am not going beyond the truth when i tell you that the short space it took me to read your last letter gave me more pleasure than the total sum of all i have enjoyed since the fatal first of january eighteen forty one since then it seems to me i should have been entirely happy but for the never absent idea that there is one still unhappy whom i have contributed to make so that still kills my soul i cannot but reproach myself for even wishing myself to be happy while she is otherwise during the summer of eighteen forty two the letters of the friends still discuss 
with waning intensity, however, their respective affairs of the heart. Speed, in the ease and happiness of his home, thanks Lincoln for his important part in his welfare, and gives him sage counsel for himself. Lincoln replies, July 4th, 1842, I could not have done less than I did. I always was superstitious. I believe God made me one of the instruments of bringing your Fanny and you together, which union I have no doubt he foreordained. Whatever he designs, he will do for me yet. A better name than superstition might properly be applied to this frame of mind. He acknowledges Speed's kindly advice, but says, before I resolve to do the one thing or the other, I must gain my confidence in my own ability to keep my resolves when they are made. In that ability, you know, I once prided myself, as the only or chief gem of my character. That gem I lost, how and where, you know too well. I have not yet regained it, and until I do, I cannot trust myself in any matter of much importance. I believe now that had you understood my case at the time as well as I understood yours afterwards, by the aid you would have given me, I should have sailed through clear. But that does not afford me confidence to begin that, or the like of that, again. Still he was nearing the end of his doubts and self-torturing sophistry. A last glimpse of his imperious curiosity, kept alive by saucy hopes and fears, is seen in his letter to Speed of the 5th of October. He ventures with a genuine timidity to ask a question which we may believe has not often been asked by one civilized man of another, with the hope of a candid answer, since marriages were celebrated with ring and book. I want to ask you a close question. Are you now, in feeling as well as judgment, glad you are married as you are? from anybody but me this would be an impudent question not to be tolerated but i know you will pardon it in me please answer it quickly as i am impatient to know it is probable that mr speed replied promptly in the way in which such questions must almost of necessity be answered on the fourth of november eighteen forty two a marriage license was issued to lincoln and on the same day he was married to miss mary todd the ceremony being performed by the Rev. Charles Dresser. Four sons were the issue of this marriage. Robert Todd, born August 1, 1843. Edward Baker, March 10, 1846. William Wallace, December 21, 1850. Thomas, April 4, 1853. Of these, only the eldest lived to maturity. In this way Abraham Lincoln met and passed through one of the most important crises of his life. There was so much of idiosyncrasy in it that it has been, and will continue to be for years to come, the occasion of endless gossip in Sangamon County and elsewhere, because it was not precisely like the experience of other people, who are married and given in marriage every day without any ado. A dozen conflicting stories have grown up more or less false and injurious to both contracting parties. But it may not be fanciful to suppose that characters like that of Lincoln, elected for great conflicts and trials, are fashioned by different processes from those of ordinary men, and pass their stated ordeals in a different way, by circumstances which seem commonplace enough to commonplace people, he was thrown for more than a year into a sea of perplexities and sufferings beyond the reach of the common run of souls. It is as useless as it would be indelicate to seek to penetrate in detail the incidents and special causes which produced in his mind this darkness as of the valley of the shadow of death. There was probably nothing worth recording in them. We are only concerned with their effect upon a character which was to be hereafter, for all time, one of the possessions of the nation. It is enough for us to know that a great trouble came upon him, and that he bore it nobly after his kind. That the manner in which he confronted this crisis was strangely different from that of most men in similar circumstances need surely occasion no surprise. Neither in this nor in other matters was he shaped in the average mold of his contemporaries. In many respects he was doomed to a certain loneliness of excellence. There are few men that have had his stern and tyrannous sense of duty, his womanly tenderness of heart, his wakeful and inflexible conscience, 
which was so easy towards others and so merciless towards himself therefore when the time came for all of these qualities at once to be put to the most strenuous proof the whole course of his development and the tendency of his nature made it inevitable that his suffering should be of the keenest and his final triumph over himself should be of the most complete and signal character in that struggle his youth of reveries and daydreams passed away such furnace blasts of proof such pangs of transformation seem necessary for exceptional natures the bread eaten in tears of which goethe speaks the sleepless nights of sorrow are required for a clear vision of the celestial powers fortunately the same qualities that occasion the conflict ensure the victory also from days of gloom and depression such as we have been considering no doubt came precious results in the way of sympathy self-restraint and that sober reliance on the final triumph of good over evil peculiar to those who have been greatly tried but not destroyed the late but splendid maturity of lincoln's mind and character dates from this time and although he grew in strength and knowledge to the end from this year we observe a steadiness and sobriety of thought and purpose as discernible in his life as in his style he was like a blade forged in fire and tempered in the ice brook ready for battle whenever the battle might come end of section 11 recording by pamela krantz Section 12 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. By John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 12. The Shields Duel. An incident which occurred during the summer preceding Mr. Lincoln's marriage, and which in the opinion of many had its influence in hastening that event, deserves some attention, if only from its incongruity with the rest of his history. This was the farce, which aspired at one time to be a tragedy, of his first and last duel. Among the officers of the state government was a young Irishman named James Shields, who owed his post as auditor in great measure to that alien vote to gain which the democrats had overturned the supreme court the finances of the state were in a deplorable condition the treasury was empty auditors warrants were selling at half their nominal value no more money was to be borrowed and taxation was dreaded by both political parties more than disgrace the currency of the state banks was well nigh worthless but it constituted nearly the only circulating medium in the state. In the middle of August, the governor, auditor, and treasurer issued a circular forbidding the payment of state taxes in this depreciated paper. This order was naturally taken by the Whigs as indicating on the part of these officers a keener interest in the integrity of their salaries than in the public welfare, and it was therefore severely attacked in all the opposition newspapers of the state. The sharpest assault it had to endure, however, was in a communication dated August 27 and printed in the Sangamo Journal of September 2nd, not only dissecting the administration circular with the most savage satire, but covering the auditor with merciless personal ridicule. It was written in the dialect of the country, dated from the Lost Townships, and signed Rebecca, and purported to come from a farmer widow of the county, who expressed in this fashion her discontent with the evil course of affairs. Shields was a man of inordinate vanity and a corresponding irascibility. He was, for that reason, an irresistible mark for satire. Through a long life of somewhat conspicuous public service, he never lost a certain tone of absurdity, which can only be accounted for by the qualities we have mentioned. Even his honorable wounds in battle, while they were productive of great public applause and political success, gained him scarcely less ridicule than praise. He never could refrain from talking of them himself, having none of Coriolanus's repugnance in that respect, and for that reason was a constant target for newspaper wits. After Shields returned from the Mexican War with his laurels still green, and at the close of the canvass which had made him senator, 
he wrote an incredible letter to Judge Brees, his principal competitor, in which he committed the gratuitous folly of informing him that, quote, he had sworn in his heart, if Brees had been elected, that he should never have profited by his success and depend upon it, unquote. He added, in the amazing impudence of triumph, quote, I would have kept that vow regardless of consequences. That, however, is now passed, and the vow is cancelled by your defeat, unquote. He then went on, with threats equally indecent, to make certain demands which were altogether inadmissible, and which Judge Brees only noticed by sending this preposterous letter to the press. It may easily be imagined that a man who, after being elected a senator of the United States, was capable of the insane insolence of signing his name to a letter informing his defeated competitor that he would have killed him if the result had been different, would not have been likely, when seven years younger, to bear newspaper ridicule with equanimity. His fury against the unknown author of the satire was the subject of much merriment in Springfield, and the next week another letter appeared, from a different hand, but adopting the machinery of the first, in which the widow offered to make up the quarrel by marrying the auditor, and this in time was followed by an epithalamium in which this happy compromise was celebrated in very bad verses. In the change of hands all the humor of the thing had evaporated, and nothing was left but feminine mischief on one side, and the exasperation of wounded vanity on the other. Shields, however, had talked so much about the matter that he now felt imperatively called upon to act, and he therefore sent General Whitesides to demand from the journal the name of its contributor. Mr. Francis, the editor, was in a quandary. Lincoln had written the first letter, and the antic fury of Shields had induced two young ladies who took a lively interest in Illinois politics, and with good reason, for one was to be the wife of a senator and the other of a president, to follow up the game with attacks in prose and verse, which, however deficient in wit and meter, were not wanting in pungency. In his dilemma he applied to Lincoln, who, as he was starting to attend court at Tremont, told him to give his name and withhold the names of the ladies. As soon as Whitesides received this information, he and his fiery principal set out for Tremont, and as Shields did nothing in silence, the news came to Lincoln's friends, two of whom, William Butler and Dr. Merriman, one of those combative medical men who have almost disappeared from American society, went off in a buggy in pursuit. They soon came in sight of the others, but loitered in the rear until evening, and then drove rapidly to Tremont, arriving there some time in advance of Shields, so that in the ensuing negotiations Abraham Lincoln had the assistance of friends whose fidelity and whose nerve were equally beyond question. It would be useless to recount all the tedious preliminaries of the affair. Shields opened the correspondence, as might have been expected, with blustering and with threats. His nature had no other way of expressing itself. His first letter was taken as a bar to any explanation or understanding, and he afterwards wrote a second, a little less offensive in tone, but without withdrawing the first. At every interview of the seconds, General Whitesides deplored the bloodthirsty disposition of his principal, and urged that Mr. Lincoln should make the concessions which alone would prevent lamentable results. These representations seemed to avail nothing, however, and the parties, after endless talk, went to Alton and crossed the river to the Missouri shore. It seemed for a moment that the fight must take place. The terms had been left by the code, as then understood in the West, to Lincoln, and he certainly made no grudging use of his privilege. The weapons chosen were cavalry broadswords of the largest size, and the combatants were to stand on either side of a board placed on the ground, each to fight in a limit of six feet on his own side of the board. It was evident that Lincoln did not desire the death of his adversary, and did not intend to be materially injured himself. The advantage, morally, was altogether against him. He felt intensely the stupidity of the whole affair, but thought he could not avoid the fight without degradation, while to Shields such a fracas was a delight. The duel came to its natural end by the intervention of the usual gods out of a machine, the gods being John J. Hardin and one Dr. English, 
and the machine a canoe in which they had hastily paddled across the Mississippi. Shields suffered himself to be persuaded to withdraw his offensive challenge. Lincoln then made the explanation he had been ready to make from the beginning, avowing the one letter he had written, and saying that it had been printed solely for political effect and without any intention of injuring Shields personally. One would think that, after a week passed in such unprofitable trifling, the parties, uh, principal and secondary, would have been willing to drop the matter forever. We are sure that Lincoln would have been glad to banish it, even from his memory. But to men like Shields and Whitesides, the peculiar relish and enjoyment of such an affair is its publicity. On the 3rd of October, therefore, eleven days after the meeting, as public attention seemed to be flagging, Whitesides wrote an account of it to the Sangamo Journal, for which he did not forget to say, quote, I hold myself responsible. Of course he seized the occasion to paint a heroic portrait of himself and his principal. It was an excellent story until the next week, when Dr. Merriman, who seems to have wielded a pen like a scalpel, gave a much fuller history of the matter, which he substantiated by printing all the documents, and not content with that gave little details of the negotiations which show either that Whitesides was one of the most grotesque braggarts of the time, or that Merriman was an admirable writer of comic fiction. Among the most amusing facts he brought forward was that Whitesides, being a fund commissioner of the state, ran the risk of losing his office by engaging in a duel, and his anxiety to appear reckless and dangerous, and yet keep within the statute and save his salary, was depicted by Merriman with a droll fidelity. He concluded by charging Whitesides plainly with, quote, inefficiency and want of knowledge of those laws which govern gentlemen in matters of this kind, unquote, and with, quote, trying to wipe out his fault by doing an act of injustice to Mr. Lincoln, unquote. The town was greatly diverted by these pungent echoes of the bloodless fight, and Shields and Whitesides felt that their honor was still out of repair. A rapid series of challenges succeeded among the parties, principals and seconds changing places as deftly as dancers in a quadrille. The auditor challenged Mr. Butler, who had been very outspoken in his contemptuous comments on the affair. Butler at once accepted, and with a grim sincerity announced his conditions. Quote, to fight next morning at sunrising in Bob Allen's meadow, one hundred yards distant, with rifles. Unquote. This was instantly declined, with a sort of horror, by Shields and Whitesides, as such a proceeding would have proved fatal to their official positions and their means of livelihood. They probably cared less for the chances of harm from Butler's Kentucky rifle than for the certainty of the Illinois law which cut off all duelists from holding office in the state. But on the other hand, so unreasonable is human nature as displayed among politicians, General Whitesides felt that if he bore patiently the winged words of Merriman, his availability as a candidate was greatly damaged, and he therefore sent to the witty doctor what Mr. Lincoln called a quasi-challenge, hurling at him a modified defiance, which should be enough to lure him to the field of honor, and yet not sufficiently explicit to lose Whitesides the dignity and perquisites of fund commissioner. Merriman, not being an office holder and having no salary to risk, responded with brutal directness, which was highly unsatisfactory to Whitesides, who was determined not to fight unless he could do so lawfully, and Lincoln, who now acted as second to the doctor in his turn, records the cessation of the correspondence amid the agonized explanations of Whitesides and the scornful hootings of Merriman. Quote, while the town was in a ferment and a street fight somewhat anticipated, unquote. In respect to the last diversion, the town was disappointed. Shields lost nothing by the hilarity which this burlesque incident created. He was reserved for a career of singular luck and glory mingled with signal misfortunes. On account of his political availability, he continued throughout a long lifetime to be selected at intervals for high positions. After he ceased to be auditor, he was elected judge of the Supreme Court of Illinois. While still holding that position, he applied for the place of commissioner of the General Land Office, and his application was successful. When the Mexican War broke out, he asked for a commission as brigadier general. 
although he still held his civil appointment, and, to the amazement of the whole army, he was given that important command before he had ever seen a day's service. At the Battle of Cerro Gordo he was shot through the lungs, and this wound made him a United States senator as soon as he returned from the war. After he had served one term in the Senate, he removed from Illinois, and was soon sent back to the same body from Minnesota. In the War of the Rebellion, he was again appointed a brigadier general by his old adversary, and was again wounded in a battle in which his troops defeated the redoubtable Stonewall Jackson. And many years after Lincoln was laid to sleep beneath the mountain of marble in Springfield, Shields was made the shuttlecock of contending demagogues in Congress, each striving to make a point by voting him money, until in the impulse of that transient controversy, the state of Missouri, finding the gray-headed soldier in her borders, for the third time sent him to the Senate of the United States for a few weeks, a history unparalleled, even in America. We have reason to think that the affair of the duel was excessively distasteful to Lincoln. He did not even enjoy the ludicrousness of it, as might have been expected. He, he never, so far as we can learn, alluded to it afterwards, and the recollection of it died away so completely from the minds of people in the state that during the heated canvass of 1860 there was no mention of this disagreeable episode in the opposition papers of Illinois. It had been absolutely forgotten. This was Mr. Lincoln's last personal quarrel. Although the rest of his life was passed in hot and earnest debate, he never again descended to the level of his adversaries, who would gladly enough have resorted to unseemly wrangling. In later years it became his duty to give an official reprimand to a young officer who had been court-martialed for a quarrel with one of his associates. The reprimand is probably the gentlest recorded in the annals of penal discourses, and it shows in few words the principles which ruled the conduct of this great and peaceable man. It has never before been published, and it deserves to be written in letters of gold on the walls of every gymnasium and college. The Advice of a Father to His Son Quote, Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear it that the opposed may be beware of thee, Unquote. is good, but not the best quarrel not at all. No man resolved to make the most of himself can spare time for personal contention. Still less can he afford to take all the consequences, including the vitiating of his temper and the loss of self-control. Yield larger things to which you can show no more than equal right, and yield lesser ones, though clearly your own. Better give your path to a dog than be bitten by him in contesting for the right." Even killing the dog would not cure the bite. Footnote Lincoln's life was unusually free from personal disputes. We know of only one other hostile letter addressed to him. This was from W. G. Anderson, who, being worsted in a verbal encounter with Lincoln at Lawrenceville, the county seat of Lawrence County, Illinois, wrote him a note demanding an explanation of his words and of his present feelings. Lincoln's reply shows that his habitual peaceableness involved no lack of dignity. He said, quote, Your note of yesterday is received. In the difficulty between us of which you speak, you say you think I was the aggressor. I do not think I was. You say my words imported insult. I meant them as a fair set-off to your own statements, and not otherwise. And in that light alone I now wish you to understand them. You ask for my present feelings on the subject. I entertain no unkind feeling to you, and none of any sort upon the subject, except a sincere regret that I permitted myself to get into any such altercation. End of quote. This seems to have ended the matter, although the apology was made rather to himself than to Mr. Anderson. See the letter of William C. Wilkinson in the Century Magazine for January 1889. End of section 12. Section 13 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 13, The Campaign of 1844. In the letter to Stewart, which we have quoted, Lincoln announced his intention to form a partnership with Judge Logan, which was soon carried out. His connection with Stewart was formally dissolved in April 1841, and one with Logan formed, which continued for four years. It may almost be said that Lincoln's practice as a lawyer begins from this time. Stewart, though even then giving promise of the distinction at which he arrived in his profession later in life, was at that period so entirely devoted to politics that the business of the office was altogether a secondary matter to him, and Lincoln, although no longer in his first youth, being then thirty-two years of age, had not yet formed those habits of close application which are indispensable to permanent success at the bar. He was not behind the greater part of his contemporaries in this respect. Among all the lawyers of the circuit who were then, or who afterwards became eminent practitioners, footnote, they were Dan Stone, Jesse B. Thomas, Cyrus Walker, Schuyler Strong, Albert T. Bledsoe, George Forquer, Samuel H. Treat, Ninian W. Edwards, Josiah Lamborn, John J. Hardin, Edward D. Baker, and others. There were few indeed who in those days applied themselves with any degree of persistency to the close study of legal principles. One of these few was Stephen T. Logan. He was more or less a politician, as were all his compeers at the bar, but he was always more a lawyer than anything else. He had that love for his profession which it jealously exacts as a condition of succeeding. He possessed few books, and it used to be said of him long afterwards that he carried his library in his hat. But the books which he had he never ceased to read and ponder, and we heard him say when he was sixty years old that once every year since he came of age he had read Blackstone's commentaries through. He had that old-fashioned lawyer-like morality which was keenly intolerant of any laxity or slovenliness of mind or character. His former partner had been Edward D. Baker, but this brilliant and mercurial spirit was not congenial to Logan. Baker's carelessness in money matters was intolerable to him, and he was glad to escape from an associate so gifted and so exasperating. Footnote. Logan's office was, in fact, a nursery of statesmen. Three of his partners, William L. May, Baker, and Lincoln, left him in rapid succession to go to Congress, and finally the contagion gained the head of the firm, and the judge was himself the candidate of his party when it was no longer able to elect one. After he had retired from practice, the office, under his son-in-law and successor, Milton Hay, retained its prestige for cradling public men. John M. Palmer and Shelby M. Cullum left it to be governors of the state, and the latter to be a congressman and senator. Needing someone, however, to assist him in his practice, which was then considerable, he invited Lincoln into partnership. He had, as we have seen, formed a favorable opinion of the young Kentuckian the first time they had met. In his subsequent acquaintance with him, he had come to recognize and respect his abilities, his unpretending common sense, and his innate integrity. The partnership continued about four years, but the benefit Lincoln derived from it lasted all his life. The example of Judge Logan's thrift, order, and severity of morals, his straightforward devotion to his profession, his close and careful study of his cases, together with the larger and more important range of practice to which Lincoln was introduced by this new association, confirmed all those salutary tendencies by which he had been led into the profession, and corrected those less desirable ones which he shared with most of the lawyers about him. He began for the first time to study his cases with energy and patience, to resist the tendency almost universal at that day to supply with florid rhetoric the attorney's deficiency in law. In short, to educate, discipline, and train the enormous faculty hitherto latent in him for close and severe intellectual labor. Logan, who had expected that Lincoln's chief value to him would be as a talking advocate before juries, was surprised and pleased to find his new partner rapidly becoming a lawyer. 
he would study out his case and make about it as much of it as anybody, said Logan many years later. His ambition as a lawyer increased. He grew constantly. By close study of each case as it came up, he got to be quite a formidable lawyer. The character of the man is in these words. He had vast concerns entrusted to him in the course of his life, and disposed of them one at a time as they were presented. At the end of four years, the partnership was dissolved. Judge Logan took his son, David, afterwards a well-known politician and lawyer of Oregon, into his office, and Lincoln opened one of his own, into which he soon invited a young, bright, and enthusiastic man named William Henry Herndon, who remained his partner as long as Lincoln lived. The old partners continued close and intimate friends. They practiced at the same bar for twenty years, often as associates, and often as adversaries, but always with relations of mutual confidence and regard. They had the unusual honor, while they were still comparatively young men, of seeing their names indissolubly associated in the map of their state as a memorial to future ages of their friendship and their fame in the county of Logan, in which the city of Lincoln is the county seat. They both prospered, each in his way. Logan rapidly gained a great reputation and accumulated an ample fortune. Lincoln, while he did not become rich, always earned a respectable livelihood, and never knew the care of poverty or debt from that time forward. His wife and he suited their style of living to their means, and were equally removed from luxury and privation. They went to live immediately after their marriage at a boarding house. Footnote, this house is still standing opposite St. Paul's Church, called the Globe, which was, quote, very well kept by a widow lady of the name of Beck, unquote. And there their first child was born, who was one day to be Secretary of War and Minister to England, and for whom was reserved the strange experience of standing by the deathbed of two assassinated presidents. Lincoln afterwards built a comfortable house of wood on the corner of 8th and Jackson Streets, where he lived until he removed to the White House. Neither his marriage nor his new professional interest, however, put an end to his participation in politics. Even that period of gloom and depression of which we have spoken, and which has been so much exaggerated by the chroniclers and the gossip of Springfield, could not have interrupted for any length of time his activity as a member of the legislature. Only for a few days was he absent from his place in the House. On the 19th of January, 1841, John J. Hardin apologized for the delay in some committee business, alleging Mr. Lincoln's indisposition as an excuse. On the 23rd, the letter to Stuart was written, but on the 26th, Lincoln had so far recovered his self-possession as to resume his place in the House and the leadership of his party. The journals of the next month show his constant activity and prominence in the routine business of the legislature until it adjourned. In August, Stuart was re-elected to Congress. Lincoln made his visit to Kentucky with speed, and returned to find himself generally talked of for governor of the state. This idea did not commend itself to the judgment of himself or his friends, and accordingly we find in the Sangamo Journal, one of those semi-official announcements so much in vogue in early Western politics, which, while disclaiming any direct inspiration from Mr. Lincoln, expressed the gratitude of his friends for the movement in his favor, but declined the nomination. Quote, his talents and services endear him to the Whig party, but we do not believe he desires the nomination. He has already made great sacrifices in maintaining his party principles, and before his political friends ask him to make additional sacrifices, the subject should be well considered. The office of governor, which would of necessity interfere with the practice of his profession, would poorly compensate him for the loss of four of the best years of his life. End of quote. He served this year as a member of the Whig Central Committee, and bore a prominent part in the movement set on foot at that time to check intemperance in the use of spirits. It was a movement in the name and memory of Washington, and the orators of the cause made effective rhetorical use of its august associations. A passage from the close of a speech made by Lincoln on February 22, 1842, shows the fervor and feeling of the hour. Quote, Washington is the mightiest name of earth. 
long since mightiest in the cause of civil liberty, still mightiest in moral reformation. On that name no eulogy is expected. It cannot be. To add brightness to the sun or glory to the name of Washington is alike impossible. Let none attempt it. In solemn awe pronounce the name, and in its naked, deathless splendor leave it shining on. End of quote. A mass meeting of the Whigs of the district was held at Springfield on the 1st of March, 1843, for the purpose of organizing the party for the elections of the year. On the occasion, Lincoln was the most prominent figure. He called the meeting to order, stated its object, and drew up the platform of principles which embraced the orthodox Whig tenants of a protective tariff, national bank, the distribution of the proceeds of the public lands, and finally the tardy conversion of the party to the convention system which had been forced upon them by the example of the Democrats, who had shown them that victory could not be organized without it. Lincoln was also chairman of the committee which was charged with the address to the people, and a paragraph from this document is worth quoting as showing the use which he made at that early day of a pregnant text which was hereafter to figure in a far more momentous connection and exercise a powerful influence upon his career. Exhorting the Whigs to harmony, he says, quote, That union is strength is a truth that has been known, illustrated, and declared in various ways and forms in all ages of the world. That great fabulist and philosopher, Aesop, illustrated it by his fable of the bundle of sticks, and he whose wisdom surpasses that of all philosophers has declared that a house divided against itself cannot stand. End of quote. He calls to mind the victory of 1840, the overwhelming majority gained by the Whigs that year, their ill success since, and the necessity of unity and concord that the party may make its entire strength felt. Lincoln was at this time a candidate for the Whig nomination to Congress, but he was confronted by formidable competition. The adjoining county of Morgan was warmly devoted to one of its own citizens, John J. Hardin a man of unusually gallant and chivalrous strain of character, and several other counties, for reasons not worth considering, were pledged to support any one whom Morgan County presented. If Lincoln had carried Sangamon County, his strength was so great in Menard and Mason, where he was personally known, that he could have been easily nominated. But Edward D. Baker had long coveted a seat in Congress, and went into the contest against Lincoln with many points in his favor. He was of about the same age, but had resided longer in the district, had a larger personal acquaintance, and was a much readier and more pleasing speaker. In fact, there were few men who have ever lived in this country with more of the peculiar temperament of the orator than Edward Dickinson Baker. It is related of him that on one occasion, when the circumstances called for a policy of reserve, he was urged by his friends to go out upon a balcony and address an impromptu audience which was calling for him. No, he replied, mistrusting his own fluency. If I go out there, I will make a better speech than I want to. He was hardly capable of the severe study and care by which great parliamentary speakers are trained, but before a popular audience, and on all occasions where brilliant and effective improvisation is called for, he was almost unequaled. His funeral oration over the dead body of Senator Broderick in California his thrilling and inspiring appeal in Union Square, New York, at the great meeting of April 1861, and his reply to Breckinridge in the Senate, delivered upon the impulse of the moment, conceived as he listened to the Kentuckians' peroration, leaning against the doorway of the chamber in full uniform, booted and spurred, as he had ridden into Washington from the camp, are among the most remarkable specimens of absolutely unstudied and thrilling eloquence which our annals contain. He was also a man of extremely prepossessing appearance. Born in England, of poor yet educated parents, and brought as a child to this country, his good looks and brightness had early attracted the attention of prominent gentlemen in Illinois, especially of Governor Edwards, who had made much of him and assisted him to a good education. He had met with considerable success as a lawyer, though he always relied rather upon his eloquence than his law and there were few juries which could resist the force and fury of his speech, and not many lawyers could keep their equanimity in the face of his witty persiflage and savage sarcasm. 
when to all this is added a genuine love of every species of combat, physical and moral, we may understand the name Charles Sumner, paraphrasing a well-known epigram, applied to him in the Senate after his heroic death at Ball's Bluff. The Prince Rupert of Battle and Debate If Baker had relied upon his own unquestionable merits, he would have been reasonably sure of succeeding in a community so well acquainted with him as Sangamon County. But to make assurance doubly sure, his friends resorted to tactics which Lincoln, the most magnanimous and placable of men, thought rather unfair. Baker and his wife belonged to that numerous and powerful sect which has several times played an important part in Western politics, the Disciples. They all supported him energetically and used as arguments against Lincoln that his wife was a Presbyterian, that most of her family were Episcopalians, that Lincoln himself belonged to no church, and that he had been suspected of deism, and finally that he was the candidate of the aristocracy. This last charge so amazed Lincoln that he was unable to frame any satisfactory answer to it. The memory of his flat-boating days, of his illiterate youth, even of his deerskin breeches, shrunken by rain and exposure, appeared to have no power against this unexpected and baleful charge. When the county convention met, the delegates to the district convention were instructed to cast the vote of Sangamon for Baker. It showed the confidence of the convention in the imperturbable good nature of the defeated candidate that they elected him a delegate to the Congressional Convention, charged with the cause of his successful rival. In a letter to Speed, he humorously refers to his situation as that of a rejected suitor who is asked to act as groomsman at the wedding of his sweetheart. It soon became evident that Baker could not get strength enough outside of the county to nominate him. Lincoln, in a letter to Speed, written in May, said, quote, In relation to our Congress matter here, you were right in supposing I would support the nominee. Neither Baker nor I, however, is the man, but Hardin, so far as I can judge from present appearances. We shall have no split or trouble about the matter. All will be harmony. End of quote. A few days later, this prediction was realized. The convention met at Pekin and nominated Hardin with all the customary symptoms of spontaneous enthusiasm. He was elected in August. Footnote. The opposing candidate was James A. McDougall, who was afterwards, as senator from California, one of the most remarkable and eccentric figures in Washington life. After a short but active canvass, in which Lincoln bore his part as usual, Hardin took his seat in December. The next year the time of holding elections was changed, and always afterwards the candidates were elected the year before vacancies were to occur. In May 1844, therefore, Baker attained the desire of his heart by being nominated, and in August he was elected, defeating John Calhoun, while Lincoln had the laborious and honorable post of presidential elector. It was not the first time nor the last time that he acted in this capacity. The place had become his by a sort of prescription, his persuasive and convincing oratory was thought so useful to his party that every four years he was sent, in the character of electoral canvasser, to the remotest regions of the state to talk to the people in their own dialect, with their own habits of thought and feeling, in favor of the Whig candidate. The office had its especial charm for him. If beaten, as generally happened, the defeat had no personal significance. If elected, the functions of the place were discharged in one day, and the office passed from existence. But there was something more than the orator and the partisan concerned in the campaign of 1844. The whole heart of the man was enlisted in it, for the candidate was the beloved and idolized leader of the Whigs, Henry Clay. It is probable that we shall never see again in this country another such instance of the personal devotion of a party to its chieftain as that which was shown by the long and wonderful career of Mr. Clay. He became prominent in the politics of Kentucky near the close of the last century, at twenty-three years of age. He was elected first to the Senate at twenty-nine. He died a senator at seventy-five, and for the greater part of that long interval he was the most considerable personal influence in American politics. As senator, representative, speaker of the House, and diplomatist, he filled the public eye for half a century, and although he twice peremptorily retired from office, 
and although he was the mark of the most furious partisan hatred all his days, neither his own weariness nor the malice of his enemies could ever keep him for any length of time from the commanding position for which his temperament and his nature designed him. He was beloved, respected, and served by his adherents with a single-hearted allegiance which seems impossible to the more complex life of a later generation. In 1844, it is true, he was no longer young, and his power may be said to have been on the decline, but there were circumstances connected with this, his last candidacy, which excited his faithful followers to a peculiar intensity of devotion. He had been, as many thought, unjustly passed over in 1840, and General Harrison, a man of greatly inferior capacity, had been preferred to him on the grounds of prudence and expediency. After three days of balloting had shown that the eloquent Kentuckian had more friends and more enemies than any other man in the Republic. He had seemed to regain all his popularity by the prompt and frank support which he gave to the candidacy of Harrison and after the president's death and the treachery of Tyler had turned the victory of the Whigs into dust and ashes, the entire party came back to Clay with passionate affection and confidence to lead them in the desperate battle which perhaps no man could have won. The Whigs, however, were far from appreciating this. There is evident in all their utterances of the spring and early summer of 1844 an ardent and almost furious conviction not only of the necessity but the certainty of success. Mr. Clay was nominated long before the convention met in Baltimore. The convention of the 1st of May only ratified the popular will. No other name was mentioned. Mr. Watkins Lee had the honor of presenting his name. A word, he said, that expressed more enthusiasm, that had in it more eloquence, than the names of Chatham, Burke, Patrick Henry, and he continued, rising to the requirements of the occasion, to us more than any other and all other names together. Nothing was left to be said, and Clay was nominated without a ballot. Mr. Lumpkin of Georgia then nominated Theodore Frelinghausen for vice president, not hesitating to avow in the warmth and expansion of the hour that he believed that the baptismal name of the New Jersey gentleman had a mystical appropriateness to the occasion. In the Democratic Convention, Mr. Van Buren had a majority of delegates pledged to support him, but it had already been resolved in the inner councils of the party that he should be defeated. The Southern leaders had determined upon the immediate and unconditional annexation of Texas, and Mr. Van Buren's views upon this vital question were too moderate and conservative to suit the adventurous spirits who most closely surrounded President Tyler. During the whole of the preceding year, a steady and earnest propaganda of annexation had been on foot, starting from the immediate entourage of the President and embracing a large number of Southern congressmen. A letter had been elicited from General Jackson, declaring with his usual vehemence in favor of the project, and urging it upon the ground that Texas was absolutely necessary to us as the most easily defensible frontier against Great Britain. Using the favorite argument of the Southerners of his school, he said, quote, Great Britain has already made treaties with Texas, and we know that far-seeing nation never omits a circumstance in her extensive intercourse with the world which can be turned to account in increasing her military resources. May she not enter into an alliance with Texas, and reserving, as she doubtless will, the northwestern boundary question as the cause of war with us whenever she chooses to declare it, let us suppose that, as an ally with Texas, we are to fight her. Preparatory to such a movement, she sends her 20,000 or 30,000 men to Texas, organizes them on the Sabine, where supplies and arms can be concentrated before we have even notice of their intentions, makes a lodgment on the Mississippi, excites the Negroes to insurrection, the lower country falls, with it New Orleans, and a servile war rages throughout the whole South, and west." Unquote. Footnote. This letter was dated at the Hermitage near Nashville, Tennessee, February 13, 1843, and was printed a year later in the National Intelligencer, with the date altered to 1844. These fanciful prophecies of evil were privately circulated for a year among those whom they would be most likely to influence, and the entire letter was printed in 1844, with a result never intended by the writer. 
it contributed greatly, in the opinion of many, to defeat Van Buren, whom Jackson held in great esteem and regard, and served the purposes of the Tyler faction whom he detested. The argument, based on imaginary British intrigues, was the one most relied upon by Mr. Tyler's successive secretaries of state. John C. Calhoun, in his dispatch of the 12th of August, 1844, instructed our minister in Paris to impress upon the government of France the nefarious character of the English diplomacy, which was seeking, by defeating the annexation of Texas, to accomplish the abolition of slavery, first in that region and afterwards throughout the United States. Quote, a blow calamitous to the continent beyond description, end quote. No denials on the part of the British government had any effect. It was a fixed idea of Calhoun and his followers that the designs of Great Britain against American slavery could only be baffled by the annexation of Texas. Van Buren was not in principle opposed to the admission of Texas into the Union at the proper time and with the proper conditions, but the more ardent Democrats of the South were unwilling to listen to any conditions or any suggestion of delay. They succeeded in inducing the convention to adopt the two-thirds rule after a whole day of stormy debate, and the defeat of Van Buren was secured. The nomination of Mr. Polk was received without enthusiasm, and the exultant hopes of the Whigs were correspondingly increased. Contemporary observers differ as to the causes which gradually, as the summer advanced, changed the course of public opinion to such an extent as to bring defeat in November upon a party which was so sure of victory in June. It has been the habit of the anti-slavery Whigs, who have written upon the subject, to ascribe the disaster to an indiscretion of the candidate himself. At the outset of the campaign, Mr. Clay's avowed opinion as to the annexation of Texas was that of the vast majority of his party, especially in the North. While not opposing an increase of territory under all circumstances, he said, in a letter written from Raleigh, North Carolina, two weeks before his nomination, quote, I consider the annexation of Texas at this time without the consent of Mexico as a measure compromising the national character, involving us certainly in war with Mexico, probably with other foreign powers, dangerous to the integrity of the Union, inexpedient in the present financial condition of the country, and not called for by any expression of public opinion. End of quote. He supported these views with temperate and judicious reasons, which were received with much gratification throughout the country. Of course, they were not satisfactory to everyone, and Mr. Clay became so disquieted by letters of inquiry and of criticism from the South that he was at last moved in an unfortunate hour to write another letter to a friend in Alabama, which was regarded as seriously modifying the views he had expressed in the letter from Raleigh. He now said, quote, I have no hesitation in saying that, far from having any personal objections to the annexation of Texas, I should be glad to see it, without dishonor, without war, with the common consent of the Union, and upon fair and just terms. I do not think the subject of slavery ought to affect the question one way or the other, whether Texas be independent or incorporated in the United States. I do not believe it will prolong or shorten the duration of that institution. It is destined to become extinct at some distant day, in my opinion, by the operation of the inevitable laws of population. It would be unwise to refuse a permanent acquisition, which will exist as long as the globe remains, on account of a temporary institution. End of quote. Mr. Clay does not in this letter disclaim or disavow any sentiments previously expressed. He says, as anyone might say, that provided certain impossible conditions were complied with, he would be glad to see Texas in the Union, and that he was so sure of the ultimate extinction of slavery that he would not let any consideration of that transitory system interfere with a great national advantage. It might naturally have been expected that such an expression would have given less offense to the opponents than to the friends of slavery, but the contrary effect resulted and it soon became evident that a grave error of judgment had been committed in writing the letter. The principal opposition to annexation in the North had been made expressly upon the ground that it would increase the area of slavery, and the comparative indifferences with which Mr. Clay treated that view of the subject cost him heavily in the canvas. Horace Greeley, who should be regarded as an impartial witness in such a case, says, quote, 
the Liberty Party, so called, pushed this view of the matter beyond all justice and reason, insisting that Mr. Clay's antagonism to annexation, not being founded in anti-slavery conviction, was of no account whatever, and that his election should on that ground be opposed. End of quote. It availed nothing that Mr. Clay, alarmed at the defection in the North, wrote a third and final letter reiterating his unaltered objections to any such annexation as was at that time possible. The damage was irretrievable. It was not possible that his letters gained or saved him a vote in the South among the advocates of annexation. They cared for nothing short of their own unconditional scheme of immediate action. They forgot the services rendered by Mr. Clay in bringing about the recognition of Texan independence a few years before. They saw that Mr. Polk was ready to risk everything, war, international complications, even the dishonor of broken obligations, to accomplish their purpose, and nothing the Whig candidate could say would weigh anything in the balance against this blind and reckless readiness. On the other hand, Mr. Clay's cautious and moderate position did him irreparable harm among the ardent opponents of slavery. They were not willing to listen to counsels of caution and moderation. More than a year before, thirteen of the Whig anti-slavery congressmen, headed by the illustrious John Quincy Adams, had issued a fervid address to the people of the free states, declaiming in language of passionate force against the scheme of annexation as fatal to the country, calling it, in fact, identical with dissolution, and saying that, quote, it would be a violation of our national compact, its objects, designs, and the great elementary principles which entered into its formation of a character so deep and fundamental, and would be an attempt to eternize an institution and a power of nature so unjust in themselves, so injurious to the interests and abhorrent to the feelings of the people of the free states, as in our opinion, not only inevitably to result in a dissolution of the Union, but fully to justify it. And we not only assert that the people of the free states ought not to submit to it, but we say with confidence that they would not submit to it. End of quote. To men in a temper like that indicated by these words, no arguments drawn from consideration of political expediency could be expected to have any weight. And it was of no use to say to them that in voting for a third candidate they were voting to elect Mr. Polk, the avowed and eager advocate of annexation. If all the votes cast for James G. Burney, the Liberty candidate, had been cast for Clay, he would have been elected, and even as it was, the contest was close and doubtful to the last. Burney received 62,263 votes, and the popular majority of Polk over Clay was only 38,792. There are certain temptations that no government yet instituted has been able to resist. When an object is ardently desired by the majority, when it is practicable, when it is expedient for the material welfare of the country, and when the cost of it will fall upon other people, it may be taken for granted that in the present condition of international ethics, the partisans of the project will never lack means of defending its morality. The annexation of Texas was one of these cases. Moralists called it an inexcusable national crime, conceived by southern statesmen for the benefit of slavery. Footnote. This purpose was avowed by John C. Calhoun in the Senate, May 23, 1836. See also his speech of February 24, 1847. Carried on during a term of years with unexampled energy, truculence, and treachery in both houses of Congress, in the cabinets of two presidents, in diplomatic dealings with foreign powers, every step of its progress marked by false professions, by broken pledges, by a steady degradation of moral fiber among all those engaged in the scheme. The opposition to it, as usually happens, consisted partly in the natural effort of partisans to baffle their opponents, and partly in an honorable protest of heart and conscience against a great wrong committed in the interest of a national sin. But looking back upon the whole transaction, even over so short a distance as now separates us from it, one cannot but perceive that the attitude of the two parties was in some sort inevitable, and that the result was also sure, whatever the subordinate events or incidents which may have led to it. It was impossible to defeat or greatly to delay the annexation of Texas, and although those who opposed it but obeyed the dictates of common morality, they were fighting a battle beyond ordinary human powers. 
here was a great empire offering itself to us a state which had gained its independence and built itself into a certain measure of order and thrift through american valor and enterprise she offered us a magnificent estate of three hundred seventy six thousand square miles of territory all of it valuable and much of it of unsurpassed richness and fertility even those portions of it once condemned as desert now contribute to the markets of the world vast stores of wool and cotton herds of cattle and flocks of sheep not only were these material advantages of great attractiveness to the public mind but many powerful sentimental considerations reinforced the claim of texas the texans were not an alien people the few inhabitants of that vast realm were mostly americans who had occupied and subdued a vacant wilderness the heroic defense of the alamo had been made by travis bowie and david crockett whose exploits and death form one of the most brilliant pages of our border history fannin and his men four hundred strong when they laid down their lives at goliad had carried mourning into every southwestern state and when a few days later samuel houston and his eight hundred raw levies defeated and destroyed the mexican army at san jacinto captured santa anna the mexican president and with american thrift instead of giving him the death he merited for his cruel murder of unarmed prisoners saved him to make a treaty with the whole people recognized something of kinship in the unaffected valor with which these borderers died and the humorous shrewdness with which they bargained and felt as if the victory over the mexicans were their own the schemes of the southern statesmen who were working for the extension of slavery were not defensible and we have no disposition to defend them but it may be doubted whether there is a government on the face of the earth which under similar circumstances would not have yielded to the same temptation under these conditions the annexation sooner or later was inevitable no man and no party could oppose it except at serious cost it is not true that schemes of annexation are always popular several administrations have lost heavily by proposing them grant failed with santo domingo seward with st thomas and it required all his skill and influence to accomplish the ratification of the alaska purchase there is no general desire among americans for acquiring outlying territory however intrinsically valuable it may be their land hunger is confined within the limits of that of a western farmer once quoted by mr lincoln who used to say i am not greedy about land i only want what joins mine whenever a region contiguous to the united states becomes filled with americans it is absolutely certain to come under the american flag texas was as sure to be incorporated into the union as two drops of water touching each other to become one and this consummation would not have been prevented for any length of time if clay or van buren had been elected in eighteen forty four the honorable scruples of the whigs the sensitive consciences of the liberty men could never have prevailed permanently against a tendency so natural and so irresistible everything that year seemed to work against the whigs at a most unfortunate time for them there was an outbreak of that native fanaticism which reappears from time to time in our politics with the periodicity of malarial fevers and always to the profit of the party against which its efforts are aimed it led to great disturbances in several cities and to riot and bloodshed in philadelphia the clay party were of course free from any complicity with these outrages but the foreigners in their alarm huddled together almost as one man on the side where the majority of them always voted and this occasioned a heavy loss to the whigs in several states the first appearance of lincoln in the canvass was in a judicious attempt to check this unreasonable panic at a meeting held in springfield june twelfth he introduced and supported resolutions declaring that quote, the guarantee of the rights of conscience as found in our constitution is most sacred and inviolable and one that belongs no less to the catholic than the protestant and that all attempts to abridge or interfere with these rights either of catholic or protestant directly or indirectly have our decided disapprobation and shall have our most effective opposition End of quote several times afterwards in his life lincoln was forced to confront this same proscriptive spirit among the men with whom he was more or less affiliated politically and he never failed to denounce it as it deserved whatever might be the risk of loss involved 
Beginning with this manly protest against intolerance and disorder, he went into the work of the campaign and continued in it with unabated ardor to the end. The defeat of Clay affected him, as it did thousands of others, as a great public calamity and a keen personal sorrow. It is impossible to mistake the accent of sincere mourning which we find in the journals of the time. The addresses which were sent to Mr. Clay from every part of the country indicate a depth of affectionate devotion which rarely falls to the lot of a political chieftain. An extract from the one sent by the Clay Clubs of New York will show the earnest attachment and pride with which the young men of that day still declared their loyalty to their beloved leader, even in the midst of irreparable disaster. Quote, we will remember you, Henry Clay, while the memory of the glorious or the sense of the good remains in us, with a grateful and admiring affection which shall strengthen with our strength and shall not decay with our decline. We will remember you in all our future trials and reverses as him whose name honored defeat and gave it a glory which victory could not have brought. We will remember you when patriotic hope rallies again to successful contest with the agencies of corruption and ruin. For we will never know a triumph which you do not share in life, whose glory does not accrue to you in death. End of quote. Footnote. This massacre inspired one of the most remarkable poems of Walt Whitman. Now I tell you what I knew of Texas in my early youth, in which occurs his description of the rangers. They were the glory of the race of rangers, matchless with horse, rifle, song, supper, courtship, large, turbulent, generous, handsome, proud, and affectionate, bearded, sunburnt, dressed in the free costume of hunters, not a single one over thirty years of age. End of section 13. Section 14 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John Nicolay and John G. Hay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Stephen L. Moss, StephenLMoss.com Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John Nicolay and John G. Hay, Section 14, Campaign for Congress. In the months that remained of his term, after the election of his successor, President Tyler pursued with much vigor his purpose of accomplishing the annexation of Texas, regarding it as the measure which was specially to illustrate his administration and to preserve it from oblivion. The state of affairs, when Congress came together in December 1844, was propitious to the project. Dr. Anson Jones had been elected as President of Texas. The Republic was in a more thriving condition than ever before. Its population was rapidly increasing under the stimulus of its probable change of flag. Its budget presented a less unwholesome balance. Its relations with Mexico, while they were no more friendly, had ceased to excite alarm. The Tyler government, having been baffled in the spring by the rejection of the treaty for annexation which they had submitted to the Senate, chose to proceed this winter in a different way. Early in the season a joint resolution providing for annexation was introduced in the House of Representatives, which after considerable discussion and attempted amendment by the anti-slavery members, passed the House by a majority of twenty-two votes. In the Senate it encountered more opposition, as might have been expected in a chamber which had overwhelmingly rejected the same scheme only a few months before. It was at last amended by inserting a section called the Walker Amendment, providing that the President, if it were in his judgment advisable, should proceed by way of negotiation, instead of submitting the resolutions as an overture on the part of the United States to Texas. This amendment eased the conscience of a few shy supporters of the administration, 
who had committed themselves very strongly against the scheme, and saved them from the shame of open tergiversation. The President, however, treated this subterfuge with the contempt which it deserved, by utterly disregarding the Walker Amendment, and by dispatching a messenger to Texas, to bring about the annexation on the basis of the resolutions, the moment he had signed them, when only a few hours of his official existence remained. The measures initiated by Tyler were, of course, carried out by Polk. The work was pushed forward with equal zeal at Washington and at Austin. A convention of Texans was called for the 4th of July to consider the American propositions. They were promptly accepted and ratified, and in the last days of 1845 Texas was formally admitted into the Union as a state. Besides the general objections which the anti-slavery men of the North had to the project itself, there was something especially offensive to them in the pretense of fairness and compromise held out by the resolutions committing the government to annexation. The third section provided that four new states might hereafter be formed out of the territory of Texas, that such states as were formed out of the portion lying south of 36 degrees 30 minutes, the Missouri Compromise Line, might be admitted with or without slavery, as the people might desire, and that slavery should be prohibited in such states as might be formed out of the portion lying north of that line. The opponents of slavery regarded this provision, with good reason, as derisive. Slavery already existed in the entire territory by the act of the early settlers from the South who had brought their slaves with them, and the state of Texas had no valid claim to an inch of ground north of the line of 36 degrees 30 minutes nor anywhere near it, so that this clause, if it had any force whatever, would have authorized the establishment of slavery in a portion of New Mexico where it did not exist, and where it had been expressly prohibited by the Mexican law. Another serious objection was that the resolutions were taken as committing the United States to the adoption and maintenance of the Rio Grande del Norte as the western boundary of Texas. All mention of this was avoided in the instrument, and it was expressly stated that the state was to be formed, quote, subject to the adjustment by this government of all questions of boundary that may arise with other governments, unquote. But the moment the resolutions were passed, the government assumed, as a matter beyond dispute, that all of the territory east of the Rio Grande was the rightful property of Texas, to be defended by the military power of the United States. Even if Mexico had been inclined to submit to the annexation of Texas, it was nevertheless certain that the occupation of the left bank of the Rio Grande, without an attempt at an understanding, would bring about a collision. The country lying between the Nueces and the Rio Grande was then entirely uninhabited, and was thought uninhabitable, though subsequent years have shown the fallacy of that belief. The occupation of the country extended no farther than the Nueces, and the Mexican farmers cultivated their corn and cotton in peace in the fertile fields opposite Matamoras. It is true that Texas claimed the eastern bank of the Rio Grande from its source to its mouth and while the Texans held Santa Ana prisoner under duress of arms and the stronger pressure of his own conscience, which assured him that he deserved death as a murderer, quote, he solemnly sanctioned, acknowledged, and ratified, unquote, their independence with whatever boundaries they chose to claim. But the Bustamante administration lost no time in repudiating this treaty, and at once renewed the war, which had been carried on in a fitful way ever since. But leaving out of view this special subject of admitted dispute, the Mexican government had warned our own in sufficiently formal terms that annexation could not be peacefully effected. When A. P. Upshur first began his negotiations with Texas, the Mexican Minister of Foreign Affairs, at his earliest rumors of what was afoot, addressed a note to Waddy Thompson, our minister in Mexico, referring to the reported intention of Texas to seek admission to the Union, and formally protesting against it as, quote, an aggression unprecedented in the annals of the world, end quote, 
and adding, quote, If it be indispensable for the Mexican nation to seek security for its rights at the expense of the disasters of war, it will call upon God and rely on its own efforts for the defense of its just cause. End quote. A little while later, General Almonte renewed this notification at Washington, saying, in so many words, that the annexation of Texas would terminate his mission and that Mexico would declare war as soon as it received intimation of such an act. In June 1845, Mr. Donelson, in charge of the American legation in Mexico, assured the Secretary of State that war was inevitable, though he adopted the fiction of Mr. Calhoun, that it was the result of the abolitionist intrigues of Great Britain, which he credited with the intention, quote, of depriving both Texas and the United States of all claim to the country between the Nueces and the Rio Grande. End quote. No one, therefore, doubted that war would follow, and it soon came. General Zachary Taylor had been sent during the summer to Corpus Christi, where a considerable portion of the small army of the United States was placed under his command. It was generally understood to be the desire of the administration that hostilities should begin without orders, by a species of spontaneous combustion, but the coolness and prudence of General Taylor made futile any such hopes, if they were entertained, and it required a positive order to induce him, in March 1846, to advance towards the Rio Grande and to cross the disputed territory. He arrived at a point opposite Matamoras on the 28th of March, and immediately fortified himself, disregarding the summons of the Mexican commander, who warned him that such an action would be considered as a declaration of war. In May, General Arista crossed the river and attacked General Taylor on the field of Palo Alto, where Taylor won the first of that remarkable series of victories, embracing Resaca de la Palma, Monterey, and Buena Vista, all gained over superior forces of the enemy, which made the American commander for the brief day that was left him the idol alike of soldiers and voters. After Baker's election in 1844, it was generally taken as a matter of course in the district that Lincoln was to be the next candidate of the Whig Party for Congress. It was charged at the time, and some recent writers have repeated the charge, that there was a bargain made in 1840 between Hardin, Baker, Lincoln, and Logan to succeed each other in the order named. This sort of fiction is the commonest known to American politics. Something like it is told, and more or less believed, in half the districts in the country at every election. It arises naturally from the fact that there are always more candidates than places, that any one who is a candidate twice is felt to be defrauding his neighbors, and that all candidates are too ready to assure their constituents that they only want one term, and too ready to forget these assurances when their terms are ending. There is not only no evidence of any such bargain among the men we have mentioned, but there is the clearest proof of the contrary. Two or more of them were candidates for the nomination at every election from the time when Stuart retired until the Whigs lost the district. At the same time, it is not to be denied that there was a tacit understanding among the Whigs of the district that whoever should, at each election, gain the honor of representing the one Whig constituency in the state, should hold himself satisfied with the privilege and not be a candidate for re-election. The retiring member was not always convinced of the propriety of this arrangement. In the early part of January 1846, Hardin was the only one whose name was mentioned in opposition to Lincoln. He was reasonably sure of his own county, and he tried to induce Lincoln to consent to an arrangement that all candidates should confine themselves to their own counties in the canvas. But Lincoln, who was very strong in the outlying counties of the district, declined the proposition, alleging, as a reason for refusing, that Hardin was so much better known than he, by reason of his service in Congress, that such a stipulation would give him a great advantage. There was fully as much courtesy as candor in this plea, and Lincoln's entire letter was extremely politic and civil. I have always been in the habit, he says, of acceding to almost any proposal that a friend would make, and I am truly sorry that I cannot to this. <laughs> 
A month later, Hardin saw that his candidacy was useless, and he published a card withdrawing from the contest, which was printed and commended in the kindest terms by papers friendly to Lincoln, and the two men remained on terms of cordial friendship. It is not to be said that Lincoln relied entirely upon his own merits and the sentiment of the constituents to procure him this nomination. Like other politicians of the time, he used all proper means to attain his object. A package of letters, written during the preliminary canvass, which have recently come into our hands, show how intelligent and how straightforward he was in the ways of politics. He had no fear of Baker. All his efforts were directed to making so strong a show of force as to warn Hardin off the field. He countenanced no attack upon his competitor. He approved a movement not entirely disinterested, looking to his nomination for governor. He kept up an extensive correspondence with the captains of tens throughout the district. He suggested and revised the utterances of country editors. He kept his friends aware of his wishes as to conventions and delegates. He was never overconfident. So late as the middle of January, he did not share the belief of his supporters that he was to be nominated without a contest. Hardin, he wrote, is a man of desperate energy and perseverance, and one that never backs out, and, I fear, to think otherwise is to be deceived. I would rejoice to be spared the labor of a contest, but being in, I shall go it thoroughly. His knowledge of the district was curiously minute, though he underestimated his own popularity. He wrote, As to my being able to make a break in the lower counties, I can possibly get Cass, but I do not think I will. Morgan and Scott are beyond my reach. Menard is safe to me. Mason, neck and neck. Logan is mine. To make the matter sure, your entire senatorial district must be secured. Of this I suppose Tazewell is safe, and I have much done in both the other counties. In Woodford I have Davenport, Sims, Willard, Bracon, Perry, Travis, Dr. Hazard and the Clarks, and some others, all specially committed. At Lakin, in Marshall, the very most active friend I have in the district, if I accept yourself, is at work. Through him I have procured the names, and written to three or four of the most active Whigs in each precinct of the county. Still, I wish you all in Tazewell to keep your eyes continually on Woodford and Marshall. Let no opportunity of making a mark escape. When they shall be safe, all will be safe, I think. His constitutional caution suggests those final words. He did not relax his vigilance for a moment until after Hardin withdrew. He warned his correspondents day by day of every move on the board, advised his supporters at every point, and kept every wire in perfect working order. The convention was held at Petersburg on the 1st of May. Judge Logan placed the name of Lincoln before it, and he was nominated unanimously. The Springfield Journal, giving the news the week after, said, This nomination was of course anticipated, there being no other candidate in the field. Mr. Lincoln, we all know, is a good Whig, a good man, an able speaker, and richly deserves, as he enjoys, the confidence of the Whigs of this district and of the state. The Democrats gave Mr. Lincoln a singular competitor, the famous Methodist preacher, Peter Cartwright. It was not the first time they had met in the field of politics. When Lincoln ran for the legislature on his return from the Black Hawk War in 1832, one of the successful candidates of that year was this indefatigable circuit rider. He was now over sixty years of age, in the height of his popularity, and in all respects an adversary not to be despised. His career as a preacher began at the beginning of the century and continued for seventy years. He was the son of one of the pioneers of the West, and grew up in the rudest regions of the borderland between Tennessee and Kentucky. He represents himself, with the usual inverted pride of a class leader, as having been a wild, vicious youth but the catalogue of his crimes embraces nothing less venial than card-playing, horse-racing, and dancing, 
and it is hard to see what different amusements could have been found in southern Kentucky in 1801. This course of dissipation did not continue long, as he was, quote, converted and united with the Ebenezer Methodist Episcopal Church, end quote, in June of that year, when only sixteen years old, and immediately developed such zeal and power in exhortation that less than a year later he was licensed, quote, to exercise his gifts as an exhorter so long as his practice is agreeable to the gospel, end quote. He became a deacon at twenty-one, an elder at twenty-three, a presiding elder at twenty-seven, and from that time his life is the history of his church in the West for sixty years. He died in 1872, eighty-seven years of age, having baptized twelve thousand persons and preached fifteen thousand sermons. He was, and will always remain, the type of the backwoods preacher. Even in his lifetime the simple story of his life became so overgrown with a network of fable that there is little resemblance between the simple, courageous, prejudiced itinerant of his autobiography and the fighting, brawling, half-civilized, Protestant friar tuck of barroom newspaper legend. It is true that he did not always discard the weapons of the flesh in his combats with the ungodly, and he felt more than once compelled to leave the pulpit to do carnal execution upon the disturbers of the peace of the sanctuary. But two or three incidents of this sort in three-quarters of a century do not turn a parson into a pugilist. He was a fluent, self-confident speaker who, after the habit of his time, addressed his discourses more to the emotions than to the reason of his hearers. His system of future rewards and punishments was of the most simple and concrete character, and formed the staple of his sermons. He had no patience with the refinements and reticences of modern theology, and in his later years observed with scorn and sorrow the progress of education and scholarly training in his own communion. After listening one day to a prayer from a young minister which shone more by its correctness than its unction, he could not refrain from saying, Brother, three prayers like that would freeze hell over, a consummation which did not commend itself to him as desirable. He often visited the cities of the Atlantic coast, but saw little in them to admire. His chief pleasure on his return was to sit in a circle of his friends and pour out the files of his sarcasm upon all the refinements of life that he had witnessed in New York or Philadelphia, which he believed, or affected to believe, were tenanted by a species of beings altogether inferior to the manhood that filled the cabins of Kentucky and Illinois. An apocryphal story of one of these visits was often told of him, which pleased him so that he never contradicted it that becoming bewildered in the vastness of a new york hotel he procured a hatchet and in pioneer fashion blazed his way along the mahogany staircases and painted corridors from the office to his room with all his eccentricities he was a devout man conscientious and brave he lived in domestic peace and honor all his days and dying he and his wife whom he had married almost in childhood left a posterity of one hundred and twenty-nine direct descendants to mourn them. Footnote. The impressive manner of Mrs. Cartwright's death, who survived her husband a few years, is remembered in the churches of Sangamon County. She was attending a religious meeting at Bethel Chapel, a mile from her house. She was called upon to give her testimony, which she did with much feeling, concluding with the words, The past three weeks have been the happiest of all my life. I am waiting for the chariot. When the meeting broke up, she did not rise with the rest. The minister solemnly said, The chariot has arrived. From Early Settlers of Sangamon County by John Carroll Power End footnote. With all his devotion to the cause of his church, Peter Cartwright was an ardent Jackson politician with probably a larger acquaintance throughout the district than any other man in it, and with a personal following which, beginning with his own children and grandchildren, and extending through every precinct, made it no holiday task to defeat him in a popular contest. But Lincoln and his friends went energetically into the canvas, and before it closed, 
he was able to foresee a certain victory. An incident is related to show how accurately Lincoln could calculate political results in advance, a faculty which remained with him all his life. A friend who was a Democrat had come to him early in the canvass, and had told him he wanted to see him elected, but did not like to vote against his party. Still, he would vote for him if the contest was to be so close that every vote was needed. A short time before the election, Lincoln said to him, I have got the preacher, and I don't want your vote. The election was held in August, and the Whig candidate's majority was very large, 1,511 in the district, where Clay's majority had been only 914, and where Taylor's, two years later, with all the glamour of victory about him, was ten less. Lincoln's majority in Sangamon County was 690, which, in view of the standing of his competitor, was the most remarkable proof which could be given of his personal popularity. Footnote. Stewart's majority over May in 1836 in Sangamon County was 543. Stewart's majority over Douglas in 1838 in Sangamon County was 295. Stewart's majority over Ralston in 1840 in Sangamon County was 575. Hardin's majority over McDougal in 1843 in Sangamon County was 504. Baker's majority over Calhoun in 1844 in Sangamon County was 373. Lincoln's majority over Cartwright in 1846 in Sangamon County was 690. Logan's majority over Harris in 1848 in Sangamon County was 263. Yates's majority over Harris in 1850 in Sangamon County was 336. End footnote. It was the highest majority ever given to any candidate in the county during the entire period of Whig ascendancy until Yates's triumphant campaign of 1852. This large vote was all the more noteworthy because the Whigs were this year upon the unpopular side. The annexation of Texas was generally approved throughout the West, and those who opposed it were regarded as rather lacking in patriotism, even before actual hostilities began. But when General Taylor and General Ampudia confronted each other with hostile guns across the Rio Grande, and still more after the brilliant feat of arms by which the Americans opened the war on the plain of Palo Alto, it required a good deal of moral courage on the part of the candidates and voters alike to continue their attitude of disapproval of the policy of the government, at the same time that they were shouting paeans over the exploits of our soldiers. They were assisted, it is true, by the fact that the leading Whigs of the state volunteered with the utmost alacrity and promptitude in the military service. On the 11th of May, Congress authorized the raising of 50,000 volunteers, and as soon as the intelligence reached Illinois, the daring and restless spirit of Hardin leaped forward to the fate which was awaiting him, and he instantly issued a call to his brigade of militia in which he said, The General has already enrolled himself as the first volunteer from Illinois under the requisition. He is going whenever ordered. Who will go with him? He confidently expects to be accompanied by many of his brigade. The quota assigned to Illinois was three regiments. These were quickly raised. Footnote. The colonels were Hardin, Bissell, and Foreman. End footnote and an additional regiment offered by Baker was then accepted. The sons of the prominent Whigs enlisted as private soldiers. David Logan was a sergeant in Baker's regiment. A public meeting was held in Springfield on the 29th of May, at which Mr. Lincoln delivered what was considered a thrilling and effective speech on the condition of affairs, and the duty of citizens to stand by the flag of the nation until an honorable peace was secured. It was thought probable, and would have been altogether fitting, that either Colonel Hardin, Colonel Baker, or Colonel Bissell, all of them men of intelligence and distinction, should be appointed general of the Illinois Brigade, but the Polk administration was not inclined to waste so important a place upon men who might thereafter have views of their own in public affairs. 
The coveted appointment was given to a man already loaded to a grotesque degree with political employment, Mr. Lincoln's old adversary, James Shields. He had left the position of Auditor of State to assume a seat on the bench. Retiring from this, he had just been appointed Commissioner of the General Land Office. He had no military experience, and so far as then known, no capacity for the service, but his fervid partisanship commended him to Mr. Polk as a safe servant, and he received the commission to the surprise and derision of the State. His bravery in action and his honorable wounds at Cerro Gordo and Chapultepec saved him from contempt and made his political fortune. He had received the recommendation of the Illinois Democrats in Congress, and it is altogether probable that he owed his appointment in great measure to the influence of Douglas, who desired to have as few Democratic statesmen as possible in Springfield that winter. A senator was to be elected, and Shields had acquired such a habit of taking all the offices that fell vacant that it was only prudent to remove him as far as convenient from such a temptation. The election was held in December, and Douglas was promoted from the House of Representatives to that seat in the Senate which he held with such ability and distinction for the rest of his life. The session of 1846-7 to opened with the Sangamon District of Illinois unrepresented in Congress. Baker had gone with his regiment to Mexico. It did not have the good fortune to participate in any of the earlier actions of the campaign, and his fiery spirit chafed in the enforced idleness of camp and garrison. He seized an occasion which was offered to him to go to Washington as bearer of dispatches, and while there he made one of those sudden and dramatic appearances in the capital which were so much in harmony with his tastes and his character. He went to his place on the floor, and there delivered a bright, interesting speech in his most attractive vein, calling attention to the needs of the army, disavowing on the part of the Whigs any responsibility for the war or its conduct, and adroitly claiming for them a full share of the credit for its prosecution. He began by thanking the House for its kindness in allowing him the floor, protesting at the same time that he had done nothing to deserve such courtesy. I could wish, he said, that it had been the fortune of the gallant Davis, footnote, Jefferson Davis, who was with the army in Mexico, and footnote, to now stand where I do, and to receive from gentlemen on all sides the congratulations so justly due to him, and to listen to the praises of his brave compeers. For myself, I have unfortunately been left far in the rear of the war, and if now I venture to say a word in behalf of those who have endured the severest hardships of the struggle, whether in the blood-stained streets of Monterey, or yet in a sterner form on the banks of the Rio Grande, I beg you to believe that while I feel this a most pleasant duty, it is in other respects a duty full of pain, for I stand here, after six months' service as a volunteer, having seen no actual warfare in the field. Yet even this disadvantage he turned with great dexterity to his service. He reproached Congress for its apathy and inaction in not providing for the wants of the army by reinforcements and supplies. He flattered the troops in the field, and paid a touching tribute to those who had died of disease and exposure, without ever enjoying the sight of a battlefield, and, rising to lyric enthusiasm, he repeated a poem of his own, which he had written in camp, to the memory of the dead of the Fourth Illinois. Footnote. We give a copy of these lines, not on account of their intrinsic merit, but as illustrating the versatility of the lawyer, orator, and soldier who wrote them. Where rolls the rushing Rio Grande, how peacefully they sleep, far from their native land, far from the friends who weep. No rolling drums disturb their rest, Beneath the sandy sod, the mold lies heavy on each breast, the spirit is with God. They heard their country's call and came to battle for the right, each bosom filled with martial flame and kindling for the fight. Light was their measured footsteps when they moved to seek the foe, alas that hearts so fiery then should soon be cold and low.
End footnote. He could not refrain from giving his own party all the credit which could be claimed for it, and it is not difficult to imagine how exasperating it must have been to the majority to hear so calm an assumption of the superior patriotism on the part of the opposition as the following, quote, As a Whig I still occupy a place on this floor, nor do I think it worth while to reply to such a charge as that the Whigs are not friends of their country because many of them doubt the justice or expediency of the present war. Surely there was all the more evidence of the patriotism of the man who, doubting the expediency and even the entire justice of the war, nevertheless supported it, because it was the war of his country. In the one it might be mere enthusiasm and an impetuous temperament. In the other it was true patriotism, a sense of duty. Homer represents Hector as strongly doubting the expediency of the war against Greece. He gave his advice against it. He had no sympathy with Paris, whom he bitterly reproached, much less with Helen. Yet when the war came, and the Grecian forces were marshaled on the plain, and their crooked keels were seen cutting the sands of the Trojan coast, Hector was a flaming fire. His beaming helmet was seen in the thickest of the fight. They did not die in eager strife upon a well-fought field nor from the red wound poured their life where cowering foemen yield. Death's ghastly shade was slowly cast upon each manly brow, but calm and fearless to the last they sleep securely now. Yet shall a grateful country give her honors to their name. In kindred hearts their memory live, and history guard their fame. Not unremembered do they sleep upon a foreign strand. Though near their graves thy wild waves sweep, O rushing Rio Grande. There are in the American army many who have the spirit of Hector, who strongly doubt the propriety of the war, and especially the manner of its commencement, who yet are ready to pour out their heart's best blood like water, and their lives with it, on a foreign shore, in defense of the American flag and American glory. End quote. Immediately after making this speech, Baker increased the favorable impression created by it by resigning his seat in Congress and hurrying as fast as steam could carry him to New Orleans to embark there for Mexico. He had heard of the advance of Santa Ana upon Saltillo, and did not wish to lose any opportunity of fighting which might fall in the way of his regiment. He arrived to find his troops transferred to the Department of General Scott, and although he missed Buena Vista, he took part in the capture of Vera Cruz, and greatly distinguished himself at Cerro Gordo. When Shields was wounded, Baker took command of his brigade, and by a gallant charge on the Mexican guns gained possession of the Jalapa Road, an act by which a great portion of the fruits of that victory were harvested. His resignation left a vacancy in Congress, and a contest, characteristic of the politics of the time, at once sprang up over it. The rational course would have been to elect Lincoln, but, with his usual overstrained delicacy, he declined to run, thinking it fair to give other aspirants a chance for the term of two months. The Whigs nominated a respectable man named Brown, but a short while before the election John Henry, a member of the State Senate, announced himself as a candidate and appealed for votes on the sole ground that he was a poor man and wanted the place for the mileage. Brown, either recognizing the force of this plea, or smitten with a sudden disgust for a service in which such pleas were possible, withdrew from the canvas, and Henry got his election and his mileage. End of section 14 Read by Stephen L. Moss, stephenlmoss.com